Predator, Turnabout A novel by Steve Perry Prologue The long, hard winter had finally passed, and while it was cold by the river the rocky ground still frozen solid in places this early in March, Paul had found a prime spot to set up for spring and summer, and he simply couldn't wait another day. The salmon would be spawning soon and continuing on into the summer, and the peaceful, solitary river basin would become a bustling, thriving community for a short time, his friends coming together to feed on the plentiful fish. The water would rush by faster and faster as the snows melted, becoming a torrent filled with fish for the furry brothers and sisters who needed them to grow strong after their lean and somnambulant winter. Early in the still dark morning, Paul moved out of the small cave he'd found last fall, bears had slept there in the past, graceful, powerful bodies curled tightly through the winter snows, and he had been blessed to find it unoccupied. Now, he pitched his tent beneath the Douglas firs by the river, the ground marvelously padded by a thick spread of fragrant and brown fir needles. It was perfect, soft and shaded and close enough to the water for him to see everything, as though the area had been cleared for him, nature spreading her arms, showing him where he belonged, welcoming him home. The cool air was heavy with pollen and the rush of oxygen from the pristine forest. It was like taking a drug, to breathe that glorious air. He finished setting up his new tent as the cold darkness slowly lifted. Done, Paul sat in the unzippered doorway and took a deep breath, inhaling the spring air, taking it deep into his lungs. The longest night was almost three months gone. It felt good to enjoy real days again, though they'd be getting longer, soon. By late June, the sun would rarely leave the sky. The land of the midnight sun, and then some. He'd spent much of the winter in a backcountry tourist's cabin near an airstrip well south of here, but had regularly ventured out to his bear cave, snowshoed or skied in, cross-country, then camped for days at a time. It was a hard trip, not many men would risk it, and not many could make it, but he was strong, fit, and he had a purpose. He belonged here, he was part of this land. It was a far reach from Los Angeles, another world, with its millions of mindless human drones filling the freeways, creating smog, destroying the planet in ways large and small every day almost far enough away to put it out of his mind, most of the time. He'd moved out here in late February, the weather still harsh, the snows still deep where the wind hadn't blown them down to bare rock. People in the lower 48 thought that there was always 10 feet of snow piled up here, but they were wrong about that, just like they were wrong about so many other things. The snow fell as powder here this far north, very cold, and the wind blew it about like dust. A man on a snow machine only tourists called them snowmobiles might come across a patch of bare rock two days after four feet of snow had fallen, the fierce tundra winds having dusted the ground like a giant leaf blower. How could they know that? All those mindless drones secure in their oil and gas heated houses, creating mountains of garbage every day, burning up fossil fuels that filled the air with poisons. Killing the very planet. They couldn't know. They never ventured out of their little boxes, their rotting, dying, cities. In Los Angeles a name absolutely wrong for such a terrible, hellish place if the temperature dropped to 40 degrees, they cranked their heat up, put on heavy fur coats, and complained of the bitter cold. Of how much it cost to keep the swimming pool heated. During a rare winter when he'd been a boy in L.A., one of only two instances like it he could remember, Paul had seen the snow coming down at night his sister had waked him up to point it out to him. They had lived in a rented house on a hill, and there had been bright flashes of light below, like lightning in the darkness. Was that part of what happened during snow? He had asked his sister. No, sweetie. Those are camera flashes. People are taking pictures. It's so rare that it snows in the city. Fools. Blind, ignorant fools. Here, in any given winter, it would hit 40 degrees below zero and a wind chill factor 20 degrees below that, 
the kind of cold that could freeze a pan of boiling water tossed into the air before the drops hit the ground. That was cold. And Paul could deal with that. The drones didn't know. Couldn't know. And frankly, he didn't want too many of them to know. If they had any idea of how beautiful it was here, the place would be overrun with them, and they'd do what they always did, cut the trees down, clear the land, pillage, rape, burn, destroy, and try their best to turn it into Palm Springs or Las Vegas or Los Angeles. Hellholes, all. No, Paul was glad the land here was harsh and hard so much of the time. It kept the curious Enirduels away, and that was fine with him. There was only room for those with vision, who could see true beauty, and not be ensnared in the rat race, the desire to have, to own, to render servile this magnificent country. Only a few men could appreciate it here. Paul was one of them. He'd been prepared, and eager, to finally live among the animals he'd come to know and love, the remarkable brown bears they called them grizzlies, this far inland, though they were easily as big as their coastal cousins, because of the protein-rich diet the fish that would choke the stream soon. The majestic creatures had accepted his presence, surely intuiting that he meant them no harm, and although he hadn't yet worked up the courage to approach one of them directly, he knew that the time was drawing nigh. Maybe even today, he thought, hugging himself tightly against the morning cold. He'd set up the camera soon. His bear friends liked to walk their trails in the mornings, and again at dusk, though with all the salmon coming, they might be dropping by all day. As the snow melted, the river would run faster and deeper, white foam roaring over the smooth rocks, and the fish would run in big numbers to spawn. In the old days, the locals said, you could almost walk across the river on them, the fish were so big and tightly packed together. What a feast for the bears it must have been. Not so many now, of course, man having fished them nearly to extinction, but enough. Enough to feed the bears. The locals thought he was crazy when they heard what he planned, but they were short-sighted and dull-witted. Most of them didn't see this country for what it was, and they didn't understand the bears. They saw them as threats, as dangers, but Paul knew better. God's creatures could live in harmony, if men were only able to let go of their fears and recognize that. Like it had been in the garden. If you didn't offer them the fear or anger, the bears wouldn't bother you. Even as he thought it, he saw one of his furry brothers lumbering through the trees across the river, slowly approaching the water. A dark king swaggering out of the forest, alert and aware to any changes in his kingdom. Magnificent. Paul felt his heart beat faster. So beautiful. A young male, still lean from winter, coming down to catch his fill. Seven, eight hundred pounds, a beautiful shaggy grey-brown, the muscular hump at his shoulders working easily as he padded his way to the water. It brought tears to his eyes to be able to witness such a thing of pure joy. Hello, Paul said, feeling so full, feeling a kind of ache for the beast's savage nobility. And as though it heard him, the bear looked up, looked right at him across the water, its round, concave face and long muzzle twitching as it tried to catch a scent. It stopped, rose up, peering at the tent. Paul smiled, raised one hand ever so slightly. Friends, he said softly, and the bear looked back to the water, started walking again. Paul smiled. The bear had seen him, had known he was no threat, and had accepted him. That was how it should be. That was how it was. Within an hour, another bear had joined them, this one on Paul's side of the river, less than a hundred meters upstream. The two animals paid each other no attention, nor did they pay any attention to Paul. They fished, slapping at the water with powerful claws, hooking salmon and flipping them onto the bank, stopping to crunch the flopping fish in a bite or two, swallow it, then going back to the swirling river. The sound of the river flowing past seemed almost to talk, 
Paul could hear voices in the tumble over the rocks, and the voices were gentle, beckoning. It was too wonderful for words. If only people could experience this. How much better would the world be if the kind of peace available here could be made manifest over the entire planet? Somehow, he would have to capture this, somehow, he would have to convey it to the few in civilization who could appreciate it, make them see it, hear it, feel it. If he could do that no, when he did it, the world would start to change. He knew it would. Like a small snowball rolling down a hill at first, but eventually gathering size and momentum, until it was unstoppable. If enough people could understand, maybe they could preserve, learn from it. It was a worthy goal. Paul eased back into his tent and started assembling the tripod for his video camera, heart still racing. He could feel it. Today was the day, and he would capture it, the day he finally walked amongst his bare friends. Today would be the best day of his life. The best day. Chapter 1 Sloan came upon the dead bear near the river, on a rocky patch of ground not far from the northwest bank. The carcass was clouded in flies, and the scavengers had been at it parts of bloody hide were scattered for two hundred meters along the shore. It happened. Bears died, from diseases, infections, old age, they were sometimes killed by other bears, and what was left was an offering to the surviving wildlife, including their own kind. All part of the natural cycle, been happening for millions of years. Sloan stopped, took in the scene. Felt the wrongness. Something's not right here, he said aloud. His voice was quiet, against the rush of the river, only he would be able to hear it. He approached slowly, looking for other bears, but he didn't see any. The sense of wrongness increased as he moved, sending a chill along his spine, making the little hairs on his neck stir. He shifted the rifle in his grip a little, lifted it a bit closer to port arms, ready to snap it up to his shoulder. As he got closer, he realized what it was that bothered him, the dead animal's head. It wasn't here. The brown males fought during the rut, and now and then, one would get killed, though that was unusual. Generally, once one of them realized he was losing, he would usually back down and take off. Big bears were tough. They could survive a lot of clawing and biting, but every so often, a wound would be too deep and prove to be fatal. This bear had met a violent end, he could feel that. And maybe some smaller animal a wolf, fox, maybe had dragged the head off, but that didn't seem likely. First, it would have had to worry it loose from the body, and from the look of it, the bear hadn't been dead that long. Yeah, the blood was gelid or dry and the entrails gone, which happened pretty quick, but it might have been killed too, three days ago, the smell was still pretty rank and there wasn't enough rot yet for the head to have come off, even considering the warmth of the recent days. The flies and the ants wouldn't have been able to do it. So, where was the head? The answer to that one wasn't certain, but it was enough to make him wonder about the first possibility that came to mind. Well, if that was the case, they were long gone. Even so, too many years and too many jungles made him slow even more and carefully scan the terrain. Nothing but birds on the shore, nothing moving that he could see where the stands of dug fur, thick as grass on a lawn, rose into the Alaskan sky. They weren't all that far from the Arctic Circle here, this deep into the park, you were about as far away from civilization as you could get. He was well armed enough. He carried his Mega Beast, a short barreled custom rifle tricked out by Gary Reeder in .610 GNR, and he wore a BMF revolver in a hip holster, the sidearm chambered in full power .500 Max, loaded with 5.510 GNR cartridges, either of which gun could drop a 12. 100 pound brown bear dead in his tracks with one shot, should the need arise. On a hunt south of here, a local guide wearing a BMF had been drinking coffee at his campfire when a big male had charged out of the brush at him. 
Man had dropped his coffee, clawed his revolver out, and dropped the bear almost at his feet with one round from the BMF he carried. They used to say that a handgun wouldn't stop a Kodiak or Grizzly, but the BMF would, and had. But there weren't any targets except flies and clouds of summer mosquitoes, and he wore enough bug dope to keep those off him. When he got to the remains, it didn't take long to confirm his suspicion. There wasn't a lot left after the local scavenger animals had. Taken their turns dining, it stank to high heaven, but there, on the hide, was a slash mark clean enough so that it had to have been done by a knife and not a claw. Fuck. What he had thought, poachers. He hadn't seen anybody in the park recently, but he had heard rifle shots in the distance, and this time of year, this close, that had to mean either somebody shooting to save his ass from a bear in self-defense, or somebody intent on killing something out of season. Nobody came out here for target practice. That the bear's head was gone, probably most of its claws, and doubtless internal organs missing. Had to be poachers. Come to collect ingredients for some limp dick Chinese rich man who thought he could regain his potency from the strength of an Alaskan brown bear's body parts. Men who still believed that powdered rhino horn or elephant testicles or bear gallbladders would do the trick. Sloan shook his head. You could buy Viagra all over the world, couple bucks a pill, and that stuff actually worked. This was dumbass stupid, and a terrible waste. As the only ranger for a hundred miles, it was Sloan's job to find these guys and stop them. He stood. He'd call it in when he got back to the station, if the damned radio was working the aurora or something had been screwing that up the last week or two, there were days when all he got was static but he was the guy out here, so it was his responsibility. One ranger, one large piece of park, and this far out in the boonies, that's how it was done. He'd been doing it by himself a long time, and that suited him just fine. No problem. He'd go back to his station, make the call, pack up enough gear to camp for a few days, and then he'd go track them down. Yeah, he was pushing 60, and the ground was harder than it used to be, but this was his park, he knew the terrain, and it would only be a matter of time. He'd arrest them, call for a plane to come haul them away, and that would be that. He had done it before a few times, and it wouldn't surprise him to do it again a few more. He stood, did a circuit. No obvious tracks, and the almost completely rocky ground didn't usually hold much other sign. Poachers could have waded into the water, maybe. He grinned, remembering the old story about a tracker so good he could find footprints on the bottom of a rushing river's bed. Total fantasy, that. Fast running water would erase any sign almost. Instantly. Somebody told him they'd read a book once where some frontiersmen had done that damned a little stream long enough to find moccasin tracks. Sloan had laughed so hard he'd spewed beer out of his nose. But this was serious business. Fuckers were going to be sorry they had come to screw around in his park. You could take that to the bank. When Sloan finished his hike back to the station, two hours later, it was just in time to see a small plane taxi to a stop on his landing strip. He had heard the aircraft, recognized the sound, when he was almost there. Deets. Air was the only way in or out this far in, unless you wanted to hike for a week each way. The plane was Dietz's Cessna, Dietz being a bush pilot who did mail and supply runs, but Sloan wasn't expecting either. Something unusual. Even if you didn't know the sound of the engine, you couldn't miss knowing whose craft it was once you actually saw it Dietz had painted the side of the thing with a copy of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights the Hell Panel. Sloan had seen the picture somewhere, and Dietz had explained what it was. Probably nobody else in the world had that on the side of their plane. The Cessna stopped and the engine shut off. Dietz climbed out. He had been a Navy medic in Vietnam, on the ground a little after Sloan had gotten there. 
Dun Wan Tour and Didi Maued, Dietz said the painting of hell reminded him of Nam. Sloan could understand that. It had been passing hot there, not to mention humid. They had never met in country, but they had people in common. Well. As common as a medic and a sniper got in a war zone. Yeah, the navy was tight with the marines, but snipers didn't take medics out with them. Even so, the experience was something they shared. They didn't talk about it much, a reference now and then, enough so that each man knew the other had actually been there and active, and not as some rear echelon motherfucker parked in a bar in Saigon his whole tour swilling down beer. Lot of remps in that war. In every war, probably. Sloan stopped his stroll down memory alley. Dietz wasn't alone. A woman alighted from the passenger side of the plane. She was tall, skinny, wearing khaki pants and a green jacket. Hair was cut short, a dark brown, and she wore gold wire-rimmed glasses. She looked like a schoolteacher. Either she knew the country or Dietz had told her about the bugs, because the mosquitoes buzzed but didn't light on her. Hey, Sloan, Dietz called. Bill. What's up? This is Mary Collins. Sloan blinked. Collins? He knew that name. He couldn't place it right off. Collins. The woman, who was maybe 15 or 20 years younger than he was, 40, 45, and attractive enough, if not what you'd call beautiful, said, my brother was Paul Collins. Oh, yeah, that's why he knew the name. Fucking Collins. What the hell was she doing here? He looked at Dietz. Pollock tried to get you, but the radio is fucked up excuse me, ma'am. And what was the chief going to tell me? Miss Collins is here to ah see the place where her brother was, where he, a uh, passed away. What the hell for? He was my brother, Mr. Sloan. Look, I'm sorry he's dead and all, but dash. Chief Pollock was going to tell you to extend all courtesy to Miss Collins, Deet said. Show her the site of her brother's camp. And I'll be back in a week or so to collect her. What? I'm just the messenger, Deet said. He smiled. No point in shooting me. Fuck, Sloan said. You ain't my type, Deet said. Nice to meet you, too, the woman said. Her voice had been any drier, you could put it into a martini. It wasn't as though there wasn't plenty of room in the station, there was. In theory, you could bunk a dozen people without them bumping into each other too hard, though they'd have to wait for the bathroom, there being only one inside. There was a propane generator to charge the house batteries, place had its own well, ten cords of split and seasoned wood to keep the chill off, and he'd do more later, though the cold wouldn't be happening for a while. Big root cellar, propane fridge and freezer, a tank big enough to hold fuel for a season, all the comforts of home. Once you got snowed in, there wasn't any problem with surviving. But what did she want? This is my room, he said to her, pointing to the end of the hall. You can use any of the others. The inside toilet is a chemical thing, have to dump it every so often, but it's better than the outhouse in the winter, or when the bears are around. The shower runs off a battery pump, you have to turn it on to get water, turn it off when you are done. The woman, who had a big blue nylon backpack stuffed pretty full, nodded. Thank you. Sloan shrugged. No problem. Let me put my pack away and freshen up, she said. Then maybe we can talk. He blinked at her. Talk. About what? Her stupid fucking brother. Extend courtesy, Dietz had said. Probably not a good idea to call her dead brother names to her face. Yeah, sure, talk. He went to the kitchen and put on a pot of coffee, it was early enough in the day that he could still drink a couple cups and not be up all night from the caffeine buzz. 
He had an electric coffee maker somewhere, but he did it the old-fashioned way, boiling water on the propane stove and pouring it through the ground coffee in a thin mesh gold filter and into a thermos, so it would stay warm longer. He had fifty pounds of coffee in vacuum-sealed two-pound packs, enough to last him a year, way he drank it. Before the first snowfall, he'd take a run with Dietz down to Juno and restock all his staples for the winter, and it would be spring before he left the park for another run. He heard the woman puttering around in the bathroom, then after a while, she came down the hall. Coffee? he asked. Yes, thank you. He found a second cup. Cream or sugar? Black is fine. He nodded. Poured two cups, handed her one. He leaned against the counter. You can sit if you want. I've been sitting for what seems like forever. From L.A. to Seattle to Fairbanks, to Juno, to that crop duster with the painting on it. Never saw anything like that before. Some of the local pilots are real creative, Sloan said. Deets more so than most. Most of them just do half-naked women or eagles, like that. Yeah, well, I need to stand up, move around. He shrugged again. Whatever you want. She looked at him. You don't like me, do you? Sloane was past the age where he would engage in polite bullshit. But there was that, extend courtesy, command. I don't know you well enough to dislike you, ma'am. Mary, please. Yeah. Like I said, I don't have anything against you. But you don't like me being here. The woman wasn't going to let it go. Fine. That is a fact. Why? I prefer being alone. It suits me. But that's not all, is it? He sighed. Your brother is dead, and you want to know why and how, and I'm supposed to tell you, and somehow that is going to make you do what? Feel better. She sipped her coffee before she answered. I don't know. I only know I had to come up here. To try to understand. He shook his head, took a drink of his own coffee. You didn't like my brother, did you? Why do you care so much what I like or don't like? Does it matter? No. It doesn't matter. But, you didn't, though, did you? No, ma'am, I did not. Because. Because I thought he was a fucking idiot. She didn't say anything for a moment. And. And. Not to be nasty, but I thought he got what he deserved. She swallowed, and nodded, as if to herself. You think a human being deserves to be eaten by an animal? If he had been jumped going out to get his newspaper one morning in suburban Los Angeles, no, I don't think so. But if a human being is so stupid as to pitch his tent in the middle of a bear feeding site and try to treat them as if they were a bunch of obedience trained lap dogs? Yeah, I think the gene pool gets improved when the bears act like bears. He wasn't the first bunny hugger to wind up that way, probably won't be the last. She didn't say anything. Maybe she didn't have a clue. Maybe she was just like the late Paul Collins. Maybe he would be doing her a favor by knocking that notion out of her head. Maybe he was just pissed off to have her dumped on him. He said, this isn't Disneyland, ma'am, this is the outback in Alaska, and the animals here aren't cute and cuddly things who sit up on their haunches to entertain the tourists. They are dangerous. You blame my brother? In a word? Yes. He paused. Maybe he was being a little hard. No, fuck it. No point in sugarcoating things. And I wasn't particularly happy that it fell to me to hunt down the bear that did it and kill it. Really? Why did you have to? Why? Because the politicians in the state house don't want man-eaters running around unpunished, that's bad for tourism. Bear might decide he liked the taste of human better than salmon. 
I sure as shit don't blame the bear he was doing what bears do and your brother was in his territory. Her pale face went a shade paler. You are a cruel man. Yes, that might be, ma'am, but I'm also a realist. Your brother didn't know what he was doing, and he should have known. If he'd done his homework, he wouldn't have been there. He might still be alive. You never made a mistake, she said. Oh, I've made plenty. But big mistakes sometimes cost big. Playing patty cake with a bunch of wild bears the size of Volkswagens. That's just plain stupid, nobody with a lick of sense would do that. I'm sorry for your loss, but it was his fault. She didn't say anything to that. After a moment, she put her coffee cup down on the counter. I want to see where he died. Will you take me there? He shrugged again. Sure. Tomorrow morning. Not as if he had a lot of choice. Though he could take her to any clearing in the woods next to a river and how would she know the difference? Fucking Chief Pollock. Sloane would have a few choice words for the man next time he saw him. Well, okay, not too choice. Mostly, they left him alone up here. He did his job, they didn't bother him, it was a fair exchange. Only once in a while did he get saddled with something he could do without, he took care of it as quickly as he could, and then it was back to normal. There's how this would go. He'd show her the place, she'd sigh and maybe sniffle, shed a few tears, then she'd hang around a few days and Dietz would come collect her, and it'd be done. He had wasted a lot of time doing stuff he didn't care about, and he cared about this park. He didn't want to get fired for giving the boss too much lip. He could suck it up for a week. He'd withstood a lot worse than one grieving woman, for a lot longer than that. It's a ways, so we should leave early, before it gets too warm. Sun comes up around 3 a.m., I'm usually a couple hours behind that. We can have some coffee, eat something if you want, and then get on the trail. All right. He nodded. I'll see you in the morning, then. That's a ways off, she said. I've got some things to go check. Make yourself at home. I'll be back in three or four hours. Chapter 2 Mary sat on the edge of the bed in the bedroom at the ranger station, staring at the wooden wall, her eyes unfocused. The place had a cedar why, fresh smell, and the bed seemed comfortable enough. A wool blanket in bright and broad stripes covered it, there was a pillow. No pictures on the walls, a little throw rug next to it on the wood floor. It wasn't the Seattle Hilton, but it was clean and it wasn't as if she had come here for a spa vacation. She wasn't really sure why she had come. What did she think it was going to accomplish? Ever since Paul had died, she had been torn. She had been working, she had students, she couldn't just leave and flit off to Alaska, so she'd had to wait until summer vacation. She needed to come, but she didn't really know why. Paul had loved it here. His last letters to her had gone on and on about the natural beauty of the land, the sense of delight he had felt here, the quiet. A naturalist's dream, he had said, mostly untouched and unsoiled by human hands, a place where nature could be beheld in all her resplendent glory. He had been fourteen years younger than she, a change-of-life baby. When their parents had been killed in a multi-car pileup on the harbor freeway, he had been eight. She had just finished college, gotten her first teaching job in Redondo Beach. She had taken him in, of course, raised him, done everything she could to take care of him. They were the only family each other had, and now he was gone. Her baby brother Paul, killed by the animals he had so admired and loved. It had seemed like some kind of obscene cosmic joke. He had sent her pictures and videos of the bears, taken from only a few yards away, some of them. They had accepted him as one of them, he had told her. For months, he lived among them, with never a problem. Until they fucking ate him. 
she couldn't really blame the ranger for feeling like he did. He was a man of violence, she could feel that in him, she could see it in the weapons he had carried so offhandedly when they'd met. The kind of man who lived alone and who never went anywhere unarmed, he'd have a no-nonsense attitude about life, and obviously being alone all the time didn't give him a lot of practice using tact. He regretted having to kill the bear that had slain Paul, he felt sympathy for the bear, but for Paul, he felt nothing but contempt. He couldn't understand, it wasn't in him to understand. The locals would have a different view than somebody who had come here from far away to study the land and its animals. They wouldn't have Paul's sense of wonder, his appreciation of the place from a fresh viewpoint. Like being raised in New York City, but never having visited the Statue of Liberty, which had always been there and was no big deal to the locals. They wouldn't be able to see the forest for the trees in the way. Yes, Paul had been too sensitive for this world, Lou dewy-eyed and full of the sense of wonder. But he hadn't deserved this. It wasn't right. She still couldn't believe he was dead. It was so unreal. Little Paul, who laughed and played and grew up into a kind and tender-hearted man who only wanted to live freely upon the earth, and to revel in the beauty of the land. He had loved it here, and it had killed him. That was so wrong. She didn't know what going to see the place would do for her, but she felt she owed Paul that much. She hadn't been here to protect him, couldn't have saved him even if she had been here. It wasn't the first time she had failed him. She was not a violent woman, had never even held a gun. Had she been here, she would have depended on Paul's knowledge about the animals to protect her. And his knowledge, as the ranger had so unkindly pointed out, had been flawed. On some level, that was her fault, too. Maybe his past had finally come back to find him. She sighed. She was tired. She would get some sleep. Tomorrow, the surly ranger would take her to see where Paul had died. His letters to her had described it as, magical. Maybe it would mean something when she saw the place. Maybe his death would make sense, somehow. She hoped it would. She looked around. It was hard not to remember Paul as he had been, all the way back to the cradle. A dreamer, always bumping into things. She recalled him at six, on an outing with their parents in happier times, staring at the fish behind the thick glass at Sea World, entranced by the forms swimming back and forth in the huge aquariums. She'd been in college then, but the little boy's delight and wonder had touched her. How cute he had been, how full of curiosity and questions. What is that one, Daddy? Where does it sleep at night? Where are the baby fishies? And what her father had said to the little boy, look it up, you'll remember it longer. She remembered him at ten, coming home from school with a black eye from a fistfight. He'd seen some boy kicking a dog, he'd said, and he had to stop it. The boy, bigger, had pounded on him, but the dog had gotten away. She had been so proud of him for that. Two years after their parents had died, and Paul was on the right track, past the ugliness of their deaths. Don't go down that road, Mary. She recalled his high school graduation, the ceremony, his honors in biology, even though he had failed in math. The second prize overall, first in biology, in the science fair for his project on urban wildlife. He had studied coyotes in Los Angeles, he had tracked them, photographed them, recorded their howls. In the middle of all that dense civilization in concrete, coyotes had not only survived, they had thrived. Learned, like early dogs, to adapt themselves to a man-made environment. Paul had been fascinated by that, and had conveyed that in his project. One picture Mary still had on her wall at home was of a young coyote female with a pair of pups, and taken from only a few yards away. The coyote had been looking right into the camera, and she hadn't been afraid. How had he gotten that close? That was Paul. 
He felt a kinship with animals, and somehow, they seemed to feel it, too. She remembered him in college, drifting, unable to get a grip on what he wanted to do with his life, only that it would involve nature, animals, the wild outdoors, a place far away from the city. And then dropping out of school, going to live in a tree in Oregon, to save the spotted owls. And finally, after trying half a dozen jobs, Paul's decision to come here, to the last American frontier, to make a place for himself among the animals, who would recognize his spirit and accept him as one of their own. Paul, Paul, Paul. How could it have come to this? How can you be dead? The grief threatened to erupt again, to overwhelm her as it had so many times before. She tamped it down. No. She didn't want to be sobbing here, with that brutal, uncaring ranger. He had left, gone out, and hours later, returned. He was just down the hall now, and she did not want him to hear her cry. He wouldn't understand, could not possibly understand what had made Paul into the man he had become. Even Paul himself hadn't known that. Paul was gone, all the tears in the world wouldn't change that. The ranger would take her to where it had happened. She'd see the place, and maybe somehow, reach some kind of peace about it. Closure, maybe. Or not. She didn't know what would happen, only that she had to come and see for herself, to do something. She wasn't clear what that might be. The funeral in Los Angeles had been a small affair, what they had recovered of Paul had been cremated in Alaska and his ashes sent down. All. That was left of him was a sealed urn in a plot at Forest Lawn, next to the ashes of her parents. That, and her memories. Maybe this hadn't been a good idea, to come here, but she had to do it. Whatever it meant, she hoped she would find out tomorrow. She got up, and unpacked her bag. She had done the research on the internet, gotten the right kind of clothes, the bug spray and sunblock, good hiking boots and socks. She knew about the park, how huge it was, and she had read as much as she could stand to read about the bears and other local wildlife. She was as prepared as she needed to be, she figured. She would rest, she was very tired, and tomorrow, she would see what there was to see. To try to put the spirit of her brother to rest. Eventually, she got undressed and put on a pair of flannel pajamas. She went down the hall, brushed her teeth, cleaned up a little, went back to the bedroom. There was a small battery-powered lamp by the bed on a night table. She turned that on and lay down. She opened a book she had brought, a mystery novel, but she couldn't get into it. The words kept running together, she had to keep going back to reread paragraphs, losing the track. There was a murder, horrific, in the first chapter, but she kept losing the thread of the narration and dialogue. Tired, she was very tired. She'd just lay the book down for a second and rest her eyes. She fell into a troubled sleep. And a nightmare. Both of them were angry, the man and the woman. He called her some names, ugly names, yelling loudly, throwing the words at her like stones, and she called him names in return. Bitch. Bastard. Slut. Cheater. And more. Their voices got louder and louder. The man's face turned red and spit flew from his lips. The woman's eyes grew hard. I'm leaving, she said. Like hell, he said. Watch me. She turned away from him. He grabbed her. They struggled. Her blouse tore. She slapped him across the face and he bellowed like an animal. Whore, he screamed. He slapped her, really hard. She fell to her. Knees. Don't, somebody yelled. A child. Please, don't. But they didn't listen. The woman came up, attacked the man with her fingernails, clawing at his face. The man laughed, a sound as ugly as his words. 
He punched her with his fist. Please, please, the child said, and started to cry. The woman fell down in a heap. The man loomed over her. He prodded her with his foot, not a kick, but a shove. Get up, you fucking bitch. I'm not done with you yet. But the woman didn't move. The man turned away, became aware they were not alone. Get out of here, he screamed. Go to your room. While his back was turned, the woman came up, fast, and she grabbed the lamp on the table, the tall vase-shaped one, white, with red flowers painted on it, and as the man turned back around, she smashed the lamp over his head, screaming wordlessly. The lamp shattered into a hundred pieces. The shade crumpled and flew off. Blood appeared on the man's head, over his left eye. It streamed down his face. He cursed again, sprang for her, but she jumped away, turned and ran. Went through the door, into the bedroom. He ran into the end table, knocked it flying, the table turned over and banged into the wall. The picture of the bird's quail, just leaving the ground and starting to fly, fell, slid down, hit the floor. The glass covering the picture shattered. The man kicked the table out of the way, slipped a little on the broken glass, but reached the door. He tried the knob. It was locked. Open the fucking door. Go to hell, the woman said. Her voice was muffled. Open it or I will break it down. He hammered on the door with the side of his fist, four, five, six times. Please, stop, the child yelled. The man ignored that. He stepped back and started to kick the door, slamming his heel into the wood next to the knob. He wore black shoes. They were polished, shiny, the shoes. The door splintered by the knob. He kept kicking it. I'm going to kill you, he screamed. Open the goddamn door. Please, don't. Chapter 3 What? Regal said. He glared at the two men. Richardson and Warner drifted back along the trail toward him. I'm not going deaf, am I? I didn't hear a shot, Regal said. You didn't lose him. No, Richardson said. He was a stubby fireplug of a man, had prematurely white hair, even though he was only forty, tough as a bed of nails. We didn't lose him. What, then? Come look, Warner said. About twenty-five, Warner was as lean as a snake, and hard enough to bounce quarters off of. Good shot, maybe as good as Regal himself, and that was saying something, because Regal could shoot the nuts off a fly across a football field, and you pick M, left or right. Regal, himself a fit and tough thirty, nodded. He had his rifle, a .308 Winchester bolt action over his shoulder, and so far today, hadn't needed to use it. That was no way to pay the bills. No bang, no bucks. He followed the two best men of his crew along the bare trail through the thick forest of evergreen trees. The canopy almost completely blocked the sun, it was cool and dim, and the mosquitoes made clouds in the still air. The bugs took runs at him, and if he hadn't been coated in repellent, they would have bit him lumpy pretty quick. Some eggheads had done a study once, and on a good day, so they said, you could get 9,000 mosquito bites an hour in these parts. Probably take a million bites to drain all your blood out, but at 9,000 an hour, you'd be unconscious from blood loss long before you went dry, or didn't scratch yourself to death from the itch. He hated fucking mosquitoes. His other two crews were working to the south and east today, two men each, and he hadn't heard any gunfire echoing over the hills and valleys from them. Not a good sign in the poaching biz. Not a good sign at all. The flies were the first thing he noticed, then the smell. Blood, and lots of it. Ahead, just off the trail to the right, 
there was the bear they'd been tracking. A young male, big, pushing a thousand pounds, easy, and deader than shoe leather, too, a slashed-up mess of fur and gore, sprawled there. What the fuck? Who killed my bear? Got me, boss, Warner said. Nobody around. No tracks, too many rocks. Richardson shook his head. Had to be another bear, do that kind of damage. Look at the way the fur needles are all tore up, over there. Must have been a hell of a fight. He pointed at the ground, then said, ain't been dead more than thirty or forty minutes. As the three drew nearer, Regal frowned. Where is its head? Both the men and his crew shrugged. Anger flared in Regal. Who the fuck did this? I want to know. No other bear would rip this sucker's head off and run away with it. That doesn't make any sense. Look at the neck. It's been cut. Somebody did this. Go find whoever it was. If we got some cocksucker working our territory, you see him, you cap him. The rage burned in him, making his thoughts turn red with it. He had a temper, he had to work to keep it under control, and sometimes it got the best of him no matter how hard he tried to keep it in check. The two men nodded. Think we'd have heard the shot, Richardson said. Regal blew that off. Sounded weird shit out here. Sometimes you could hear a shot three miles away. Sometimes you couldn't hear it only a few hundred meters through the trees, it was like the wind blew it away. That wasn't important. He breathed slower, made himself relax. He calmed down a little. Better. Be careful. If we got other poachers, they might shoot back if they see you. Sneak up on them, take them if you have the chance. Both men nodded. I'm going back to camp. The fucking radios ain't working. You don't catch up with whoever did this by three or four o'clock, head back. We have a situation here, we need to figure out the best way to deal with it. Richardson and Warner headed down the trail. Don't that beat all? Another poacher working the same ground. How likely is that, way the fuck and gone out here in the middle of nowhere? What a fucking coincidence. It had been a pretty good hunt until now. They had taken eight bears, had all the gallbladders and balls and willies, plus claws and shit for the gooks who paid a fortune for them. Some rich dink in Hong Kong willing to pay five thousand bucks for a bear's nut. Crazy, but that wasn't Regal's problem. Supply and demand, that was how a man made a profit. Buy low, sell high. Or, in this case, buy for the cost of a few bullets and some time tromping around the woods, and the profit margin was even more. He'd had worse jobs that had paid a lot less. Clean air, plenty of exercise. Back in the day when he'd smoked like a chimney and drank a six-pack every morning and had been in bad shape, this wouldn't have appealed, no fucking way, but he'd cleaned up his act since then. He felt a lot better. Well, yeah, until this shit. A few more days, three or four more kills, they'd wind up clearing ninety, ninety-five grand. Crew divided up two-thirds of that, he got the rest. Thirty thousand for a couple weeks' work, out in the fresh air, that was more than anything he could make doing honest work. Enough to live on for a few months, get high, get laid, eat in the best restaurants back home in Spokane such that they were, before he had to head back out again. Sure beat working for a living. And out here, a lot safer than robbing Indian graves or knocking over liquor stores. But if there was another crew out here tapping the local product, that was fucked, and he wasn't going to put up with that, no way. What were the odds of that? Way out in the middle of the park, sun comes up between here and the nearest town, another crew of poachers working. He shook his head. Life was funny. Only for the other crew, it was about to get unfunny. 
It was going to get real serious. You could make serious book on that, yes, sir, boss. The camp Regal and his crew had set up was low impact, a light footprint. There was a park ranger out here, three or four hours away on foot, and they didn't want to shoot him unless they had to killing any kind of cop, even way the hell and gone out here, was always a bad idea. Cops stuck together, and they never let that pass, one of their own getting taken out, they could help it. So, no fires, except a little propane stove. Small tents, all in camo fabric. Nothing bigger than a flashlight or a little battery lamp if you needed to see something inside the tents. In the trees, jungle hammocks were strung for sleeping, high enough so a big bear on its hind legs couldn't reach them. Made it tricky climbing in and out, and if you had to take a piss in the middle of the night, you undid the fly a little gap in the mosquito netting and hoped the bugs didn't swarm your willy as you watered the fur needles 15 or 20 feet below. You didn't climb down unless you had to, because you could break your neck rail easy trying to descend a rope ladder when you were half asleep, even if it did stay daylight for a long time. Sun went down after midnight, came up at what? 3 a.m. Not a lot of dark here this time of year. Kind of spooky until you got used to that, but that hadn't taken long. Lot better than going after Jaguar down in South America, where dark fell like a curtain and it was hot, wet, and full of snakes, spiders, and scorpions, Indians with some kind of frog poison darts and blowguns, any of which could kill you dead in a hurry. One of the guys on another crew down there had stuck his foot into his shoe one morning not knowing some kind of centipede had crawled in there during the night. Thing bit him. Guy's foot swelled up, turned black, they had to amputate it, and him screaming like a motherfucker the whole time. Didn't do any good, either, Guy died before they could get him back to any kind of doctor. You stuffed your socks into your shoes every night when you took them off, and you shook them out before you put them on. Nobody needed a reminder after that. You kept your tent zipped shut all the time, except when you were coming or going, so nothing crawled in to give you a deadly surprise when you got back from work, and even so, things did. Worst place he'd ever worked, South America. He wasn't ever going back there, not for all the money in the world. Crappy weather, crappy food, nobody spoke English, half the time you had the runs, and the jaguars were hard to find and kill. The skins were worth a lot, and the medical parts sold well, too, but overall, it was a lot of work, and he hadn't liked it. It was better here. Better weather, bears were easier to find and shoot, and except for the mosquitoes, no real nasty pests, no snakes, no scorpions. This whole site could be packed up and moved in a few minutes, if they had to, and somebody would have to be looking fairly close to notice anybody had been here. Wouldn't fool any kind of a tracker who came across the site, of course, but unless he had a reason to walk in, happening on the place after they were gone wasn't likely. No reason to come and look. He cranked up the propane stove, a little two-burner that was easy to pack, and started some water boiling for coffee. The teams would all be back by six o'clock or so, unless they had some kind of problem. He tried the radio again, a short-range tactical unit good for fifteen or twenty miles, tuned way down on the band so nobody was likely to overhear it, but all he got was an earful of static. Fucking Northern Lights never knew what they were going to do. Pretty to watch when it finally got dark, when you could see them, though not so much this time of year, but they screwed up electronics real good. Maybe sunspots or something. You'd think somebody could have come up with a radio that would work up here. As the water heated, he looked around. Yeah, it was a good camp. They had a propane cooler where they stored the bare parts that would rot unless they were dried, and it was hoisted over a tree limb and pulled up higher than anything here could reach. Brown bears weren't the only critters up here, and while the cooler was fairly sturdy, he didn't want to risk having it bashed open by a family of hungry black bears, or dragged off by a pack of wolves who could scent the parts even through the cooler's sealed lid. 
Same deal with the food. Squirrels might be able to climb down the rope from the tree, but they wouldn't be able to get at what was hung there, and the rope was coated with some crap so the squirrels wouldn't chew through it. A hungry bear could peel open a cooler like a man did a candy bar wrapper, but not if he couldn't get his claws on it. Regal made coffee, the smell of it rich in the clearing, and sat on a fallen tree bowl, considering his options. They had ATVs parked six miles away, covered with camo netting and hidden in a thicket of briars. A couple hours hike, they could get to the carts, and once on those, boogie to the nearest road, a hard day's run on animal trails, and then another half day's ride back to where they could catch a plane south pretty quick. They had a good haul so far. Maybe it was time to pack it in and take off. Getting into a shooting match with another poaching crew could be risky. He'd seen the results of a shootout in Mexico once, pig hunters, and the results were five dead guys rotting in the hot sun. You never knew how good somebody else might be. Nah, fuck that. Nobody was as good as Regal and his crew, and if they had to cook a few guys, well, so be it. Guys ought to know that the job was dangerous when they came up here. And they damn sure were going to find out that screwing with Regal and company was a bad idea. He smiled. He had no problems taking out the competition. Killing a man was easier than killing a bear as long as you didn't give him a chance to shoot back. He sensed motion before he heard somebody coming through the trees, and he set the coffee mug down and unholstered his pistol. It was a Desert Eagle .44 Magnum, an Israeli gun. Not as heavy a hitter as the Big Bear Revolver's Casol or Reader made, but he liked the feel of it, and it held eight in the magazine and one up the spout, which was almost twice as many rounds as the Big Boar Revolver's carried. It was okay as a backup gun for Bear, though he'd rather use his rifle for that. Against human targets, it was more than he needed. He recognized the voices. Gibson and Martin, the guitar boys. He didn't know their real names, nobody on the crew did, but they were guitar players when they weren't hunting, and they called themselves after their instruments. Gibson was tall, thin, black, and funny. Martin was built like a brick, and as white as a man could get without being an albino. Salt and pepper. Regal figured they were partners, in the asshole buddy sense, but they never said, and he never brought it up. Don't task don't tell, just don't wave it in my direction, we'll get along fine. He reholstered his pistol, picked up his mug. Nice of you to make coffee for us, boss, Gibson said. You get anything. Bug bites and sore feet, Martin said. Then fuck you, no coffee. The two men laughed. What about you and Richardson and Warner? You catch up to the one you were tracking. Yeah, we caught up to it. Somebody killed him before we got there. No shit? Who? That from Gibson. Dino. I sent Warner and Richardson to see if could they find out. The Ranger, you think? He's the only other guy up here. That we know about, Regal said. But I don't think he did it not unless he went wacko. Bear was fucked up, his head was gone. Head was gone. Ha. Huh. You think there's another crew working? Regal looked at Martin. Which part of, I don't know, didn't you? Understand. We'll see what Warner and Richardson have to say when they get back. Ha, huh, Gibson said. Wonder how Mel and Danny are doing. I hope better than we are, Regal said. He sipped at his coffee. We ain't walking around out here for our health. We got some good sign, couple hours away from here, Gibson said. Yeah, Martin put in. From the scat, a real big one. Better than a. Half ton. Tracks maybe sixteen inches on the rear. And why didn't you run him down and pot him? He went fishing, place with gravel both sides of the river for half a mile. 
no sign where he left the water. Not for you clowns, there wasn't. But Regal could find some sign. You can show me tomorrow, he said. I'll find him. He drank the rest of his coffee, went and rinsed the cup out. When the others got back, they'd all sit down and hash it out. Until then, there was no point in getting all bent out of shape. Might be that Richardson and Warner would find the problem and eliminate it and that would be that. He'd just wait and see. Chapter 4 Go to bed, it was daylight, get up, still daylight, though there was a period of so so dark between. Summers in the park were short, hot, and dry. The days long. Winters were dark and brutal, but still a ways off, a distant dream for now. Sloane got up, peed, went to the kitchen, and made coffee. It was about 5 a.m., his normal time to rise. Normal. That was a word that didn't apply much right now, did it? Poachers, a eh, guest. Screwing up his routine. Of the two, the woman was more an irritant than the poachers. Them, he knew how to deal with. He didn't hear any stirring from the woman's room, which was at the other end of the hall from his. He shook his head as the coffee brewed. People who hadn't seen a lot of death had trouble letting somebody go. There was nothing to see out where the woman's brother was killed his tent was gone, the bear that had done it was dead and gone, it was just a clear patch under some trees next to a river, and the wildflowers and grasses had probably already grown up enough so you'd have to work to tell anybody had ever been there. History Put it in a book and on the shelf, and move along. But it wasn't up to him. He liked this job, needed this job in a way that was beyond food and shelter. He didn't want to piss off his boss, so, fine, he'd take her out on the tour. It was a couple hours walk, and not too bad a hike, though he'd be surprised if the woman Mary was in shape to keep up with his normal pace. No problem. He'd walk slow. They'd get there, she could look around, commune with the spirit of her brother, and that would be that. Hey, sis. It's me. The ghost of your stupid fucking sibling who came out to hug the bears and who wound up as breakfast for his trouble. So, how's it going? He shook his head. Stupid. The whole situation, a big snafu. Sloane poured the coffee over. Yeah, yeah, okay, it wasn't her fault her brother had the IQ of a busted shoelace. Maybe in her place, he'd want to come check out the place, too. No. He wouldn't. He'd seen a lot of dead guys in the service. Gone was gone, once you checked out, there was nobody home, it was just an empty husk. Nothing to see. Might as well do like the Tibetans did, leave the corpse on the mountain for the buzzards, do something some good by providing a meal. Well. Aren't you just the complete philosophical asshole today? Mary came down the hall, dressed for hiking, and either she had done some research or somebody had told her what to wear. She had on khaki. Shorts and a short-sleeved shirt, some pretty good hiking boots, thick socks, and her skin glistened with insect repellent and sunblock, he could smell it when she stepped into the kitchen. He waved at the coffee, and she poured herself a cup. You want something to eat? I'm good. Sleep okay? Not really. Bad dreams. She looked at him as if daring him to say something about that. He shrugged. Place we are going is about three hours walk, he said, adding a third because he figured she needed it. We leave in a few minutes, we can be there by 8.30, 9 o'clock. Look around, be back by lunch time. And then I can leave you here and go find the poachers, and maybe you eleven be gone when I get back and good riddance. She nodded, sipped at the coffee. He put his cup into the sink, ran water into it, walked to the table, and grabbed his day pack. He had water, a filter, first aid kit, radio, some freeze-dried edibles, 
two flashlights, extra ammo for his rifle and revolver, fire stick, an emergency blanket, stuff like that, in case something happened and he couldn't make it back without camping. Hadn't happened in a long time, but better safe than sorry. All she'd have to haul would be herself. You ready? Yes. He stopped by the front door and grabbed his .610. The rifle, an underlever rolling block, built on a Ruger design, held only one shot, if he hit what he was aiming at, that was all he would need, and he was pretty sure he could manage that. The old sniper's dictum, you can see it, you can hit it, unless it's the moon. And if the stingy-ass marines would give you the right weapon, you could hit that, too. With a single-shot rifle, once he was ready to shoot, he held a pair of extra rounds in his left hand, between his fingers, and he could reload the Mega Beast pretty damn quick that way, but if you had only one shot, you tried not to miss. He strapped on the Reader BMF in its holster as backup. It looked like a cowboy six shooter on steroids, held five rounds, and if he couldn't get the job done between the Mega Beast and the handgun, he would be in deep shit. Fortunately, bears didn't attack in packs and the wolves knew better than to try. You really want to do this? She nodded. Let's go. They started out. Mary followed the ranger, keeping up with him, even though it was something of a stretch. She hiked a fair amount in LA, sometimes did six or eight miles in the park, up and down the hills, and she was pretty fit. Or, at least she thought she was fit old as this guy was, he was in better shape, she knew that, but she'd be damned if she would give him the satisfaction of asking him to slow down. She would fall over exhausted first. Might come to that, too. For thirty minutes, neither of them said anything. The park was beautiful, the terrain varied. The section they were in ran along a river basin, a lot of trees, some foothills leading to surrounding mountains, still iced with snow. She knew that there were vast stretches of tundra east and north, but where they were hiking, it was heavily forested. Compared to L.A., the air was incredibly clean. She'd known a guy, they'd dated briefly, an actor who had been to Alaska once. Phi was a runner, did five or six miles every morning, and he had told her he couldn't run while he was there. When she'd asked why, he'd laughed. Too much oxygen in the air he'd said. When you are used to breathing the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes a day just walking around in SoCal, going to the country with all those trees was overwhelming. She'd thought at the time he had been joking. But now? Maybe not. Thinking about stuff like that kept her from thinking about Paul. And also about how tired she was getting. Her skin was sticky with the bug stuff, her glasses were fogging over at the tops, but she kept going. As they came down a gentle slope along what must be a bear trail, Sloan said, You okay? Fine. No problem. He nodded. Good. They didn't exchange another word for almost an hour after that, and he didn't slow down. It was still cool, but not cold and she had worked up enough sweat so that some of the bug repellent had begun to wash off. She pulled a squeezed bottle of the stuff from her pocket and wiped it onto her face. Had sunblock. In it, though they were under the shade of the trees nearly the whole time, breaking out into the morning sun sporadically. After a while, he stopped again. Need a drink? Yes, please. He pulled his pack off opened it, and took out two plastic bottles of water. He handed her one, opened the other, and drained it in three or four swallows. If you need to pee, you can step off the trail behind one of the big trees. Just don't go too far. At least he didn't say it was because there might be bears around. She nodded, sipped at her water. You seem to be in pretty good shape, he allowed. I do some hiking back home. Where's that? L.A. Griffith Park. You know it? I spent six weeks on R&R in Los Angeles, 
between my first and second tour. Back in the late 60s. You were in Vietnam. It wasn't that hard a guess, given his age and the time frame. He was a good-looking guy, now that she looked, hair mostly silver but with sharp blue eyes and a strong, lean body. He had to be somewhere around 60, and that would be about the right age for that time. Yeah. I was there. Marines. And that didn't surprise her much, either. She'd had a boyfriend seven or eight years back who'd been a Marine. Much too butch for her, she'd realized pretty quickly, but some of what she saw in him, she could see in Sloan. A hard ass, ready to mix it up at the drop of an insult, and dangerous. Not her kind of guy in any way, shape, or form. There was some kind of twang in his voice, faint, but she figured it for Southern. Hillbilly, redneck, that wouldn't surprise her in the least. Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, like that. You rested enough? She nodded. Ready when you are. He nodded. Not too much farther now, maybe thirty minutes. I thought you said it was a three-hour walk. We made a little better time than I thought we would. He wanted to grin, she could see that, and she felt a small surge of satisfaction. He had figured she would be slow, so he'd padded his estimate. She was pleased that she'd exceeded his expectations. Never hurt to have a man underestimate you. Never knew when you might need to have that extra edge. They resumed the hike. The sun-warmed trees were giving off a heavy evergreen scent, but it was real, not like pine sole or some car's air freshener. You got that some, even in the park back home, but not like here. This was something special. She could understand why Paul had loved it so. No. Don't go there. Just walk. Watch the hard-ass ranger and try to keep up. Richardson and Warner didn't come back. That from Gibson, finally showing up for his morning coffee. Martin was close behind. Regal gave him the evil eye. You don't see them around anywhere, do you? What do you think happened to them? Martin asked. What, I look like I got a crystal ball in my hand. Gibson and Martin exchanged glances. Gibson said, you try the radio? Regal shook his head. He wanted to spit. Geez, I never fucking thought about that. The radio. What a great idea, Einstein. I was just a skin, dash. Well, fucking don't ask. The radio ain't working any better today than it was yesterday or the day before. Mel drifted over to the stove and poured himself a cup of coffee. Danny was out in the bushes at the latrine, taking a crap. We got competition, Mel said. Maybe, Regal said. Or maybe Warner fell down and busted his leg and Richardson is packing the sucker back here on his back. Probably not, Danny said, coming into view, zipping up his cargo pants. Richardson woulda just shot him and saved himself the work. Nobody said anything to that. Might be true, he didn't know any of them well enough to say. He might do that himself, though probably not. A. Good hunting crew was valuable. Easier to save the devil you had than to go looking for another one. He thought about things for a while, let them sweat. Finally Regal said, okay, here's what we do. The five of us will go back to where I left Richardson and Warner yesterday. We will fan out, find a trail, and track them down. We will assume that something bad happened to them and that some body caused it. If there are guys working our patch and they took out two of our guys, then we will pay them back in spades. If you spot somebody who ought not to be out here, mark them, but don't shoot and don't let them see you. Since the radios are as useful as a handful of rocks, we'll do it by time. If you find Richardson or Warner, remember how to get back to that spot. Don't shoot any game unless it tries to eat you. 
stay cool, stay below the radar. We'll meet back at the starting point after four hours, no matter what, find them, find somebody else, whatever, and then we'll figure out what to do from there. Everybody good with that? The four men nodded. All right. Pack up. Bring enough to stay out overnight, case we need to do that. The men went off to collect and pack their gear. Regal didn't like this, not a damn bit. He didn't think Richardson or Warner had tripped over a root and broken an ankle. Yeah, it was possible, anything was possible, but chances were the undamaged one would have hauled ass back to the camp for help. These guys might not be the sharpest knives in the drawer, but none of them was stupid when it came to woodcraft. A man with a broken foot could survive a few hours in the Alaskan summer on his own while his buddy went to get help, especially a man armed as well as they were. Wasn't anything up here that couldn't be knocked down with the hardware they had. All of them were gun guys, too, it went with the job, they spoke the lingo, practiced regularly, no way they couldn't defend themselves, it came to that. If both guys were out of it, that wasn't a likely coincidence, and if they had gotten tagged by some cocksicker out here trying to muscle in on their turf, that meant big trouble. Regal had no problem taking out competition, if he had to, and for us it shoot, shovel, shove off, shut up. But first you had to be sure of what you were dealing with. How many were there? Could you get the drop on? Them all. You couldn't let one get away to go telling tales. A couple three corpses left out for bear fodder. No problem, wouldn't be enough left to identify without DNA testing, and not likely that much after a season or two. They'd be golden. Before he went too far down that road, though, he needed to scope it out. Figure out what exactly was going on, and then take care of it. That was how you did it. Over the years, Regal had made a few bad mistakes. He didn't repeat those. Check it out, then deal with it. No future in going off half-cocked. If you weren't ready to dance when the music started, better you stayed home. Sloane was impressed that Mary was able to keep up with him. She was straining to manage it, but it pleased him for some reason that she didn't want him to see it, and that she wasn't calling for a rest. Give her a point for that. They reached the site half an hour after their stop for water. It hadn't changed much that he could tell. Summer plants were a little bigger, some wildflowers had sprouted fireweed reds, forget-me-not blues, tundra rose yellows and the river was down some from the late spring thaw. There were a couple eagles circling overhead, some squirrels in the trees. The patch where Paul Collins had pitched his tent was fifty meters from the western bank of the river, under a couple of tail-dug firs that had, over time, laid a heavy carpet of needles that kept the ground dry and cushy, and most of the scrub growth down. There was an abandoned bear den nearby, which Collins had apparently claimed as his own for a time. Too bad he hadn't stayed in that, lot of times once a bear abandoned a den, it stayed empty. Maybe something spooked them, maybe they had ways of spreading the word around. Maybe if Collins had stayed there, he wouldn't have wound up like he did. Yeah. And may he if the world had been flat, Columbus would have sailed right over the edge and wound up next to Eric the Red, and none of us would be here. Nobody would ever know for sure what happened there had been a camera set up, but it had been smashed all to shit, and while there was some stuff on the vid, it was all hearts and flowers and mostly of Collins prattling on about the beauty of the forest and mountains and the nobility of the great bears, blah, blah. Always seemed to Sloane that the people who went on the most about the beauty of nature and all were the ones who seemed to actually know the least about how it really was. After he had seen the sight, Sloane had worked it out in his mind so that it made sense to him. There had been at least six or eight bears in the area, drawn to the river to feed, a brown female and a single cub, couple males, their tracks were much bigger and deeper than the females, males out this way went half a ton, a lot of them and a couple of smaller black bears that had been foraging further upriver. 
Somehow, Collins had caught the attention of one of the male browns. Probably he'd actually tried to approach it while it was feeding. Hard to believe somebody could be that stupid and live as long as Collins had before it caught up to him. The traces had been faint, a week gone by the time Sloan had seen them scattered rocks, a catch of fur, claw marks but he thought they showed that Collins had run from the bear, made it into his tent, and zipped up the fly. That made you want to shake your head. Running to a tent to escape from a bear. The tent might as well have been tissue paper, the bear had gone through the ripstop nylon like it was nothing, grabbed up Collins, and dragged him out. The tent had been shredded, but the zipper had held. Probably not a great selling point for the maker, attacked by a giant grizzly bear, our tent zipper didn't break. It looked as if Collins had sustained some bite damage not far from the tent, pumped out some blood, and had managed to get to his feet and run another 20 or 30 feet before the bear caught him again. People didn't realize how fast a big brown could move once it got going. You couldn't outrun one on the flats if you were an Olympic sprinting champion and they could go uphill or down faster than any man alive could on two legs. Climbing a tree would work, if you could get high enough fast enough. And if the tree was big enough. Sloan had seen trees as big around as his leg that a bear had knocked over, probably chasing. Something that thought the tree was thick enough to withstand a thousand-pound hungry bear battering it. Collins had died at the second spot, to judge from the amount of blood found there. The bear had fed only lightly probably stuffed full of salmon, then left the remains. Collins could well have been alive when it left. The bear might not have even been all that hungry. More likely, it was Collins who did something to irritate it. Other scavengers had come to call, and some odd bits of shoes and clothes had been scattered for a hundred plus meters, along with a well not hip bone, and other shards of splintered long bones. Half the skull, full of ants, was lying against a tree, jammed into a root, the brains dug out, otherwise something would probably have carted that away, too. Collins hadn't had a gun with him, not even pepper spray. Sloan shook his head at the memory of an old joke they told him when he first got here. Hikers in bear country were advised to wear bells on their shoes, to warn off bears, who avoided human company, mostly, and to carry pepper spray, in case one came after them. And they were told that black bears, while smaller, were also dangerous. To tell the difference between black bear scat and brown was easy, he was told. Black bear scat was small, dark, had fish bones or undigested berries in it. Brown bear scat was larger, contained bells, and smelled like pepper spray. When Sloan had gotten here before, he had thought about what Collins might have done to survive. Only thing he could come up with was to have sliced open the back of the tent while the bear was ripping at the front, and get way up in a tree before the bear realized he wasn't in the tent anymore. You couldn't outrun it, and if it was hungry, playing dead would become really dead in short order. Being eaten alive by a bear wasn't Sloan's idea of a way to go. Pretty horrible. Is this it? Sloan nodded. Yes. Tent was over there. He pointed at the trees. Mary started that way. He followed her. The air had a pollen wise scent, almost acrid. They walked to the tent site. There wasn't anything to see. Whatever she was looking for, she wouldn't find it laying on the ground. She stared at the fur needles. Did he suffer long, do you think? Yeah, being eaten, he suffered in ways Sloan didn't even want to think about. But he said, no. The bear would have broken his neck with one swipe of a paw first thing. Killed him instantly. Okay, it was a lie. He had already been hard enough on her. There wasn't any point in taking out on her the stupidity that her brother had already paid for with his life. It's what they always told the families of dead marines. He was a hero. He died helping his buddies. It was quick, he didn't suffer at all. 
who did it hurt to tell them that? Let them sleep a little easier. There were plenty of times when Sloane's sleep had been fitful for the dreams of stuff that went on in country. Whoever had come up with the term horrors of war must have been a foot soldier. Yeah, a lot of times, it was quick and clean. But a lot of times, it was slow, agonizing, painful, and ugly. Some guys shrugged it off. Some of them, it drove bonkers. Sloan had known a guy who collected VC years. Strung them around his hooch like Christmas lights. Crazy as a shithouse rat, but he walked away when his time was up nobody wanted to mess with him, and that included Charlie. People worried that crazy might be contagious. Maybe they were right. She stood there for a minute, not saying anything. Okay, she said. Thank you for bringing me. She lifted her gaze from the ground and looked around. It really is beautiful here. Yes. God's country. She looked at him, surprised. You believe in God, Mr. Sloan. He shook his head. One with any compassion. Too much shit in the world for me to go with that. Maybe Odin or Shiva, one that doesn't mind seeing carnage. Not a merciful one. She didn't say anything. After a little bit, she said, Okay. I've seen it. We can go back now. Is it what you wanted? What I wanted is for my little brother to be alive. He was all I had, our parents were killed in a car wreck when he was eight years old. I raised him, and I don't want him to be dead. But that's not going to happen. I needed to see what he saw here, whatever it was that was so important he was willing to die for it. I've seen it, and it doesn't seem worth it to me. There wasn't much he could say to that. Not too many things in this life were worth dying for, and pretty scenery wasn't one of them. He nodded. Okay. He paused. Look, I'm sorry about how I laid this out for you, back at the station. Not my place to do that. She blinked at him, surprised again, but didn't say anything else. Chapter 5 They were headed back when Sloan felt something. He looked around, didn't see anything. What? We're being watched, he said. Watched? By whom? Dino. I don't see anybody. Bears? I don't think so. A bear was curious about us, he'd mosey on over to. See? They aren't that afraid of people this far out. They don't see that many. He was nervous, he'd just leave. Who else is up here? Might be some poachers. Poachers? I found a dead bear just before you got here. Something other than scavengers had been at him. There were knife marks on the pelt. A couple hours away from here, to the south. What do we do? Wait a bit. The sensation of being watched didn't abate, but Sloane couldn't sense anybody who might be the cause. There would be a lot of small game around, but those kinds of critters didn't trip his radar. A bear wouldn't likely be hunkered down and watching them they didn't have such good eyesight that they'd be able to tell much from a few hundred meters off, and there was nothing moving on either side of the river for at least that far. What, then? Or who? Abruptly, the sensation stopped. Sloan. He held up one hand in a be quiet gesture. Waited a couple seconds. Gone, whatever it was. But tell you what, let's head out and circle. Around the north end of the clearing, just to make sure nothing is laying on our trail the way we came in. You're making me a little nervous. He shrugged. Sorry. No big deal, just caution. But that crawly sensation he sometimes got when he was being watched had made him nervous, too. It had faded, but he felt sure somebody had been out there, dialing a scope in on him. 
Maybe not, but the Marines had taught him if you assume the worst and plan for that, it's better than assuming the best and being dead wrong. They started along the bank of the river, keeping plenty of clearing between them and the woods. If a bear came out at speed for a charge, Sloan had time to line up the shot, even though a big bear could run a lot faster than a hundred-meter dash winner. He held the rifle at port arms, ready to snap it up. Something came out, he was going to cook it. Nothing. They were almost to the end of the clearing, and he was beginning to relax a little. Yeah, he was still vigilant and alert, but probably the feeling he'd had was a false alarm. That happened sometimes. Then, ahead about thirty meters, he saw the two dead men. What was left of them? Oh, shit. Regal broke the teams up and went out on his own he preferred it that way, always had. Whatever had happened to Richardson and Warner, he had to find out, and he could move faster without a partner to worry about. He'd range two hours out, and that would give him the same amount of time to get back to the rendezvous. If they didn't find the missing men after the initial search, they'd move farther in one direction and start over. But it had only taken him a few minutes to find the trail. Two men, boots leaving a print now and then on soft ground, tracks that he knew belonged to his quarry. He had memorized the boot sole patterns of all his men, any decent tracker would know that, so he could tell who he was following or who he wasn't following. The two stayed on the bear trail, winding along. There were a couple rocky patches where he lost the track, but he picked it back up again further along. Guy knew what he was doing, he could find the smallest sign. Regal had been taught by one of the best man trackers in the business, an old border patrol guy named Honigstock. Honigstock had spent 30 years tracking wetbacks coming into the States from Mexico, and he knew every trick the Lobo smugglers used to cover their tracks. He could write a fucking book based on a bent blade of grass. Unfortunately, Honigstock had gotten into an altercation with some smugglers waiting the Rio Grande somewhere in West Texas, and gunfire had been exchanged. Two of the smugglers had gotten themselves killed outright, the third badly wounded and about to join his brothers. That would have been fine, far as it went, it had been a righteous shooting, the Mexicans had opened up first, but old Honigstock had made a mistake. He had checked the dead and the soon-to-meet his compadres dying one, and it turned out, one of them had been carrying a considerable amount of cash on his deceased person. Forty thousand dollars and change. The border patrolman had looked around. It was dark, they were alone, and he had figured, what the hell, who would know? He pocketed the cash, and went off to make his report of the incident. The dead guys weren't gonna say anything. No harm, no foul. He'd made a tactical error, old Honigstock. The dying guy was a tough bastard, and he lived long enough to rat Honigstock out. No way he could satisfactorily explain the forty grand they found in his truck, and so the former lawman had gotten sent to do a few years of quality time at a federal pen in upstate Oregon. Wherein he had met Regal, who had been in for half a nickel, for a misunderstanding regarding Native American cultural artifacts on the Navajo reservation. With nothing better to do, Honigstock had taught Regal all about tracking. It was a lot harder than it looked in the cowboy movies, but all it really took was practice, and Regal got to where he could tell which Khan had walked around the yard after a rain, where he stopped, and who he'd been talking to. He hadn't realized at the time that he'd eventually come to rely on that training for his livelihood. Regal had been tight with the Aryans up in Sheridan, so he put Honigstock under their umbrella. Seemed like a fair trade. Prison was tough on ex-cops of any kind, but with the white, power crowd watching over him, the old border patrol agent had survived okay. Story Regal heard later was that the old man had gone back down to Arizona or Texas and over to the other side of the law, he'd become a smuggler bringing in illegals, and since he knew all the tricks that Homeland Security knew and then some, did real well at it. The Mexicans called him La Migra Tigre, the Immigration Tiger. 
Honig stock worked a couple years, made a pot of money, and bought a ranch in Wyoming or somewhere, married a trophy wife, and went off to live happily ever after. Regal didn't know if it was true or not, but he liked the idea that it was. Man had done him a real solid, teaching him that shit. Following two men who weren't trying to hide their tracks along a bear trail. Nothing. No problem. He had to backtrack once, where the trail branched off into two narrower paths, but that was no big deal. He was behind them, and he figured he'd find them soon enough. He moved carefully, in case somebody else was ahead of him, but nobody had followed Richardson and Warner along this path, he was sure of that. Something happened to them, it came from another direction. Whatever it was, he was going to find out. Mary went pale when she saw the bodies. Stay here, Sloane ordered her. Where are you going? To have a look. He paused. You know how to use a handgun? No. It's simple. He started to pull the gun from its holster. Don't, she said. I don't want it. He stared at her, shook his head. Suit yourself. Stay here, I'll be back in a little while. I'd rather come with you. You won't like what you see. I've seen dead people before. Fine. He started toward the corpses. They were flyblown, but fresh, the congealing blood was still liquid in spots. Something was wrong about them. As he drew nearer, the stink reached them bowel and blood and fresh meat. Cooked meat. He frowned. That wasn't right. Next to him, Mary stopped, leaned over, and vomited. He ignored her, scanned the trees, the river, looking for signs of life. Of danger. Nothing, save a gentle breeze stirring the evergreens. He kept his rifle ready to shoulder in a hurry. He had already grabbed two spare cartridges, and had them clipped between his fingers, next to his hand. Something moved where it shouldn't he was going to spike it, and the .610 would knock a charging rhino off its feet. Mary decided to stay where she was. He moved closer, and he saw what it was that had seemed odd about the dead men. The same thing that had been wrong with the bear he'd run across. Their heads were gone. And it also looked as if something had stripped. Out their spines. Plus there was that cooked smell, like burnt barbecue. What the hell was going on here? Mary spat bile, the taste bitter in her mouth. Her stomach was empty, and she dry heaved a couple more times, but then she was done. She rinsed her mouth out with some of the water from her bottle, spat again. She hadn't turned away from the scene, and the smell was still vile and making her eyes water, but she was watching Sloan. The ranger moved around the bodies methodically, stopping, squatting down to examine something, then moving a bit to look at something else. After three or four minutes, he stood, looked around, and headed back to where she waited. I'd guess those were the poachers, he said. What happened to them? Bears? No. Scavengers have been at them, but whatever killed them used some kind of weapon. Something that burned them. Never seen anything exactly like it before. I saw a man get hit by lightning in the jungle once looked kinda like this. But lightning doesn't pull off your head and your spine and walk away with it. Who could it be? He shook his head. Remember that dead bear I told you about? His head was gone, and I figured it was poachers. But somebody who would kill two men and take their heads? And what kind of weapon would burn a hole completely through a man? Unless we got some kind of top secret CIA. Spook running around out here testing out a death ray, I don't have a clue. I can't ID the tracks looks like somebody was using Bigfoot boots. She must have looked puzzled. Something you wear on your feet to disguise your tracks. She shook her head, and was immediately sorry. 
It made her stomach churn again. What are we going to do? We're going back to the station. I checked them for ID, nothing. I got the serial numbers on their guns, maybe we can trace them from that. You plan to just leave them here? Yeah. Nothing we can do can help them now. I don't see any reason to try and pack them out. You think you could carry one? You could bury them. Not really. Deep as I could put them with an improvised shovel, something would just dig them back up for supper. It would take a long time to build a rock cairn that might do it, but no point in it, they won't care. If we can get the radio working, we'll call it in. Otherwise, we'll have to wait for Dietz to come pick you up. That's six days. Yeah, so. She frowned. We ought to do something. I'm open to suggestions. She cast around, trying to think of something. It seemed wrong, leaving the bodies out in the open, but she couldn't think of any alternative. Whoever killed these two is still out here. Best we get you back to the station. Me? What about you? I'll be coming back. This is my park. I need to find whoever did this, and deal with them. By yourself. It's what they pay me for. They started back the way they had come. Chapter 6 Regal found what was left of Richardson and Warner just after noon. They'd been dead a while, and animals had been at them, there was a fox or maybe a coyote that scooted into the trees even as he got there. Even though he had halfway been expecting it, it was still a shock. Two of his crew, killed. He went to have a better look. He sure as hell didn't like what he saw. He'd seen plenty of dead guys over the years, including a couple he'd made that way himself, but this? This was fucking grody. He looked at them a long time, poked around, and he couldn't figure out what had killed them exactly. Looked like somebody had rammed a hot iron as big around as man's arm clean through them. A rocket of some kind? No bullet up to a 50 caliber would make that huge a wound, and it was all cauterized, like some kind of laser beam. Science fiction shit. What kind of poachers use stuff like that? Where would they get it? He circled around and round a set of tracks, a big man, and what? Looked like a small man, maybe a woman. The smaller one had stopped there to puke, the vomit was still being carted away by the ants and flies. The bigger one had gone to examine the dead guys, but he hadn't killed them at least not when he'd gotten here his tracks were half a day newer than the bodies were dead. There were other tracks, hut they were faked. The man's boot prints. Had to be the ranger. What the hell did this mean? Who was out here, killing his men? Richardson and Warner had been pretty savvy, it would have been hard just to sneak up on them and take them out without them getting off a shot. He checked their weapons, neither of their rifles, nor their handguns, had been fired recently, they were all still fully loaded. He searched the bodies, didn't find anything that would identify them. He took their guns and walked into the shallow water, and a quarter mile up river, then tossed the guns out into the middle. Probably wouldn't ever be found, but if they were, he'd be long gone, and there wasn't any way to connect him to them anyhow, everybody had brought their own hardware. He needed to get back to the other two teams, let them know what had happened. This was some seriously bad shit here. He kept a wary gaze working, scanning the trees constantly, looking for danger. No poacher he had ever heard about carried a fucking death ray. Some kind of military training exercise, maybe? Testing out some new superweapon. But the military wouldn't just cook somebody like that, would they? That would be wrong. And the military would never do anything illegal. Yeah. Right. Whatever it was, he didn't like it. It was time to fold their tents and get gone. They'd cash in what they had, move on to another part of the world. 
no point in risking your ass for a few bucks. No, sir. Boogie, regal, and get yourself gone. Sloane's mind worked as they walked, and nothing he came up with made any kind of sense. Whoever had killed the bear and taken its head hadn't used anything that left marks like whatever had killed the two men. But the bear's head was missing, and so were the heads of the two dead guys, and that sure didn't seem like a coincidence. Whoever took out the bear also took out the men. And if these two were poachers and they looked rigged for it then who else was out here? And why did they kill two people with some kind of energy weapon but not use it on a much bigger animal like a brown bear? Didn't make any sense. He'd done three tours, had 97 confirmed kills, he had seen men blown up with C-4, cut in half by heavy machine gun fire, and cooked with napalm to crispy critters, and he hadn't seen anything quite like this before. Maybe the military had developed some new toys. He tried to keep up, he had the computer at the station and when it worked, he could get into some pretty state-of-the-art websites, but all the laser or charged particle stuff he had seen required a huge power supply, you'd need a big honkin' truck to haul it around, and there weren't any tire marks out here. Maybe you could rig something in a big helicopter, but even so, he'd have noticed something that large flying around. And where would it have landed? If those two were killed where he'd found them and they sure as shit had been there weren't any signs of a vehicle big enough to carry a generator to power a beam weapon that could punch a hole through a human being. Maybe they got shot from orbit. Some kind of Star Wars weapon. Yeah. Sure. What? Mary said. He looked at Mary. What? You were smiling. Something funny I'm missing. Off chasing a wild hare, he said. Trying to puzzle it out. What kind of weapon killed those two? Does it really matter? Well, if I'm gonna be tromping around out here trying to find the shooters, I wouldn't mind knowing what I was up against. Might matter if they pointed it at me. And. I got nothing. I know a little about weapons. Nothing I know about can match what killed the poachers. You sure they were poachers? Most likely. Probably more of them running around. Great. So there are poachers and high-tech murderers out here. So much for the unspoiled beauty of nature. You said something about a radio earlier. Not working. Atmosphere is weird up here. Sometimes the radio works, sometimes it doesn't. No phones, no zip code, no easy way in or out. She shook her head, said something he didn't quite catch. Excuse me. I said, men. You prefer the company of women? Not that way, no, she said, glaring at him. It's just that all that testosterone bubbles up and you have to beat your chest and go out and kill something or you feel inadequate. It's disgusting. We're simple creatures, us men, he said. Find it, kill it, eat it. You think that's funny? Any of this is? Funny. Here's the situation, we're out here in the middle of nowhere, you, me, some poachers, the local wildlife, and somebody with a Buck Rogers cannon who is pot shooting two out of three. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't consider us viable targets. We have no help, and unless the big radio works better than my portable, no chance of getting any real soon. What would you have me do? Hunker down at the station and wait six days? Yes. And what if the folks who killed those two decide to pay us a house call? The station is pretty sturdy, but it wasn't designed to stand up against whatever these guys are carrying. Better to find them where I have the advantage. Before they come to visit. You think you have the advantage in the forest? Oh, yeah. It's my forest. Nobody knows it like I do. My home court. And what will you do if you find them? That would be up to them. 
If they want to come along quietly, I'll arrest them and lock them in a storeroom until Dietz shows up. If they want to start a firelight, I can deal with that. She didn't say anything to that, but a kind of schoolteacherish disapproval was written all over her face. He grinned. Damned if he didn't like her a little bit. She wasn't shy about calling it like she saw it, even though she was wrong. Civilians just didn't understand how things got done in the real world. Let's get going, he said. Sooner I get on it, the better. Mary didn't like any of this. The place where her little brother had died hadn't held any revelations about his end for her. The murdered men they had found had been grisly in the extreme, she could still taste the bile from when she had vomited and the idea of some killer running around here burning people and bears with some kind of sci-fi weapon was a little scary. Probably they were here testing it because they wanted to keep it secret, and now that she and Sloane knew about it. That didn't make her any more comfortable. Who could it be? Some mad scientist. The military. She didn't much like the idea of being left in the ranger station while Rambo here went out gunning for the killers, either. They were a long way from help up here, and the trip now seemed like a very bad idea. She should have stayed in L.A. She couldn't help her brother now, and there was nothing here for her. Except maybe being killed herself. They didn't talk on the hike back not real chatty, Sloane, and that was fine with her. She had a lot to think about, and not much of it was happy. She didn't need to be arguing with a man whose first reaction to trouble was to go for a gun. He was a savage. The world didn't need men like him. Back at the station, Sloan tried the radio, but it was just a big paperweight, he wasn't getting anything on any frequency. Naturally the damn thing didn't work when he most needed it. Another example of Murphy's law the toast always falls buttered side down. But he needed to get on top of this, and since help wasn't coming any time soon, he was on his own. That wasn't such a bad thing he had moved through the jungle surrounded by the enemy more than a few times by his lonesome, no spotter, just him and his skill and his weapon. He wasn't as strong or fast now as he had been, but he hadn't lost all his steps. It was a thing he knew how to do. Did I mention I don't think this is a good idea? Mary asked. Six or seven times now, he said. What if the guys you are after decide to come here while you're gone? I'll leave you a gun. No. She shook her head. Those men on the trail had guns and undoubtedly knew how to use them better than I. It won't do me any good. And I couldn't shoot somebody even if I knew how. Really? You'd rather die than protect yourself? Yes. I'm not a violent person. I'd rather not have to make that choice. Most people wouldn't like to make it, but if it is them or me. No question. You were in the army. Not the army. Marines. But I'd have made that choice before I joined the military. Really? Oh, yeah. I am a child of the universe. I have a right to be here. Somebody wants to take that away from me, I get to stop him if I can. She smiled. It was nervous, maybe, but an ex-marine park ranger quoting Desiderata. She hadn't expected that, he could tell. Maybe whoever did it left, she said. That would be good, but I'm not betting my ass on it. I'll go look. I'll be back tomorrow. You can keep trying the radio, it's on the Opkin for HQ, and if you get anybody, tell them what's going on. I'll try the portable, but I wouldn't count on hearing from me until you see me. And what if you don't come back? There's plenty of food and water here. Dietz will show up in a few days. Anybody comes to call before then, take off, hide in the woods, work your way back. That's it. That's all you have for me. What do you want me to say? I didn't ask for any of this, and that includes you. 
I'm doing the best I can with what I got. She had nothing to say to that. After he was gone, she sat in the kitchen at the table, drinking coffee. All alone in the world, save for her cats, and they were just as happy living with a neighbor as they were living with her. She was tired, bone tired, and not just from the walk and what they had seen. Maybe she would lie down for a while. See if she could rest. A nap. Yes. Maybe that would stop her thinking about Paul and what had happened to him out there on the banks of that river. The door flew open and slammed into the wall and the man charged into the room. The woman screamed, the man yelled, the sounds of hands hitting flesh, grunts, somebody banging into furniture and walls poured forth, awful, terrible sounds. You ask for this. Is this how you like it? Get your clothes off, I'll give it to you. With what, the woman said. She laughed, a nasty noise. That little limp thing you have. Bitch. The sound of him slapping her was loud. Make them stop, the child wailed. Make them stop. But they wouldn't stop. They just kept at it. Like they had done so many times before. That make you feel like a man. Beating me. Something has to, you frigid bitch. Hugh doesn't think I'm frigid. He knows how to treat a woman. He roared, a mindless, primal sound. She must have jumped on the bed, somehow bounced past him, because she ran back into the living room, her blouse tom half off, one bra strap broken. He was right behind her, but she shoved the other end table next to the couch in front of him, he hit it and fell, screaming again as he fell. Chapter 7 Sloane had hiked well into the afternoon before he got his answers. Some of them, at least. He heard it before he saw it. A pissed-off bear in full voice, roaring at something. The bear's call was steeped in rage, loud, even at a distance. Sloane immediately went into stealth mode, moving quietly up the low hill he'd been climbing, but quickly, to draw closer to the sound. It only took a minute to reach the crest, get within range with his field binoculars. Whatever he had been expecting, it wasn't this. He was stunned. He saw it through his binoculars, he was 1412 meters and change up slope from the clearing next to the water, and it was astounding. More than astounding. Amazing. Incredible. Unbelievable. The male brown bear stood more than three meters tall when it reared on its hind legs, probably ran thirteen hundred pounds. Not a record size, maybe, but big and mean enough. This, creature danced around it, incredibly fast, slashing at it with long, double wrist blades mounted on its right arm. The bear jumped, as if hit from behind, and then the other monster just appeared out of nowhere, like magic. Two of them. Sloane realized they had some kind of high-tech stealth suits. That explained it, the feeling earlier that he had been watched. He could have walked right past one and not seen it. Jesus! The two things worked as a team, and they were very efficient. Fast as the bear was, they were faster. When the bear would focus on one, the other would dart in, cut or stick it, and back out before the bear could turn. It was deadly and impressive. The bear managed to lay a paw on them a couple times, knocking them sprawling, but that didn't do any damage Sloane could see. They just bounced back up and kept going. It took a few minutes, but eventually, the bear bled out enough from its wounds so that it grew weak. It tried to run, but the things blocked it, kept attacking. Once it was down and unable to fight any more, they zapped it with some kind of laser to put it out of its misery. Sloane watched the bear go boneless in that way that meant death. Totally inert. Now, the things used some kind of cutting implement to take its head off, looked like a big ulu knife, but he caught some kind of sparkle on the device, hard to be sure what that meant, this far away. 
really sharp, whatever it was. So. It wasn't some U.S. military unit test out in the boonies to test a death ray. It was fucking spacemen. He accepted the impossible as truth because there was no way around it. Seven feet tall, or close to it, upright, two-legged, strange-shaped heads, wearing some kind of breathing helmets, ropes, or braided hair hanging off the back. The binoculars couldn't resolve things enough for small details at this range, but they definitely weren't human. They were muscular, strong, wearing some kind of woven armor that was pretty effective, the way they had shrugged off the bear's pawings. A slap from a big bear could break a man's spine. He didn't know what they were, but he knew what they were doing. The bear, the two poachers. They were hunters. And willing to dance hand to hand with a full grown brown bear. That's why they were here, from wherever they had come, and Sloane was damn sure it wasn't from any place local. Not this planet, not this solar system. Which meant he was dealing with creatures from light years away, and that meant they had some kind of super duper spaceship hidden somewhere, and technology far in advance of whatever he could lay hands on. Their tech was a lot bigger than his. Motherfucker. If ever he needed the regular marines, this would be the time, and his radios might as well be fishing sinkers. Maybe it was the Aurora. Or maybe these things had some kind of jammer working, just in case somebody spotted them. There was a scary thought. Not the best situation. Not little green men from another world. Big, nasty fuckers who could kill an Alaskan brown bear using knives, who also had some kind of energy weapon that could burn a hole through a human. Bad. Real bad. He was going to need a bigger gun. He didn't want to get any closer to these monsters than he had to God knew what kind of range those particle beams had. He couldn't hit them from here with his normal carry gun, and even if he could, he only had one round before he had to reload. Somehow, he didn't think that was going to be enough. He needed something with reach and more than one shot, and he needed it in a hurry. He watched the two aliens standing over the bear, its head held up for inspection. He had to get back to the station, ASAP. Little Mary from LA was going to love this when he told her. The nasty surprise waiting for Regal and the others caught them flat-footed. The Honda four-wheeler at Versus had been trashed. It looked like somebody had taken sledgehammers and blow torches to them, they were totaled, wrecked right down to the frames. Twisted, burned, broken, useless. Holy shit, Martin said. I hear that, Danny said. Man. The four men all looked at Regal. What the fuck are you looking at me for? I got here before you did. I don't like this, Gibson said. Not a damn bit. The brain lock that had Regal stalled faded a little. Enough for him to realize that whoever had killed their ATVs might be hanging around to watch their reactions when they got here. Danny, you and Mel go scope out the south trail, Martin, you and Gibson check the east path. Make sure we're alone here. See something, shoot it. Get back here soon as you see we're clear. All four men looked worried, and he couldn't blame them. With their transportation dead, what should take a day to travel would take at least a week of hard hiking, and while that wasn't undoable, there was a problem. Whoever had ruined the ATVs wouldn't have any trouble figuring out where they planned to use them. They'd know the escape route, and that was bad. They could set up anywhere along the way and he and his crew could get dead before they knew what hit them. Go, go. They went. Okay, Regal, he said aloud. Time for a change in plans. But what? There was nothing here, except for the ranger station. That was it. They'd go there, use the ranger's radio to call somebody back in civilization, get a plane sent out. If the ranger and his girlfriend or boyfriend got in the way. Too bad. This was serious business. 
He had two men already taken out, and while he didn't give a rat's ass about the four he had left, he definitely did not want to get his ticket punched. It was a few hours hike along the animal trails to get to the ranger station. No problem. The sun wasn't going down any time soon, and it wasn't going to stay down long when it did get dark. Mel and Danny got back first. Clear, they said together. Couple minutes later, Gibson and Martin returned. Nobody there, Gibson said. Okay. We're going to go to the ranger station, use his radio, and get us a flight the hell out of here. He could feel their relief. It wasn't much of a plan, but it was what they had. Chapter 8 Mary stared at Sloane as if he had just turned into the Wicked Witch of the West. I'm sorry, she said. Could you say that again? Sloan was unlocking a big padlock on a tall metal cabinet. He opened the door. The cabinet was full of guns. She didn't know enough about them to tell what kind, but there were at least a dozen long guns in a rack, wood, blued steel, they had a pungent, lubricant smell rifles, shotguns, whatever. Plus pistols and other stuff on shelves. An arsenal. Why didn't that surprise her? Guns, 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 men and their fucking guns. There was a big rectangular aluminum case against one side, and Sloan removed this. It looked heavy from the way he handled it. He took it to the table in the center of the room and set it there. He began unsnapping latches on the case. Which part do you need me to repeat? You're saying there are some kind of extraterrestrial predators out there, who came here to hunt bears. And men, apparently. That's that's dash. Crazy. Yeah, I know. Look, I never did drugs, it's not some kind of flashback hallucination. I watched these two things kill a full-grown male brown bear, cut off its head, and then walk away with their trophy. I went down and looked. The bear was dead, and there were tracks leading away. I didn't imagine it. Wasn't Bigfoot gear. I can't believe this, she said, although in truth, she did. Sloan was abrasive, but he wasn't unbalanced. The way he'd told the story, too he didn't care if she believed him. Not on the list of things I expected to see when I got up this morning, either. He opened the case. It contained another weapon. Of course. And so all you came back here for was to get a bigger gun? Yep. You're planning to kill them? Beings from another planet? I don't much care where they came from. It's what they're doing here that matters. We need to contact the authorities Dash. Yeah. You have any luck with that while I was gone? This is too important. You can't just shoot them. Want to bet? He took the weapon from the case, worked some part of it. It made a clack-clack sound. She felt a kind of helpless desperation. Sloan, listen. Contact with another sentient species, it could be the most important thing ever to happen to humanity. Creatures from another planet. Murdering creatures from another planet, who are slaughtering bears. To practice their hand-to-hand -hand skills, and killing poachers with death rays. Not my kind of folks. Sloan Dash. He turned to look at her. Look, if these things came in peace to extend the claw of friendship and all, they'd have landed in Washington D.C. and had their ambassador talking to the president or Congress or to CBS News. But what did they do instead? They came down in the middle of nowhere, they killed two men we know about, they are out there taking heads for trophies. Maybe that was self-defense. Maybe those men shot first. No, they didn't. They were cut down without getting a round off. I checked their weapons. They were poachers, criminals. Maybe they threatened these beings. They could have done that. Yeah, they could have. 
but I don't think they did. I saw how these things took out the bear. They killed it for sport it didn't really have a chance. I think they cooked the two poachers for the same reason. Since the humans were armed, they used their beam weapons. But you don't know that for sure. I know they took their heads for trophies just like they did the bears. But Dash. What would you have me do? Invite them in for tea. Don't do anything. Get the radio working, call for help, let people in charge make the decisions. I can't get the radio working and I think these things are jamming the signals. I'm the guy on the ground, and the threat is out my door. Listen Dash. No, I'm sorry, but I saw how these things slaughtered that bear. These aren't cute little ETs come to eat Reese's pieces and make nice, not the cuddly critters from close encounters come to give us a free ride to the stars. They are hunters, killers. You can't be sure Dash. Yes, I can. Because I am a predator, and I know my own kind when I see them. She stared at him. Words failed her. It was just, unbelievable. Sloan turned his attention back to his weapon. As sniper rifles went, this was the top of the line, the Chaytac M-200 intervention. You couldn't buy one unless you were military, or in a police sniper unit or unless you knew somebody, and even then, it wasn't cheap. The rifle was capable of hitting a man-sized target at 2,000 meters, and held the record at that range three rounds into a 16-inch circle, in the field, with a wind knot in a bench rest. Using a Night Force NXS 5-5-22X variable mag scope and the advanced ballistic computer system with the Kestrel sensor station, accurate shots at really long ranges were possible. With the M40.408, 419 grain round, at 800 to 1000 meters. Even a SOSO shooter could hit a bear or whatever the fuck these monsters were, 95 times out of a hundred, and any solid hit should damn sure knock it on its ass. Sloan was better than a SOSO shooter. Behind him, Mary said, can you even do it? Kill them with that? You said the bear hit them and didn't even slow them down. He hefted the rifle. It was heavy 27 pounds without the scope and loaded magazine. This will punch a hole through a half-inch thick steel plate at 600 meters. To stop the round, you need 4-inch armored glass or rolled homogeneous armor. Excuse me? An APC? Or a tank? How is it possible a civilian can even own one of these? He knows somebody who remembers he wasn't always a civilian. Sloan said. And he saves his money. She looked at him. Costs about $14,000. The handloads are passing expensive. Six or seven bucks a round. $14,000. Not a lot to spend my pay on out here, he said. He waved randomly at the door, the vastness of Alaska. And quality costs. I don't understand why you would think you needed such a thing, she said. He shook his head. But I do need it, don't I? His way of making her speechless continued, she didn't seem to be able to think of anything to say to that. Mary was afraid. Not only of whatever those things were out in the woods, but also of Sloane. He was fierce, and there was in him a coldness she could feel, a determination that seeped from him like opening the door to a freezer, a blast of icy wind that made her want to inhale sharply and hunker down. He wasn't afraid of these things, these alien creatures. He was angry at them. He wanted to punish them. He wanted to kill them. What happened to people, that they could think like this? That a gun, a killing tool, could be the answer. Guns were evil things. Softly, she said, why are you this way? I don't understand. He put the rifle down and stared at her. After a moment he dropped his gaze, began to speak. When I was eighteen, I was drafted. 
I joined the Marines instead of going into the Army. I grew up on a farm in Texas, I knew how to shoot a rifle. They offered me training as a sniper. Snipers work alone, or with a spotter. They get an assignment, go out, do it, nobody looking over their shoulder. I'm not a joiner. I like being alone. He looked at her. I served three tours in country. I capped a shitload of NVA and Viet Song, couple Russians, couple Chinese advisors. It was what I was taught how to do, it was what the Marines paid me to do. I won medals for it. Why would I be any other way? She shook her head. I didn't start that war, he said. But you stayed in it when you could have come home. He nodded. Yeah. I did. I was good at my job. You enjoyed killing those people? No. Not the killing. The setup. The strategy and tactics. The shot. I didn't see them as people, they were targets. She shook her head again. They had guns, he said evenly. They could have shot back. Guns. Did they have a real chance against you? Mostly, no. If I had screwed up along the way, yeah, but I made it my business not to screw up. So these things out in the forest, they aren't so different from you, are they? Maybe not. They are obviously sentient creatures, from some other world. They have space flight, they are civilized dash. You already said that. They are here practicing on the local animals. They have slaughtered bears and people. Yeah, the people were poachers, and I don't have much use for them, but however sentient or civilized these fuckers are, dropping by and doing what they are doing. First, it's not civilized, and second, NIMBY. Excuse me? NIMBY. Not in my backyard. She blinked, frowned. Is that what this is about? You're pissed off because they are killing your bears. In your park. So you are going to murder them. You come into my house and you start trashing the place, you need to expect I'm not going to just stand by and allow that. You are willing to kill visitors from another world who have technology so far beyond ours that we can't even imagine how they do it. This is so wrong. You can't just kill them. Look around, Mary. Let me say it for the last time, we're out here by ourselves, you, me, a handful of bear poachers, and the monsters. Our radio doesn't work, there's no way for us to get out of here unless we hike a hundred miles, and I'd bet the farm these spaceship flying creatures can track us if we try, they are hunters. Nobody is coming to help us. It's either them or us, how I see it. They made it that way, not me. So you will kill them? Yeah. If I can before they get me. It was hopeless, there wasn't anything she could do to sway him. She could almost understand his logic it did make a warped kind of sense, however technologically advanced these things were, killing bears and people for sport wasn't civilized. It could be that they had only been defending themselves against the poachers, those men might well have tried. To shoot the visitors, and self-defense was allowed maybe she couldn't bring herself to kill somebody but mutilations? Chopping off the heads. What did that mean? Were they, as Sloan had said, trophies? Were they predators, and only here because they thought of people as prey? But killing was never the answer, she knew that. Guns were never the answer, no matter who held them. This was all too grisly to think about. Listen, she tried. No, I'm sorry, you're wrong about this. I know your heart is in the right place, you are looking for the peaceful answer, but sometimes, that just won't work. How do you know? Have you ever tried it? Killing is, just so. Wrong. We have to stop it, somewhere. Somebody has to take a stand. Maybe somebody will, someday. 
But not me. And not today. Please, she said. I'm sorry, he said. But she had seen that cabinet full of death-dealing machinery. She didn't believe him. Chapter 9 It had been a long time since he'd worn a ghillie suit, and he wasn't that keen to do it now, but Sloane definitely did not want to be seen. Problem with the outfit, which was basically an old flight coverall strapped with burlap mesh so you could stick leaves and branches into it for camouflage, was that the sucker kept all your heat in. Got to sweat point really quick on a warm day. Great cover, even would shield you from an infrared scope to a degree, but uncomfortable. Well. One of the first things you learned as a sniper was to deal with discomfort. The game had changed a lot since he'd been in the service. Back then, it was lay and pray you might spend 8, 10 hours in the same spot, not moving, waiting for a shot. Now, it was run and gun, you set up, took a shot, then boogied to another location. Running in a suit that was cooking you wasn't any better than lying still in it. Had to pee. You couldn't take the suit off. You just let it go, and hoped you'd get back to base to take a shower soon. Gillies were limited, too, you couldn't rig one for every kind of terrain, you had to wait until you found out whether you were in big green or brush or sand, so for now, Sloane kept the ghillie in his backpack and wore his own homemade camo, a jumpsuit he had stained and colored to match local forest undergrowth. If he got to a place where he needed it, he'd switch to the ghillie suit, no point in killing himself rigging and wearing it until then. Yeah, he was getting old and lazy. But, hell, it had all been gravy since 67, when he should have died three or four times. If he got killed today, it didn't mean anything anyhow. Fuck it. He headed back to where the dead poachers were. The killers were big, heavy, and he didn't think he'd have any trouble picking up their trail. They might be able to turn invisible in their shift suits, but that wouldn't make their treads any lighter. He knew their tracks now. This was his forest. He'd find them. Mary tried the radio again. She limited herself to once an hour, and the result so far had been the same every time, nothing. She felt helpless. This was not her environment. She didn't know how to do much of anything out in the woods, and being in the station was the safest thing for her. While Sloane was out there being Daniel Boone in the woods, it was better for her to be her, trying to contact somebody with enough brains to know how to deal with this situation. But the radio mocked her. It would hiss once in a while, crackle, sound almost as if somebody was speaking, but each time she tried to transmit a call, nothing happened. Sloan had a computer with a satellite uplink, but she couldn't log on to the Tanet either. Whatever was blocking the radio was apparently blocking that, too. Maybe he was right. Maybe the alien creatures were somehow jamming the signal. Surely a civilization that had space flight could manage to do that, if they wanted. But why would they want to do that? Yes, she could understand how they might not wish to be discovered until they deemed it fit to make contact. Humans were dangerous and brutal, Sloan was the perfect example of shoot first and don't ask questions later. In their place, she would be cautious, too. That made sense. But what if Sloan was right? If that were the case, then maybe they had been here for a while. How long? Days? Weeks? Months? Centuries? Mankind had seen strange lights in the sky for hundreds of years. Much of that had been explained ball lightning, piezoelectric effects, even sightings of the planet Venus. But now that she knew there were visitors from another world here, the questions arose, how long had they been coming here? To what end? She had no answers. She moved to the radio again, hoping to contact somebody better equipped than she or Sloane who might be able to figure it out. They needed somebody who could figure it out. It was beyond what she could manage. Nothing. 
The radio was still useless. Somebody else had dropped by to look at the two dead poachers. Even if Sloane hadn't seen the tracks, which disappeared at the edge of the river, the fact that the guns were all gone was enough. Probably not the aliens, they had better hardware. If he had to guess, he'd say it was another one of the poachers, and he'd taken the guns to keep somebody from maybe using them to ID the dead pair. Too late, but since Sloan wasn't going to be calling the numbers in anyhow, and it didn't really matter right at the moment who they had been, no problem. He wondered what the guy must have thought when he found the dead men. Any kind of woodsman would have picked up the Bigfoot tracks and probably figured it was somebody trying to mess with his head. Unless he knew about the goblins running around out here. Maybe he was even in league with them. Local guides or something. No, probably not. He didn't think the monsters would hire help, they didn't look like they needed it. Coincidence, there being poachers and monsters here at the same time. That's how he figured it. Following the tracks was both easy and hard. The things had to go 280, 300 pounds, easy, and every place soft they stepped, they left sign. Then again, they had suits that, for all practical purposes, made them invisible, and he didn't want to blunder across them when they might be taking a pee break, and maybe had the suits lit up to make sure nobody saw them. The tracks and sign were half a day old, and didn't seem to get much fresher for the first few hours he tracked them. He lost them a couple times, circled around until he picked them back up again. They didn't seem to be trying to hide their trail, and they stuck mostly to the bear or deer paths. He came across brown bear scat that was fairly fresh, three, four hours, and figured they were probably hunting the bear. Any time he heard anything, he left the trail and melted into the woods, crouched down and using cover, until he saw what it was or he couldn't hear anything else that might be tromping around out here. It was a different kind of forest than the Southeast Asian jungles, but woods were woods. No lions or tigers here, but plenty of bears. During the seasons when they were up and about, nobody with any sense went anywhere unarmed. There was guy lived forty or so miles away, Dwayne was his name, he had a cabin in the park where he stayed summers, with his wife and an old dog. He was a retired professor of something or the other, and they catered to tourists who'd come up and stay a few days. Cabin was smack in the middle of a conflux of bear trails. One day, Dwayne, his wife, and the dog went for a hike. Usually he carried a 12-gauge pump shotgun, loaded with alternating rounds of deer slugs and double-up buck shoot, which was an okay bear load. But that time, they left the shotgun at home and Dwayne just took a .44 Magnum revolver in a shoulder holster. They weren't really expecting to see any bears, and the .44 mag wasn't really up to the job of stopping one quick unless you were a really good shot or lucky. A couple miles away, Dwayne stepped off the trail a ways to take a leak and while he was watering the trees, looked up to see a brown bear go past, heading toward where he'd left his wife and dog. Pretty quick the dog caught the bear's scent and started barking like crazy. Dwayne didn't even zip up, he took off, pulled his .44 mag and started yelling and carrying on, to get the bear's attention. He wasn't sure he could even hit it, he said, he wasn't much of a pistol shot, but the bear kept going, and so Dwayne pointed the long-barreled revolver over the bear's head and cooked off a couple rounds. That apparently got the bear's attention, and it wheeled around and took off. His wife, Luann, told the story from there, so I looked up, and there's Dwayne, running down the trail, his willy waving in the breeze, screaming like a madman and shooting that big handgun. Funniest thing I ever saw. Sloane smiled at the memory of the story, moved on. Not an hour later, he came across fresh sign weeds bent by the trail, tracks, and he realized he was getting closer to his prey. No more than a few minutes ahead of him, he guessed. Maybe it was time to unship the backpack and change into the ghillie suit. You figure the ranger is in there. 
That was from Danny. Regal was beginning to get more than a little irritated at all the stupid questions. What, did he have x-ray vision, he could see through the fucking station walls. But he let it go, I don't know. We need to find out. He's seen what was left of Richardson and Warner, and if he's got any smarts at all, he's gonna be moving very carefully. Probably already called it in, so we don't know how long it is gonna be before somebody sends a plane with help. Could be arriving any time. It does, we'll, ah, uh, borrow it. Otherwise, we call in our own ride. So, how we gonna handle it? He's got company. Another man or a kid, maybe a woman, so they can watch the front and the back at the same time. But they can't watch all four sides of the place. You all will come in from the sides, Martin and Gibson, the south, you and Mel the north. I'll move to the front and get his attention. Once that happens, you go in through the windows. Don't shoot anybody unless you have to. We collect M, tie M up, get airborne soon as we can. Wait until you hear me, then go. Any questions? Nobody had any. Good. Let's do it. Mary was on her way back from the bathroom to check the radio again when she heard somebody yelling. Hey. Anybody in there? Hey Dash. She moved to the front room and looked through the window next to the door. There was a man standing about 80 yards away. He was holding a rifle, but it was pointed at the ground. Young, dressed in camouflage pants and a dark green shirt, wearing a dark, short-brimmed hat. He was grinning. Ranger. You home. We have an injured man out here. Mary didn't see anybody else with the man. The poachers. Had to be them. What was she going to do? She didn't think a locked door would keep them out if they wanted to come in, and she couldn't stop them. Should she hide? Go out the back. That's what Sloan had told her to do if somebody came to the station sneak out and into the woods. There was an emergency pack next to the back door, he told her. Grab that and run. But, what if somebody was around back, watching? Her gut roiled, full of a thousand butterflies, it suddenly seemed. This was bad. The whole trip was a nightmare, getting worse all the time. What was she going to do? He came to his feet, but she was already in the kitchen, jerking the drawer open. By the time he got there, she had the knife in her hand, the one with the long blade they used for slicing the turkey at Thanksgiving. The one for cutting up the pot roast. She waved it in front of her. Put that down, he said, his voice gone tight and quiet. I won't. If you try and hit me again, I will cut your balls off. Put the knife down. Make me. He edged closer to her. She whipped the knife back and forth in a tight pattern, like a band conductor waving his baton. He backed away. Put it down. Get out, she said, her voice lower, but still hard. Get out or I will use this. Really? There was a black skillet on the counter next to the sink. He snatched it up by the handle and swung it at her. She dodged backward. He threw the skillet. It hit the woman on the shoulder. She dropped the knife, and he charged, barreled into her, slamming her into to the back door. The glass in the door broke as her head hit it. She screamed. Hey, Ranger. Regal yelled at the station. You in there. Hey Dash. So far, nobody had appeared from the station, and Regal was inclined. To believe nobody was home, which was good. But let's find out. He put his earplugs in, pointed his rifle up, and fired it. That was the signal to his men. He couldn't hear the sound of breaking glass, but he knew his teams were doing that and going into the place. 
he ran for the nearest tree and took cover. Sloan had ear protectors you had to wear something when shooting big boar weapons, else you'd go deaf. His were electronic, in that they compressed noise over a certain decibel level, dropping it to a safe level, but allowed normal sounds in. More, they could be turned up, to become amplifiers that would allow you to hear things you normally couldn't. Sometimes called wolf ears, the hearing protectors were ear muffs, like old-style radio operator headphones, and when dialed up, you could hear your own breathing. Useful that, when you were in the woods. He had the ear muffs on and turned up, and he now wore his ghillie suit. It had gotten warm inside that in a couple of minutes, even though the day wasn't hot and he was mostly in the shade. It wasn't fully tricked out, but there were enough branches and leaves stuck in the webbing so that from a distance and squatting, he'd probably look like a bush. Better cautious than killed his quarry was close. He hadn't seen them yet, but he could feel them, somewhere up ahead of him. He knew they were there. It was interesting how the old memories and moves came back, once you went into stalking mode. He didn't do much hunting these days the rogue bear was the last animal he had killed, and it had been four or five years between that one and the one before it. He did it when he had to, but it wasn't any kind of sport for him. And he hadn't hunted men since Vietnam, forty years ago. But the feel, the little things you did, they were there. He was rusty, yeah, but under that, the core of steel was intact. His brain kept telling him this was a bad idea, his body kept insisting he needed to pee, to take a dump, his belly was full of squirming somethings. His mouth was dry, his heart going faster, his breathing too quick it was as if four decades had never happened, and he was a twenty-year-old kid from Texas halfway around the world from home, waiting to line up on some Viet Song in black pajamas whose number was about to be up. Only this was not a little yellow man in a jungle, but some kind of being from far beyond this planet, and much, much more dangerous. Should he be tracking them? Was Mary right? Was this a really bad idea? Was he about to start a war with some kind of spaceman? No, he decided. They had started it. They were in his woods killing his bears. Fuck them. He caught the sound then. Voices, but not voices, speaking some language not of this world. Sound carried oddly here, he couldn't tell where it was coming from, how far away it was. He went down on his belly and started to crawl, slowly, carefully, listening, looking. He heard the sound again, and though he couldn't understand the language, he got the sense that there was laughter in the voice. One hunter, telling another a story. On his belly, slithering, he moved forward. He came up a slight rise in the trail. And there they were. It was still an amazing sight, but in another way, he had already plugged it into his tactical thinking and gotten past that. Yeah, space monsters, just like out of a bad sci-fi movie, and unbelievable in a whole lot of ways, but he could skip over that part and get to the nitty-gritty. How to deal with space monsters who were armed with rockets and ray guns and suits that made them invisible, that was the important thing. Take it to strategy and tactics, and leave off on the gosh wow stuff. That was how he was wired, how he was trained. They weren't people, they were targets. And what he needed was simple, what was the best way to take them out? That's what the Marines had paid him for, for nine years, and yeah, it had been a while, but the old memories were fully awake now. Lock and load, smoke him if you got him. Chapter 10 Mary grabbed the pack, took a deep breath, and jerked the back door open. She heard the sound of glass breaking down the hall, and knew she only had a few seconds. She charged through the door and ran for the woods, as fast as she could. She didn't look back. She didn't hear anybody yelling behind her. The nearest trees were maybe twenty-five yards away, and while it felt as if it took forever, it couldn't have been more than five or six seconds before she reached them. 
She slowed a bit, jinked to the left to go around a big fir, and charted her path around the underbrush as best she could. Branches scraped her legs, one hit her across the face, she ducked, threw up her arm to cover her eyes, but kept going. Fear made her fast, made her impervious to the scratches, able to run forever if she had to go that far to survive. She had to slow more as the brush got thicker, but she didn't stop until she was maybe a quarter mile away. There was an animal trail that loomed, and she stopped to catch her breath when she reached it. It felt like a dream, unreal, as if she were outside her body, watching. Which way? It didn't matter. She turned left, and jogged along the trail. They had seen her or they hadn't, and either way, she wanted to put some distance between herself and the station. Run fast, run far. How Sloane would find her, she didn't know, and she wished there was some way to warn him about the men who had come to the station, but when she stopped a half mile farther along and tried the portable radio in the backpack, it wasn't working any better than the one at the station had been. Great. Then again, Sloane was better equipped to deal with the men than she was. She didn't think he would just walk in and be taken unaware. Sloane was in a lot better shape than she was. Out in the middle of nowhere, on her own, no idea of where to go. Bears and other things roaming the forest the off-world predators, the poachers. She was in deep shit here. Men with guns had come for her. Guns. It seemed as if the fight had gone on forever, but it had been only a couple of minutes. Nobody had ever picked up a knife before, and that had pushed things over a new edge. Now the man was using his fists, battering the woman, enraged beyond all reason, and the two of them screamed continuously, past words, into inarticulate animal sounds, screeches, moans, groans. The woman was fading, battered into submission, just covering her head with her hands, trying to curl into a fetal ball. The man was growing tired of hitting her, slowing down. This was how it usually ended, with the two of them running out of rage and just stopping, spent. Not this time. Stop it, the child screamed. Stop it right now. Something in the child's voice reached them. The man stayed his fists and turned to look. The woman on the floor spread her fingers to peer at the child. The child held a gun. He was crying. The gun, a black thing that looked far too big for him to be holding, filled his little hands. Put that down, the man ordered. Right now. Don't hit her. Shoot him, Polly, the woman said. The man leaped at the boy. Give me that, you little shit. Somebody was here, Martin said. He picked up a cup of coffee that had been set on a table. Coffee is still warm. Shit, Regal said. He must have gone out the back while you were hitting the side windows. Mel came into the main room. Maybe it was a she. Bedroom past the bathroom has got a woman's stuff in it. Not like she lives here permanently some of it is still packed. Regal took in the scene. There was only one cup out. Somebody had scooted out the back when they heard them coming in. You know which room is the ranger's? Yes. Other end of the hall. But the woman's stuff is in a different room? Yeah, it is. Hmm. What? Maybe it's his sister. Or a supervisor. He went out back and looked for sign. Spotted it. Yeah. One person, small tracks, same as where he'd seen the bodies. The woman. Where was the ranger? He went back into the station. Radio ain't working, Danny said. Lights up fine, hisses, crackles, but no signal. Shit, Regal said. Man, look at this. Regal turned, and saw Gibson standing in front of a metal cabinet. Inside, a small armory. This ranger has got some serious firepower here. 
Regal drifted over. Yes, indeed, rifles, shotguns, handguns, first-class gear, all of it, not a Saturday night special in the bunch. Check out the case, Mel said. Regal turned. Mel pointed at the aluminum case he'd just opened. Guy has got a fucking Chaytac rifle. Regal said, yeah, and it ain't here. He's got it with him. Holy crap, Martin said. Regal felt his skin goosebump. What kind of ranger was this? You could knock somebody over with that gun from a mile and a half away. Jesus holy Christ. Here's the guy's ID, Danny said. Name is Sloan. Regal took the card, looked it over, peering closer at the ranger's age. The guy was old. Gray hair, weathered face. He shook his head. Doesn't mean anything to me. Nobody else knew the name, either. Now what? Mel said. Now, we hang around and see if the radio clears up. What about the ranger? Yeah, what about him? Guy good enough to have all this hardware was probably good enough so he wouldn't just come walking up to the front door without a clue and let them grab him. Then again, they didn't need him for anything except to stay out of their way, right? Fuck M. Long as he doesn't bother us, he can stay loose. Only one guy, and maybe the other poachers out there will find him and give him the same thing they gave Richardson and Warner. What if the radio doesn't clear? That was from Gibson. Sooner or later, somebody will show up here, when they don't hear from the ranger. He's got to report in now and then. Like I said, we'll borrow their bird and fly away. That might take a while, Danny offered. You have an appointment somewhere. Or a better idea. Danny shook his head. So, let's see if the ranger, Mr. Sloan, has some beer stashed. Might as well make ourselves at home. What about the woman? What about her? Suppose she goes and finds Sloan and tell him about us. Suppose she does. He's got a fucking Chaytac, Regal, Martin said. What if he really knows how to use it? He'd set up out in the woods and pot us as we headed for the plane. Regal sighed. Yeah. There was that. Okay. Pick a number between 1 and 10, see who goes and collects the woman. She it, Gibson said. You leave yourself out. I'm the boss, Regal said. We'll go, Danny said. We got more use for a woman than Twinkletoes and Tinkerbell here. That earned him a pair of hard-eyed glares from Gibson and Martin. Yeah, well, after you get tired talking to her, bring her back, alive. I might want to have a similar conversation with her myself, and she could be useful to leverage the ranger, it comes to that. No problem, Mel said. Come on, Danny, let's go find ourselves a parte. Once Sloan spotted the two things, he backed off. They were on the edge of a clearing next to a small stream, and if he circled around, he could get a long way off and still have them in sight. This was a temporary camp, there were four high-tech shelters pitched under some trees, thin sheets of camo material stretched tight in dome shapes. 4. Which meant there were probably at least two more of these things around somewhere. It took him almost an hour to get into position, on a hill across the stream. The two hunters puttered about their camp. One of them was busy cleaning the flesh off a bear's skull, using some kind of glowing green rod that worked like a very sharp knife. They had some nice toys, no doubt about it. He thought again about what Mary had said, about leaving this to the government, scientists, like that. But he remembered what the two poachers had looked like not just killed, but beheaded, and their skulls taken as trophies. These creatures were killers, murderers, and he flat didn't like the idea of them getting away with it. Which would no doubt happen once the government got into it. A misunderstanding, 
they'd say, self-defense, whatever, there would be a way out, because the government would want the technology these beings had. The greater good, and all. It wasn't right. He looked at the two as objectively as he could. They were hunters, come to dance with dangerous prey. Willing to go hand to hand with a brown bear with nothing but those wrist mounted blades. Had to have traveled across light years of empty space in a ship that could make the trip, which put them way beyond the physics humans had mastered. They were serious about this the weapons, the camo, the trophies they took. Whatever culture they had didn't seem likely to be pacifistic, given the hardware they used, and they were willing to smoke the local natives at the top of the food chain killing people didn't seem to bother them. And like he had told Mary, if they had come to make nice, why were they out here slaughtering the wildlife and anybody who happened to be around? So he had made his decision. No way he was going to capture them, and they might just decide to pick up and leave before any help could arrive anyhow. They must have a shuttle stashed somewhere, if not, maybe a mothership in orbit, coming to pick them up when they had filled out their trophy bags. And if Sloan just stepped off, they'd get away with it. No. Wasn't going to happen. You didn't come into Sloan's park and kill people and get away with it. Sloan had already dialed in the scope. It was downhill, and in the old days, he would have had to do the trig in his head, shooting up or downhill made a big difference compared to shooting on the flats, it was easy to over or under aim. The little computer did much of that now and maybe that was a cheat, then again, a shot from 1500 meters, which was how far away they were, the better part of a mile, that wasn't something you did a lot of back in the old days when the wind was blowing and you were in a hostile field. There were a couple guys who had center-punched Charlie from a mile, maybe a hair more, using single-shot scoped. 0.50 BMGs, but that was unusual enough to be remarkable, back in the day. With the Chaytac, there were a lot of guys who could make a mile shot, and a few who could do it from half again that far. Suckers shot flat and hard, and if you did your part, it would put the round where it was supposed to go. He had kept three on an oil drum at 1800 meters once, just to see if he could. These two were righteous targets, and if he sneezed when he pulled the trigger he could miss, but otherwise, he owned them. One hunter squatted, cleaning the skull, the other stood next to him, watching. Sloan was too far away to hear them, even with the wolf ear muffs on, but he could imagine what they might be saying. How good the hunting had been. What a great trophy the bear's skull was going to be hanging on the wall back home. Hey, baby, want to come up and see my trophy collection? Sloan lined up on the one standing, centered the crosshairs on the thing's chest. No wind ruffling the trees down there, and the gauge showed that it was only blowing about six miles an hour here. He had figured that into his settings. It might be tough, it might have some kind of mesh armor that could blunt a bear's claw, maybe even turn a normal rifle or pistol round, but Sloan didn't think it would defeat the Chaytac.408, 419 grain round. He hoped. He evened his breathing became aware of his heartbeat, and listened to it slow. Timing and calmness were critical. At this range, the hold had to be rock steady. At this range, it was going to take just over a second and a half for the bullet to get to the target and a twitch would result in a clean miss. The round would get there long before either the sound of the shot or the round smashing through the sound barrier did, but if they happened to look up and see the blast, they might be able to dodge the shot. One quick step would do it, and in a second and a half, a human could cover six or seven meters, Lord knew what these things could manage. He wanted to shoot between heartbeats, lubbed up. Lubbed up. Lube, the world narrowed to the image on the scope. Sloan didn't so much squeeze the trigger as stroke it. The weapon fired, the muzzle blast blew up fur needles and dust, banged against his shoulder. Even prone, 
with the shock, absorber and the muzzle brake and headphone sound suppressors, it was a fearsome event, he felt it vibrate him right down to his bones. Big boom, big blowback. As soon as the gun went off, he counted aloud, 1001, 1000. The hunter standing went down, all boneless, and Sloan knew the shot was good and that the thing was either dead or dying. He had already shifted his aim. He worked the bolt, ejected the spent round and chambered the second, kept the scope on the other creature, but two things happened before he could squeeze off the second round, first, the second hunter stood, looked in his general direction, and a launcher flared on its shoulder. A rocket, and heading his way. Did the thing have a fix on Sloane's position, or was it shoot and pray? The rocket would either hit him or it wouldn't, and it would take a couple seconds to get here. Sloane started his squeeze. The second alien vanished. Just, blinked out. Sloane fired anyhow. If it didn't move. Too late. It sidestepped. Two seconds later, Sloan saw a second rocket light, appearing from thin air three meters to the right of where he was aiming. Sucker was fast. The first rocket hit 50 meters to Sloan's left and went off hard enough to take down a small tree and make a pretty good racket, but Sloan was already up and running, angling away from his position. He didn't know what kind of optics the thing had in that helmet it wore, but if it saw. The blast from his second shot, and probably it would, since it was looking right at him, that's what it would be aiming for, and he didn't know how accurate it was at that range, fortunately, the rocket was slower than a bullet. Behind him, the second rocket hit and exploded, and the shock wave was enough to knock Sloan forward. He almost fell, but managed to keep to his feet. If he hadn't taken off, it would have creamed him. Okay, so the things were accurate at a distance. Good to know. He angled across the slope, working his way along the bear trail, branching off onto a smaller path that ran deeper into the woods. He'd bet that the second hunter would be heading up here pretty quick, and he wanted to be gone when it arrived. Even with the Chaytac and the BMF revolver, Sloan was outgunned. You didn't want to get into a stand-up fight if the other guy had better weapons not to mention if he could become fucking invisible. But he had learned one thing. However big and strong and well-armed they were, they weren't bulletproof. He could take them out. This was his forest, he had the advantage of knowing the terrain, and they were going to wish they had gone someplace else to do their poaching. One down. Three more to go. Chapter 11 Mary wasn't sure how far she had traveled from the station, but she guessed it must have been at least a couple of miles. The adrenaline that had surged in her when the men had broken into the place had long since ebbed, and she was exhausted. She felt as if she had gone two days without sleep, grainy, tired, and washed out. She had to sit and take a break. She had her watch, and was surprised to realize when she checked it that almost two hours had passed since she'd run from the station. It was 11 p.m. The sky had gone a dimmer gray, but it was probably more than an hour until night would fall. By then, she needed to be somewhere that a bear couldn't get to her, and out here, that meant a tree. She wasn't a great climber. As a girl, there had been a beech tree next to the sidewalk running past her yard, and the neighborhood kids had built a treehouse in it. She'd spent some time there, but there had been wooden rungs nailed to the side of the tree, and it was like climbing a ladder. She'd fallen from it once, landed in a sitting position right on her butt, knocked the wind out of her. She had hit hard enough that her mother, who had been raking leaves in the backyard, heard the impact and rushed out front to see what had caused it. Mary had been okay, just shaken and scared, but the fall had given her a healthy respect for heights. No rungs to make a climb easy out here. A lot of these fir trees didn't have branches anywhere near the ground. There were some hardwoods here and there, but most of them were small, 
and she didn't think being six feet off the ground would do her much good against a bear whose head was twice that height if it stood on its hind legs. And how would she sleep fifty feet off the ground, even if she could get there? The idea of rolling off a branch and falling wasn't real appealing. She opened the pack she'd grabbed and found a water bottle. As she drank, she examined the other contents. The pack was full of useful stuff, matches, flashlight, an emergency blanket made out of what looked like mylar. There were food bars, a small cook kit, a water filter, first aid supplies, and she had already tried the Motorola handheld radio, which was not much bigger than a pack of cigarettes. She tried the radio again. No signal. There was a bottle of sunscreen and mosquito repellent, a small sheath knife, some fishing stuff sinkers, line, and hooks, and a map and compass. Survival gear, most of which she didn't have a clue how to use, save for what she'd seen on the Discovery Channel. She opened the map. It was local, had the ranger station on it, but she wasn't sure where she was in relation to that. There was a small electronic device. A GPS unit. She knew what that was, and with the map, she could figure out where she was but again, no signal. Tucked in the bottom of the pack was a mesh net thing she realized was a hammock. If she could get up into a tree, she could rig the hammock. At least that would solve that problem. The question was, should she start looking for a place to camp now, or should she get farther away? She didn't want to be wandering around in the dark. Best she find a place now. She was pretty sure the men hadn't seen her, and if that was so, then they wouldn't be coming out here looking for her. She had to be at least two miles away. It should be safe enough. Sloane was cooking in the ghillie suit, but he didn't want to take the time to stop and change clothes, besides, he might need it again soon. He knew the predator whose buddy he had killed would want to find him, was no doubt now looking for his trail, and he didn't know how good the things were at tracking. It would be foolish to assume they couldn't work sign, so he took care to leave as little in the way of a trail as he could. The sun would be going down soon, and unless it could see in the dark, that would give Sloane a couple hours, at least, to catch some sleep. He'd get up before dawn and move. The creature was following him, or trying to, that was fine with Sloane. He wasn't running away, he was setting it up. Cat and mouse. Not exactly, more like two cats and the winner would be the one who got in position to take the next shot first. Things could change, but right now, it was Sloane, 1, off-world hunters, 0. He had to stay ahead on points, because if they got just one, it was game over. He had to figure the one behind him might have contacted its buddies to come join the hunt for Sloan. And maybe their communications gear worked better than his. The more he thought about it, the more certain he was that the creatures were jamming the local radio frequencies. That meant that nobody was going to be calling for help. There was a chance that the things might decide to head on down to the station and lay for him there, and that put Mary at some risk, unless maybe the hunters only wanted stags and not does. Still, that was something to be considered. He hadn't thought it through before. He hadn't really thought there would be more than two of the things, and he'd thought he might get them both. Maybe he should go back and collect her. She'd be a hindrance to his stalking, but there were places where he could stash her while he went to hunt. Couple of small caves in the rocks that could be defended against bears, and there was an old firewatch platform fifty feet up a big dug fir a few miles south. Be a lot harder to happen across her in one of those spots than it would at the station. Yeah. Best he go back and get her. She hadn't figured on this when she'd come up here. Then again, who could have figured on it? He was in the middle of it and he still couldn't believe it. Creatures from another planet had come to Earth and he had just killed one of them. No way that was on his radar in advance. No way. Regal was more than a little pissed off. 
The Ranger's radio was a 200-watt Yesu FT-3500, brand new, it had coverage across the amateur bands, 5 60-meter channels, 2-meter juice out the wazoo. Even without a repeater for a thousand miles, you ought be able to talk to fucking Mars with it, and it was not doing shit. He'd been up in Alaska a bunch of times, Canada, too, and even when the aurora was blasting away, you could still get something. It didn't feel right. Then there was this ranger with enough hardware to supply a third world country stashed in his gun safe. What was that all about? That he was running around there with a fucking Chaytac rifle, which you couldn't even buy unless you were a military guy or a SWAT cop. That was really something to chew on. Maybe it was Sloan who had trashed their ATVs. Maybe he was sitting out there somewhere right now, with the scope on this station, waiting for somebody to step outside so he could pot them. Maybe he had killed Richardson and Warner and cut off their heads because he was certifiably bugfuck psycho killer. And where had he gotten something that would burn a hole through a man that you could shove your fist into? Maybe he was out there right now, tracking Mel and Danny, using the woman as bait? Hell, no, he didn't like any of this. That little voice he sometimes heard in his head said, Okay, Regal, here's the deal. Nobody comes on the radio in the next 24 hours. You wait until it is dark. Make some excuse, and you haul ass. Yeah, it's a long fucking walk back to civilization, but on your own, you'll be a lot. Harder to find, and survival is the name of the game, right? The boys will have to look out for themselves. Couldn't argue with that, could he? Climbing a tree turned out to be easier than she had thought. There was a big fir, not huge, but on the edge of a drop-off and leaning over the cliff at an angle. She was able to grab hold of it and kind of scoot her way up, using her arms and legs like an inchworm until she reached the lowest branches. The tree then took a kind of upward turn, so that it looked kind of like a big boomerang. Even if a bear could manage to get to the lowest branches, probably it couldn't climb past those. She hoped. Of course, the drop was a lot farther, hanging out over the cliff that way. Then again, a fall from 50 or 60 feet probably would kill her just as dead as a fall from 200 feet. Plus, she wasn't planning on falling. She managed to tie the hammock to two thick branches so that it was slung almost level. She was very careful when climbing into it, and even though it seemed secure and she didn't think she would roll out of it in her sleep, she took off her belt and threaded it through her pants loops and the hammock's mesh. In theory, even if she did fall out, at least she'd be hooked to the thing and wouldn't go far. Not the best of all possible beds, but the best she could do, given the circumstances. She was exhausted, but sleep wasn't in any hurry to claim her. It was dark, at least as dark as it got around here this time of year, but her mind was buzzing, along with the mosquitoes trying and failing to get past the bug spray. Never in her wildest imagination could she have come up with this kind of thing happening to her. A teacher from L.A. lost in the Alaskan wilderness, hiding in a tree, hoping to avoid bears, poachers, and some kind of creatures from another planet? No way. She turned it over and over in her thoughts, looking at it this way and that, but there wasn't any simple resolution to any of it. What was she going to do? She had food and water for a couple of days, but what then? How was Sloane going to find her? Maybe if the portable radio and GPS started. Working, she could call him, tell him where she was. But would the poachers overhear? How could she tell him where she was without telling them? Or maybe telling the off-world visitors? Panic kept welling in her, and she kept trying to keep it shoved down. Eventually, exhaustion won, and Mary drifted into a troubled sleep. Polly, little Polly, pulled the trigger. The gun bucked in his hands and he almost dropped it, but he held on, and when Daddy didn't stop, he pulled the trigger again and again and again. Mommy screamed and jumped up and he didn't mean to but he couldn't stop squeezing the gun's trigger, 
he just kept doing it until the gun that daddy kept in a drawer by the bed went click click click, over and over, and the floor was covered with blood, and mommy and daddy, mommy and daddy were. Sloan could have camped, but he wanted to get back to the station, so he kept moving. It did get dark enough to make him have to take it slower, but he knew the paths near the station as well as he knew the back of his own hands. He reached the station at about 2.30 a.m. by his watch. Normally, he would have just strolled on in. Surprise visitors here were. Rare, however, this wasn't a normal time. He had at least two factions about which he needed to worry the hunters from space and the poachers, and he had to assume that either or both could find the station. Obviously, poachers would normally avoid the place but since a couple of them had been slaughtered and beheaded, it wouldn't be normal times for them either. In their boots, he would have hit the trail south pretty damned quick. Hanging around in a place where a couple of co-workers got murdered wouldn't be smart, and it wasn't like they could call the police and report it without having to answer some questions they'd rather not answer. No, he was more worried about the predators than the humans, but he needed to be aware that both groups would have itchy trigger fingers. He stopped a hundred meters out, still in the trees, and carefully worked his way toward the clearing surrounding the station, covering the last few meters on his belly. The station had motion sensors and external lights, going with the idea that a critter wandering close in the brief dark might shy away if a light suddenly blinked on. The lights weren't that bright, they were battery-powered, recharged by solar panels, and there were only six of them, one on each corner and over the doors. They weren't on, so unless somebody had turned them off, nobody had walked around the place in the last five minutes, which was how long the motion sensors kept them burning. He was too far out to trip the sensors, they were good for maybe 30 meters. It was quiet. Mary might be sleeping, and only the kitchen light shined from within. Sloan lay there on the ground for 15 minutes, watching, listening. Nothing. He didn't move. Another 30 minutes passed. He saw a shadow pass in front of the kitchen window. Somebody was up. He waited. The bathroom light went on. Another shadow in the kitchen, 10 seconds later. For Mary to go to the toilet and then get to the kitchen in 10 seconds didn't seem likely. The bathroom light went off. At least two people inside. Maybe not people. Well. That complicated things. He worked his way along the edge of the clearing. Directly in front of the front door and 80 meters out, he saw something glittering on the dirt a few meters away. Carefully, he crawled to see what it was. A shell casing. .308 Winchester. Still shiny, so it hadn't been there long. He sniffed it. Yeah, fired recently. He slid back into the cover of the trees. Somebody had stood here and shot a rifle. At the station? At Mary? No way to tell. But unless the spacemen had taken to using local hardware not as good as their own, then that meant a poacher. Was Mary alive? There were at least two people in the station and Sloan would bet more than that. The poachers had come here, for some reason. Either Mary was dead, shot, or they had captured her. Unless, of course she had done what he'd told her, and run at the first sight of trouble, which was possible, but which he didn't think likely. She wasn't a woman of action, he knew that. The dawn was getting started, it would be full daylight soon. So. What was the situation here? There were several ways to find out, but the safest one for Mary, if she was still alive, was to wait and see what happened. They didn't know he was here, he had the ghillie suit, and he knew the ground. He could park himself here and see what daylight brought. Yes. That's what he would do, he would wait and see. He was good at waiting. He settled in, 
and once again, memory washed over him. The Marines had taught him how to be a sniper, but he had already learned how to hunt, from his father and his uncle. They had shown him the skills necessary to take game when he was twelve. It was all about motion and intent, Uncle Rick had said. Most animals don't see as well as people, and their eyes are drawn to movement. If you move into a stand of oak trees and sit down with your back against a tree and sit real still, after a while, the squirrels will forget you are there. As long as you don't twitch, you become part of the forest, like a big rock, and after an hour or two, the squirrels don't pay any attention to you. When you get ready to take a shot, you move the rifle in slow motion. Smooth, like the second hand on a clock, no sudden motions, and you line up. Take a deep breath, let half of it out, sight picture, and squeeze the trigger, never jerk it. Headshots are best on a squirrel, that way you don't ruin any of the meat. When the squirrel hits the ground, you go and collect it, put it in your game bag, and go sit back down. Another hour, the rest of the squirrels will go back to what they were doing before. Sloan hadn't believed that at first. You kill their brother and they don't remember that. Sounds weird, doesn't it? But it's true. They don't think like you and me, their brains don't make the connection. If you are willing to sit there all day, you can collect your limit. Uncle Rick had been right. The Marines had built on what Sloan already knew. Patience and stillness were a sniper's two best attributes. Yeah, you needed to know how to shoot and hit something, but without patience and stillness, you wouldn't get the chance to fire your weapon. Of course, the predators from space weren't like squirrels, and not apt to forget that he had killed their brother. Chapter 12 Mary woke up from the dream about Paul, covered in sweat, heart pounding. She hadn't had that dream in years before she had come here. She had put it all behind her, locked it into a box in her mind and never opened it. After a time, it had faded somewhat, seemed like an old movie she could barely remember. She hadn't been there when it had happened. The police had called, and she had rushed over to find Paul in shock, her parents dead. She knew what must have happened. When she had still lived at home, they had fought, but they hadn't been that bad. Some harsh language, mostly sound and fury, but ebbing and never getting physical. Just before she had left for college, his father had slapped her mother for the first time. That wasn't right, but her mother had gotten some warped sense of power from it, and then she would goad her father into violence, she became passive-aggressive, she would delight in going to the market to show off her bruises, to shame him. The fights had gotten worse. She was off at school, and little Polly had been left to deal with it. She had known. She hadn't known what to do, but she had known she needed to do something, only she never got around to it. She had been young, all she wanted was to enjoy her friends, finish school. When that was done, she told herself, she'd do something. But school ended, she got her first teaching job, and still, she couldn't quite bring herself to face her parents. She should have. It was the worst mistake of her life. Still tired and groggy and afraid to move in the hammock, she lay there, going over the dream and her memories. She'd done the best she could with Paul, gotten him into therapy after their parents had died. She'd heard the story, felt it stab her like an icy shard of jagged steel. Poor Paul. He would never get over it. And somehow, a miracle had happened. One afternoon as she and Paul drove to the psychiatrist's office, a year after it had happened, it just came out of the blue. Paul had looked at her. Where are we going, Mary? He'd asked. To Dr. Frankel's office. Who is Dr. Frankel? It had taken a few minutes before she was sure, and then a couple of visits on her own with Dr. Frankel to understand it. Paul had blocked it out. His mind had somehow built a barrier that kept the memory of what he had done from him. It had constructed a story, 
their parents had died in a car wreck on the harbor freeway. She had no idea where that had come from, and the doctor told her it was probably something he saw on TV or heard on the radio, maybe read in a newspaper. How could that be? The human mind is both durable and fragile, the doctor had told her. It will sometimes do astonishing things to protect itself. Will he ever remember it? The doctor had shrugged. Maybe someday. When he can handle it. Or maybe never. There's no way to tell. What should I do? Whatever you normally would do. He's walled it off, for him, it never happened, he can't remember it. Let it go. He's better off, and you will be, too. So she had. She pretended to herself that their parents had died in a car wreck on the freeway. After years of telling the story, she began to believe it. Paul grew up. He never once seemed to recall that night. She made sure he went to school, the life insurance had ensured that his college was paid for, thank God. She never felt like she'd been able to make up for what he'd lost, though, what they'd both lost. When he'd gotten into Santa Monica, planning to major in environmental studies, actually like a lot of kids in his generation, he had some sincere views about leaving a light footprint on the earth she'd been vastly relieved. Couldn't have messed up too bad, right? He'd made it to young adulthood without ending up in jail or on hard drugs. She was in her early thirties then but already felt too old, having spent a full decade of her young life raising a child. Most of her friends had gotten married, dating prospects were slim, she was busy with work. Paul had made his own choices, and it wasn't that they were necessarily bad, not all of them. He seemed normal, if a little scattered. He met an attractive, intellectual Earth Mother hippie girl in his freshman year, started hanging around with other like-minded folks. A couple of them hadn't been balanced too well. Mary still remembered debating tree spiking with one of his new pals over a vegan feast day contradiction in terms, in her opinion one memorable gathering at Paul's crumbling off-campus duplex. The kid had been a little too bloodthirsty for Mary's taste, but Paul hadn't seemed to notice, too busy smooching his crazy girlfriend of the month. His ideas got more liberal, his friends got weirder, and he dropped out halfway through his sophomore year to live in a tree for six weeks with two of his comrades in a national park in Oregon. It seemed that calling media attention to the preservation of spotted owl habitat was infinitely more important than getting an education. For Paul, it sincerely was. She disapproved, but she couldn't condemn him for his beliefs, however unconventional. He was the same little boy who'd cried when he'd learned where bacon came from. He joined some fringe activist groups, Animal Rights, Save the Trees. He was bright and charming, and managed to find work here and there, as a canvasser, fundraiser, like that. The money had been terrible, but he had seemed so happy, cheerfully reassuring her that he was doing the most important work in the world. Truth was, she hadn't worried so much, after a while. Work was demanding, she'd finally met a man, she was starting to worry about her biological clock winding down before she was ready to raise another child. She loved Paul. They were on good terms, and he was off discovering himself, anyway, so the weekly calls turned monthly and then occasional. He got into bears at some point a few years back, really into them, and sent her amazing photos he'd taken while hiking with friends in Alaska. Then videos he'd taken, hiking alone. She'd told him to be careful and then gone back to her life broken off an engagement, made it through another semester, joined a water aerobics class and then Paul was dead, and all she wanted was to understand how such a thing was possible. The last three months had been dreadful, waiting for school to finish so that she could come up here, find some way to understand. Instead, I got this, this, horror. Aliens and poachers and bears. In some ways, easier to handle than the amorphic guilt she'd been living with since Paul's death at least she knew who the villain was, and it wasn't her. 
it put things in a different perspective, too, actually having to worry about staying alive. Made life simpler. Her anxiety over her role in Paul's death, by negligence or selfishness, couldn't compete with trying to avoid being mauled or shot or raped. If she made it through this, she promised herself she'd try not to waste time worrying about things that no longer mattered, or that she couldn't change. She'd made mistakes, trying to parent her little brother. He was dead. Even if there was some connection between the two which she wasn't so sure of, anymore there was nothing she could do about it now. Mary closed her eyes, wishing she'd figured that out before she bought her plane ticket. Then she heard the men coming down the trail. She froze, suddenly wide awake at the sound. She strained to hear what they were saying. Fuck, she go. Shut up, you want, you. Ah, uh, shit, you don't. A moment later, soft laughter. It had a tone she didn't much care for. She moved her head very slowly, looking toward the vague trail she had found and followed. It was about as dark as it got, which made it easy to see the pair of flashlight beams, bobbing through the trees. Shit, oh, shit. If she could see them, they'd be able to see her. Why had she stayed so close to the path? Mary fumbled for the belt she had looped through the hammock's mesh, unhooking herself. Maybe, if she could swing around behind the trunk before they. A beam of light flashed over her. Mary winced, eyes closed tight. Don't see me, don't see me. Hey. Hey, I got her. A rough male voice announced, and then there were two beams in her face. There you are, baby. Another man said. His voice was no gentler, but lacked the horse edge. Ah, uh, why'd you run away, sweetheart? We just want to be friends. She'd kept the pack with her, had been using it as a pillow. There was a knife inside. If she'd been thinking, she would have pocketed it already. If she'd been thinking, she would have made an effort to disguise her tracks. If I was thinking, I would never have come up here at all. Maybe later if there was a later she could make a list of things to feel stupid about. For now, she was in trouble. The two men reached her tree and stopped, their lights playing up and down the leaning trunk. She couldn't see their faces, couldn't see much of anything as the lights repeatedly darted back up to her eyes, blinding her. You gonna come to Danny? The second man spoke. Or am I going to have to come and get you? Raspy voice cackled, the sound high and excited. You don't want to make Danny mad, sweet cheeks. He'll give you a spanking. Last bad little girl he had to spank didn't walk right for a week. That wasn't from the spanking, Danny said, and both men laughed. They were enjoying themselves, and Mary felt her misery lift just long enough to feel a barb of real hate for these men. Their intentions were painfully clear. Well. They might have found her, but she'd be damned if she was going to make it any easier for them. Guess you'll have to come get me, she heard herself saying. She wished she felt half as brave as she sounded. She heard a snick snick, familiar from movies and television. Sloane's big gun had made a similar noise, when he'd been putting it together. She'd known they'd be armed, of course, but the sound the confirmation still filled her with dread. Paul never remembered what he had done, but she knew what guns did. How about you come down, and I don't shoot you, Danny said. Hey, uh, Regal said to bring her back. He said don't kill her. Nothing about not shooting her. If it's the only way to get the cat out of the tree. Raspy voice laughed again. Pussy cat, right? Mary shifted around, reached for the pack under her head. Okay. I'm coming. Boo, wait for me, baby, Danny said, and his friend let out another horse cackle. Jesus. If she wasn't so terrified, she'd be embarrassed. She found the bag's flap, 
slipped her hand inside. The angle was all wrong, the knife was on the bottom somewhere. Get your hand out of the bag, Danny said. His voice had gone cold. Now. Mary's heart sank as she pulled her hand back. She probably couldn't have used it, anyway, they had guns. She meant to fight, if she could, but realistically, she was no Sloan. Get down here, Danny said. Leave the bag, Mel will get it. Fuck, man. It's hanging over a fucking cliff. You gonna bitch up on me? Help the lady down, then get the fucking bag. Sooner you get back, sooner you can help me light a fire under our new friend here. Mel grunted, stuck his flashlight in his chest pocket the beam partially illuminated a grinning, acne-scarred face and grabbed the tree trunk. Mary saw a triad of red marks appear on Mel's forehead, set in a triangle shape. Lights, like from a laser pointer. They were only there for an instant, gone again before she could blink. A rifle scope, maybe, whatever those things are. Sloan. The lights had to have come from behind Mary somewhere but there was only open space behind her. The ground sloped a little right under the tree, but it was still thirty, forty feet down at the highest point. Oblivious to the flicker of targeting, Mel started to inch out, and there was a strange, sudden sound from the woods below them, perhaps from behind them, a deep, guttural sound that rose in pitch, that sounded like the call of some giant insect or lizard, she didn't know what but it was too loud and entirely alien. It seemed to come from everywhere at once. The offworlders. The predators. Sloan wasn't crazy. Mel scooted back down the trunk, drew his own weapon, pointed the flashlight back to the trees and stiff brush they'd come through. The fuck is that? Fuck if I know. Bear. That's not a fucking bear, man, Mel said, and Mary slid her hand back into the bag, her heart pounding. Found the knife as the cry finally died off, echoing through the trees far below. She unsnapped the little piece of leather that held it in its sheath. Out of the tree, bitch, Danny said. We're leaving, right now dash. His voice was cut off by the sudden explosion of light and sound that ripped through the dark, that slammed into his chest. He screamed, threw his arms in the air as the weird fire ate into him through him knocking him back and down. Fuck. Mel started shooting, pointing his gun almost randomly. A bullet whizzed by Mary, shook the branch she was on, and she felt the hammock shifting beneath her. She rolled out as fast as she could, grabbing the low branch. She tried to stay on top but slipped beneath the thick branch, hanging over the drop. She hugged the wood tight, started pushing with her legs, pulling, working back to the trunk and Mel was still firing, each shot slightly softer than the last as her hearing was pounded into ringing submission. The triad of lights popped up on Mel's chest, this time, and there was another explosion. Mel's entire body was slammed against the tree trunk, hard enough that she was knocked loose, her legs losing their hold. She hung from the tree by her rapidly weakening arms, heard that guttural chittering again, an awful sound, and then something huge was moving up the steep slope beneath her, and she couldn't hold on any more. With the last of her strength she swung herself as far as she could toward the trail and let go. Sloane had made some preparations and then backed off a little, so that he was ninety meters from the station, but positioned so that he had a view of the front door and windows. He was prone, lined up, wearing his hearing protectors. A roll to his left put a big bold fir tree between him and the station, good cover. Cover and concealment were different. Cover would stop a bullet. Concealment might hide you, but wouldn't protect you if a shooter got lucky. Wasn't a rifle made that would punch through three feet of living fir tree, so unless these guys had rocket launchers, he'd be okay if they started shooting back. He hadn't seen any lights or movement for several hours, 
unless you counted the great gray owl that had flitted down silently to snag supper at around 3 a.m. It was big enough to kick the motion detector light on, and somehow, Sloan thought the owl had figured that out and used it to his advantage when the light went on, little foragers working the yard probably froze, and that gave the owl an advantage. Probably caught a mouse, might have been a shrew, maybe a vole. Now and again, Sloan had seen a snowy owl near the station, even though they were mostly tundra dwellers. That one was female, he could tell, because it was kind of mottled the males were almost entirely white. He had gone over his reasoning enough times so that he was comfortable with it and what he needed to do. There were people in his station that he didn't know. How many, he couldn't tell, but he was sure they were the poachers. Why were they here? Maybe being hunted by the space creatures didn't set too well. Maybe their radio didn't work any better than his. Whatever. If the poachers were in the station, then there were three things Sloan figured had happened. Either they had killed Mary, which made them murderers, or they had caught her, which made them kidnappers. Maybe worse, if they had assaulted her. Or maybe Mary had somehow managed to escape. Of the three, he considered that last the most unlikely. She was a civilian. There was a way to find out, assuming the guy running the poacher team had any tactical sense. When the station had been built, somebody had decided there needed to be a concrete pad out front. To the left of the front door and 15 meters away, this was a thick square 3 meters on a side. Sloan had no idea why it was there. Maybe somebody had planned to build a storage shed and they poured the cement for a floor and never got around to the rest of it. There were a few other outbuildings, storage sheds, but none of them had anything but dirt floors. Nobody seemed to know about the concrete pad, they just shrugged when he had asked. On the pad, Sloan had set up a tripod, made of a shovel, a steel rake, and a garden hoe, with the metal parts at the top. To the end of the shovel handle, he had tied a fishing line, 30-pound test, and rolled out the spool. He had plenty of length, the spool held 300 yards. The line was thin, strong, and all it would take would be a tug, and the tripod of garden tools would collapse. When they hit the concrete, they would make enough noise that anybody in the house should hear it. Up here, you heard a clanging, you assumed it was a bear trying to get into a garbage can or the like, so you didn't jerk the door open and go charging out to see. You looked first. There was a small table under the window to the right of the door from his position. Made it awkward to look out that window unless you were sitting at the table. The window to the left was clear of impediment, all you had to do was move the curtain aside. The drape was heavy and the glass double-paned, both for insulation. The door was three-inch thick oak, but even so, the Chaytax round would punch through it. The walls were logs and backed with panel and insulation, so they'd stop around. If somebody cracked the door to peek out, he could nail them. If they opened the curtain, the glass wouldn't slow the round down enough to matter. He took a few deep breaths, steadied his respiration and slowed his heartbeat. This close, he had dialed the scope down to minimum magnification, so he could see the door and windows. He pulled the fishing line. The tripod fell. He saw them hit, heard the noise a hair later. Two seconds. Three. The curtain moved aside. The hard part was already done deciding if he was going to shoot or not. Sloan lined the crosshairs up on a man's face. He stroked the trigger. Regal saw Gibson pinwheel away from the window, heard the breaking glass and the boom of a big caliber rifle saw the curtains billow. Fuck, he screamed. Martin yelled, Billy. Regal realized Martin meant Gibson, whose real name he had never heard. Martin scrabbled on his hands and knees to where Gibson lay sprawled, and there was no doubt he was dead his head had popped like a firecracker. Billy. Ah, uh, shit, Billy. The Ranger. 
Another shot blew through the shattered window, punched through the curtains, and smashed into something behind him. Fuck. Regal said. Sloane, he screamed. We have your woman. There was a pause. Then the return yell. Show her. We will kill her. And then I'll kill you, came the yell. Show her. Billy. Martin. Martin. Focus. He's dead. I'm going to kill the motherfucker. Yeah, I'm all for that, but he's out there hidden with his sniper rifle and if you stick your head out he will smoke you. We gotta go. Now. Out the back. Billy Dash. He's gone, man, and if you don't want to join him, we have to leave. Now. Sloan, behind the scope, watched. If they had Mary, and they had any sense, they would show her. She was their ace in the hole. If he didn't see her, he had to assume they'd killed her or she'd gotten away. That would be bad, but it would make things easier. He could spike them and not have to be careful. A couple of minutes passed, nothing. Sloan started working his way to his right, through the trees, staying low. When he got around back, he saw that the door was open. He nodded to himself. They could still be inside, waiting to spring a trap, but the place felt empty. He put the rifle down, turned the gain up on the wolf ears, and pulled his revolver. He waited another two minutes, then started to creep in. He crawled along the back side of the station, and had a bad moment when he went through the door, but there wasn't anybody inside, save the man he'd shot, who was as dead as they came. No sign of Mary. They could have killed her and hauled her body out into the woods, but a search of the place didn't reveal any signs of a struggle or blood, other than that of the dead poacher. He holstered the BMF revolver. Closed and locked his gun cabinet. Did a more thorough search. The emergency pack was gone. All that meant for sure was that somebody had taken it. Could have been one of the poachers. There were at least a few more of them, he figured, judging from the empty beer bottles and coffee cups and plates that were dirty. Two. Three. He'd have to check the tracks to be sure. Then again, the poachers would have their own gear, so maybe Mary had grabbed the pack on the way out the door. He felt a small rush of hope, but he didn't let it get far. He didn't want to get too attached to that idea, likely, she was dead, but there was a chance she was still alive, out there on her own. Not the best thing, given the situation. She wasn't mentally geared to deal with Alaska, the bears, the poachers, the things from another world. But alive was better than dead, and while she was unprepared, she wasn't stupid. There was a chance. He'd scout around, see if he could find a trail. If she was on her own, he could track her. If he couldn't find any signs she'd left, he would be able to see the poacher's trail. Either way, he was going to go looking. If he could track Mary, he'd go after her. If he couldn't find any signs of her, he'd follow the poachers. All the while keeping a lookout for the murdering space monsters. Sloane had seen some pretty weird things in his time. Saw a Buddhist priest sit down in Saigon, slosh gasoline all over himself, and then light a match. The man must have had discipline of tempered steel, because he sat there and burned like a candle and never screamed nor moved. He was in an outdoor latrine building near the coast, outside Da Nang, and about to leave when he looked out the door and saw a six-year-old girl walk toward a trio of marines. The little girl was carrying a basket, and if Sloane hadn't stepped on something that made him slip and allow the latrine's door to swing shut as he fell on his ass, the grenade the little girl set off in her basket would probably have gotten him along with the other three. The shrapnel punched holes in the thin fiberboard walls, but the door was heavy enough to stop it. The strangest thing that had ever happened to him was also in Nam. 
He had come out of a makeshift bar on the outskirts of Saigon one hot and rainy afternoon. Leaning against a tree maybe five meters away was Riley, a spotter for one of the other snipers. Riley was short, almost as wide as he was tall, perpetually red-faced and sunburned, with a blonde crew cut. He always wore a green baseball cap, with the bill turned around to keep the sun off the back of his neck. Nobody else in the area looked like him. Sloan had waved, Riley had nodded and given him a thumbs-up sign. Sloan had gone on about his business. A couple hours later, he drifted into the operations room to check out the intel, and the staff sergeant was talking to one of the lieutenants. Sloan caught a reference to Riley. He moved over, and heard the sarge telling the loot that Riley had gotten killed. Tripped a wire, caught a bouncing Betty right in the face. Jesus, Sloan had said. When did that happen? He was about to go on about how he had seen Riley only a couple hours ago. Yesterday afternoon, the Sarge said. That had rocked Sloan. If Riley had been killed by an antipersonnel mine yesterday, then seeing him outside the bar not two hours earlier. Well, that was passing impossible. Not on two beers. Had to have been somebody else. Somebody who looked to be an exact twin to Sloan A guy who depended on what he saw to keep his own. As safe, and who was a pretty good observer. Wearing the same cap in the same manner. It was Riley, Sloan would have sworn that on a stack of Bibles. But men from Mars with death rays. That beat all. Chapter 13 Fuck, fuck, fuck. Regal and Marlin ran through the murky morning light, Regal leading, roughly following the broken trail that Mel and Danny had torn through the woods, looking for the girl. Martin cursed, gasping as he stumbled along, carrying his own and Gibson's gear. Fucker, you fucker. Shut up, Regal said, watching the woods, the .44 mag in hand. He had his Winchester and his own gear and a lot to worry about. The ranger was crazy, he'd gone bugfuck out here in the wild, but he wanted the woman. Mel and Danny surely had her, she'd left an obvious track through the woods, and they'd left their own wake of prints and snapped undergrowth right behind her. A blind man could follow it, the ranger wasn't going to have a problem. If Regal could get to a good spot far enough in advance, their troubles were over. If they ran into Mel and Danny first, all the better. Always a good idea to have the numbers, and if the ranger was as psychotic as he was starting to think, the woman might be worth more than gold. Chopping up bears. Chopping up Warner and Richardson. The fucking arsenal he had, that Chaytak, surely what he'd used to cook Gibson. Some veteran survivalist type out here, seeing Charlie behind every tree, who the fuck knew? He was hunting them. Maybe he trashed their ATVs to keep them around, so he could relive his days in country. Who could tell what someone like that would do? But if the woman was important to him, they had leverage. Better not to need that, though. Better to take Sloan out as soon as he found a good spot. Don't give the sucker a chance to get too close. Bullets worked faster than words. He kept up the pace, slowing only occasionally to scan the trail behind them. He didn't expect to see anything, not yet. The ranger would check out. The station first, carefully, and unless he had a death wish, he wouldn't come barreling right after them. Regal would have time to set something up, he just wanted to get a little more distance. The Winchester was an excellent rifle for what he had in mind. It was no Chaytak, but he could pot a bear from a thousand meters, given the right conditions. And the scope he had was good enough. Wasn't like they were having a match at Camp Perry. Out here, first to shoot was the winner. If you didn't miss. Find a high spot off the trail and wait. Maybe have Martin go ahead, make some noise. He'd made a mistake. He'd never figured the ranger would fire on the station. 
He hadn't realized he was dealing with a crazy fuck. Regal scanned his options with an expert eye, the murky daylight picking up little by little. He wouldn't underestimate him again. Second time you screwed up against a guy with a gun could be the last time. Sloan studied the tracks, pieced together the story. It was a simple one, the trails weren't right on top of one another, but were close. Mary's light tread was mostly buried under the prints of four big men, the last two sets recent, like minutes recent, summer-dried grasses were settling back into position, kicked up needles still damp. Mary had run when the poachers got to the station. Two of them had gone after her. The last two had just left. He started moving, careful but not too worried about stealth, yet. If he were one of the poachers, he'd try to get some distance before setting anything up. At least one of them was probably carrying a bolt-action .308 Winchester, a good rifle. The newer models had gone back to the controlled feed system from an earlier design, with a Mauser-style claw extractor. Bolt-action rifles had fewer moving parts than semi-autos, making them a more reliable choice for sniping. He was sure they had good optics, too, bear killers didn't necessarily like to get too close to their targets. He expected they'd try to take him out further along, set up something on higher ground. The trail was headed roughly southeast. Assuming it continued, he already had a few ideas about where to look. The offworlders, they were a different kind of trouble. He was going to have to hope they didn't cross paths soon not until he'd found Mary. Maybe keep his fingers crossed that the poachers met up with them first. That might not be best for Mary, though. He wasn't going to project. Some code of honor on them, because they killed bears hand to hand and shot people carrying weapons, they were aliens, for all he knew, they ate women. The trail was too easy, giving him time to think about the woman. He didn't know her, but liked what he'd seen, and she'd been smart enough to run after all, he could see that her pursuers had lost and picked up her trail a couple of times. He was glad for that. But the two who'd followed her had been close behind, and he couldn't see how a poacher might be above rape and murder. He hoped that wasn't the case. Either way, they were dead men if he got them on his scope. A half mile from the station, he started to look for a good tree. Regal had found the perfect spot. It looked like the girl had happened upon an old animal trail deer, probably, moose tended to stay down near the wetlands that crept along a rise in the terrain, and had followed it. Danny and Mel had been right on top of her, probably literally, by now, and he wondered why they hadn't just followed their own path back to the station once they were finished. Unless. No, not unless. They were already a couple miles from the station. The ranger, Sloan, had likely been set up for a while before he'd potted Gibson. If he'd actually used the woman to draw a couple of them out, he could have cooked them much closer to home, saved himself a run. Still, Regal couldn't help thinking about how he had butchered Warner and Richardson. Man who'd do that might be able to do a lot worse without needing to take a breather. Didn't matter anymore. He'd found a high piece of ground, a swell in the woods topped by a handful of poplars, nice thick concealment beneath. The trees were sparse enough here to line up a good shot, and from his prone position nestled in the scraggly bushes he could see several hundred meters of trail. He'd sent Martin on ahead, to find the other two three, assuming they had Sloane's girlfriend Anne to keep the ranger moving. He had the rifle resting on a chunk of rock sticking up from the ground, the crosshairs set on a stretch of trail about 400 meters. Out. He'd never had any formal training, but back when he'd been on a crew, he'd teamed with a guy who'd washed out of the USMC Scout Sniper School. He'd talked a lot about the program range estimating, studying windage and barometric pressure, like that but what had really caught Regal's interest had been Dewey's stories about the final stock. One of the last assignments the one old Dewey had failed one time too many was having to sneak up on two instructors in an open, grassy field without being seen. 
The snipers wore these suits, ghillie suits, made out of camo and mesh, stuck full of the local flora, Dewey swore up and down that with a good suit, you could hide at a backyard barbecue all day long and not be seen. To make the stock harder, there were two walkers, in the field, soldiers with radios, working with the instructors. The game was to get from a thousand meters out to within 150 of the instructors without being spotted by anyone. The sniper then had to sight in on the instructors, take a shot still without letting himself be seen and move to a second position, to take another shot. It was a pass-fail test. If anyone saw you at any point, you failed. Fail too many times, you were out. Dewey had been quick to point out that in the real world, even a shitty sniper would never have to get anywhere near that close to a target, but had also willingly admitted that he just hadn't had the patience. Being a sniper was all about patience, he said. That, and practice, getting rounds down range, running little observation tests all the time, always looking, filing away details. Recon was mostly what they trained for, and it was a skill that needed to be upkept, a kind of constant mental discipline. Dewey said that the really top guys just thought different about things, after a while. Noticed things that nobody else even saw. Regal didn't think he'd have washed out, if he'd been so inclined as to sign his ass over to the government. He was goddamn good with his Winchester, good enough to be leading his own crew, and when he needed to, he could hold extremely fucking still. He'd once waited outside a den for four hours to get a shot. He could have thrown some fireworks at it, scared it out, but he liked knowing that he could wait, if need be. Course, this Sloan had a Chaytac. The Winchester was a solid weapon, but the Chaytac was in a class of its own. If he'd really been a military sniper and he was carrying that kind of hardware around. He had some time to think about it, as the minutes ticked by, morning shifting to mid-morning, the day heating up. He had been counting on the ranger tracking them out, but maybe he'd been too hasty in his thinking. Rifle like that, Sloan could zap someone from a mile away, maybe more. Wasn't going to happen like that out here in the woods, but he could sure as hell set up a better shot than Regal. I've got the higher ground, though. Did he? He'd been watching the same piece of trail for almost an hour, a few times widening out, thinking Sloan might try to come in at an angle. Now he gently shifted the Winchester, rotating back, scoping the terrain that sloped back toward the ranger station. There were some isolated trees that rose up over the general line, most of them a mile back, easy. There was a thrashing in the brush, coming from behind him. Regal rolled on his side, pulling the desert eagle out of its holster. Boss. Boss. Martin. Regal's jaw clenched. He had to resist an urge to just shoot the dumb bastard. Boss. More thrashing. Here, Regal snapped. What, for fuck's sake? Martin stumbled through the brush, dropped to a crouch in front of. Him. Mel and Danny, Martin panted, and the look on his pale, dirty face told him the rest of it. The man who wanted him dead chose exactly the spot Sloan would have selected. Sloan watched them split, watched the guy who fancied himself a sniper get set up the boss of this particular crew, if he read the body language right. The other one, a pale guy built like a dump truck and carrying too much gear, kept moving. And there was the Winchester, just like he'd guessed. Sloan tracked along after the pale one until he disappeared around a piece of ridge, then turned his attention back to Boss Winchester. The poacher had some coverage, thick brush under a poplar stand. He'd set up to watch the trail. Sloan studied him through the Chaytac scope, shifting slightly against the layers of small branches he leaned against, forty feet up a dug. Fur. Fi sat in a simple harness looped around the trunk, uncomfortable but effective. The ambush was about what he'd expected. His initial plan had been to pot them quick, pick up Mary's track again, 
and deal with the other two when he got to them. But he'd started thinking, watching the poacher settle himself into position. Two men had gone after Mary, their tracks barely fresher than hers, which meant they'd have gotten to her by now. If they'd killed her, why hadn't they come back? That was assuming they meant to get back to the station, which maybe he shouldn't assume but why take the station in the first place, if they didn't want to camp? Just to kill him. He'd made some enemies in his time, but none that would have gone to this much trouble. Since the river ran in tight further east, the woods up here dropping an abrupt couple hundred feet to meet it, they weren't going to be circling back from that direction. And terrain-wise, coming in any other way was a major hike made the most sense to follow their own tracks back. So where are you? He had to consider that they might have run across their first and last contact. Part of their crew had already been taken out by the alien hunters. Had they had Mary with them? No way to know. It was all guessing, too many unknowns. He needed to get back on the tracks, run them down. Shoot the wannabe and move on. On the other hand, if they'd decided to stash Mary someplace, he might be cutting off his best chance at finding her. He could wait the ambush out, then follow the guy to his next appointment. Fuck it. The fewer poachers running around, the better. He'd use the tracks. Sloan checked the dial on the BDC, then watched with some small amusement as Boss Winchester finally wised up turn his scope closer to Sloane's position. Slightly smarter than the average bear, then. Bye-bye, boss, Sloane thought, evening his breathing. Then he saw the lackey crashing back down the trail. Hard to miss him. He wore camo and had a dirty face, but the skin beneath was as white as a full moon. Moonface plowed right up to boss Winchester, started waving and pointing. He opened one of the packs he was carrying and pulled out. Sloane's own dirty, crumpled emergency bag, the one he'd left for Mary. Boss man hesitated, then quickly packed up. The hunters had claimed more trophies, that was his guess, and Mary had been there at some point, the lackey had found her bag. Had he found Mary, too? Sloane doubted it. Wouldn't have needed to bring the bag back as proof of anything, would he? Maybe letting them run around a bit longer wasn't such a bad idea, if the offworlders were stalking them. Staying on their trail might give him an opening. Always better to not be the bait, if there was an alternative. He eased back in his sling, let the fur's branches settle back in place. His body ached, his eyes grainy from lack of sleep, but he was game. He started to unhook himself. Not in my backyard, motherfuckers. Chapter 14 Mary drank from the icy river, hoping to hell she didn't end up with a parasite, then limped back toward the shoreline trees where she'd spent the last few hours, huddled and dazed. Everything had been a little blurry for a while, right after she'd fallen. She remembered Mel, shooting into the trees after Danny hit the dirt, and she remembered being knocked off the trunk she was hugging for dear life and then she'd scraped and rolled her way down a steep slope, her body battered but also saved from serious injury by the handful of saplings growing out of the cliff wall. She'd slammed into at least three, but the third had knocked the wind out of her, made her go lightheaded, and on the next impact, she'd blacked out a little. Woken up pretty quickly, though, when she'd hit the bottom of the hill. Along the way, she'd twisted her right ankle and bruised her shoulder. She'd laid there in a panting daze, listening to the strange and terrible sounds overhead. There were more of those thick, loud, cackling sounds, endless rustling, several heavy thunk noises, like metal hitting earth. Her vague, dizzy plan was to stay still and quiet, she wanted to run but she knew her ankle was hurt, still felt shocks of pain tickling through her entire body, radiating from the sprain. She pulled herself closer to the hillside, wincing, found a slight overhang to press beneath, and then the bodies had fallen, landing a few feet away from her. 
spatters of still warm blood flicked across her crouched form. The headless bodies of her attackers, ripped and torn, thrown down from above, and she couldn't help it, she let out a cry. She heard what sounded like laughter, loud and terrible, as she stumbled into the woods, dragging her leg, falling any number of times before she was far enough away not to hear it anymore, her back itching where she expected to feel the fire hit. For whatever reason, it or they didn't kill her. She'd stumbled as far as she could, then found some trees to sit by near a branch of the river. She'd even dozed a little, and when she'd finally waked, her head had cleared a little. Maybe it was like Sloane said, they were hunting trophies, and a limping, unarmed woman hadn't been enough to bother with. If that were the case, she was glad she'd lost her grip on the knife when she'd fallen. Not so great about the rest of the pack, though. Food. Water. Life. She didn't know if Sloane was still alive, or was in any shape to come looking for her. It was still four, five days until the plane was supposed to come back, and there was no guarantee that anyone would start searching for her, right away. She could keep drinking river water she didn't see how she had a choice but she didn't know enough about the local plants to risk eating anything other than berries. She thought pine needles were edible, though that didn't sound good, and Paul had mentioned that wild blueberries grew in the summer, although she hadn't seen any. There were probably fish, too. But while she'd very much enjoyed watching all those Discovery Channel shows about surviving in the middle of nowhere, it didn't seem that much had stuck. She had no idea how to catch a fish. With or without a pole, for that matter. Those survivalists always ate bugs, too, and while she was willing to try it, she doubted very much that she'd be able to keep them down. Assuming she could even find a nest, or hill, or whatever. She stared unhappily at her right foot. It had already swelled enough inside her thick boot that she could see it pressing against the leather. She didn't think it was too bad, she could still shuffle limp along with her boot laced tight, but walking around a bunch wasn't going to help matters. Injured, lost, no food. No bug spray or sunscreen. Not even a goddamn roll of toilet paper. She had to smile a little, at that. As if having toilet paper would be very helpful at this juncture. Looks like she starved to death before the bears got to her, but her panties were nice and clean. All she knew was that she didn't want to die out here, in the same wilderness that had claimed Paul. Sloane had been overly blunt but not wrong about her brother, he hadn't had the skills to survive out here, at least when it came to the wildlife. As much as she'd loved him, she'd known, too, that Paul was fond of disregarding information that didn't fit into his happy, dreamy bubble of idealism. He'd been a sweet boy and a gentleman, and he hadn't deserved to die but he'd come here willingly, even if he hadn't fully understood the risk. Sloane had been right. If Paul had done his research. If she'd had even an inkling that she'd be running up against rapist poachers and man-killing visitors from another planet on her trip to Alaska, she would have paid better attention to those discovery shows. If you're lost in the woods. She said, sighing. All contradictions, considering the circumstances. Don't move around too much, so rescuers could find you, but disguise your tracks if there were bad men running around. Stay in plain sight, make noise if you hear someone coming, or hide, for safety's sake, find a hole and disappear into it. The two men who'd followed her were dead, but there had been more of them at the cabin. And just because the predatory aliens hadn't killed her yet didn't meant they wouldn't. She didn't know what to do, so she sat, hoping that something would occur to her. She listened to the water just out of sight. She watched a mosquito light on her leg and slapped at it, wondering if Sloane was still alive, if he would come for her. A small, determined part of her automatically rebelled against the idea, firmly reminding her that she was a bright, capable woman, able to take care of herself but it got shouted down pretty quickly by the rest. 
It wasn't a male-female issue, or smart-dumb, it was prepared and unprepared. I need to go back, try to find the backpack, she thought, already hating the idea. It was at least an hour's walk, she thought, not even sure how far she'd run in the dark, and every step would hurt. Seeing those bodies again, too, all ripped up, the memory of that harsh laughter echoing down. Do something. Do anything. She hauled herself to her feet. Better to die trying. Chapter 15 They didn't bother hiking down to look at the dead men. Regal didn't need to get any closer to see that Mel and Danny had met the same fate as Richardson and Warner. Burned chest hole, no head, it wasn't too hard to miss, even from a couple hundred feet up. Their bodies had been tossed over the cliff's edge, directly below a tree with a ripped hammock hanging from it. Martin said he'd found the pack caught in the mesh, the woman's boot prints led right to it, Sloan had used the woman, after all. Lured them out. God only knew what he was using to make those burns. Had to be some government test shit, from whoever had hooked him up with the Shaytak. He'd killed and mutilated them, then circled back to the station to take out Gibson. He was a fucking maniac, he's wearing those Bigfoot shoes again, Martin said, pointing at the fake tracks, several set into the tacky, bloody ground, along with the woman's. The same that had been around his first two guys, why bother? They already knew it was Sloan. Maybe he was some. Norman Bates type, needed to dress up to do his killing. Like to pretend, thought he really was Bigfoot. Regal held onto the trunk, leaned over the edge of the drop. Danny had fallen with his weapon, Mel's was still next to the tree, at least one of them got his gun working, this time. There were a bunch of spent shells on the ground, from Mel's sidearm, but scattered, like he'd been shooting blind, turning in a circle. Firing at everything, I can't believe this, Martin said. He sniffled. His nose and eyes red from mourning his lost Billy. He's going to kill all of us. What are we gonna do? Regal ignored him, turned, scanned the surrounding trees. He could have followed them out, or even circled around, gotten in front of them somehow. It explained why the girl had left such an obvious track. Sloan was playing them. Maybe watching them now. Regal had had about enough of this horse shit, and it was going to end now. The old ranger had taken out their only means of escape, he'd effectively destroyed their livelihood killed five of his guys, and now he was fucking terrorizing them, a madman, no doubt about it, we go back to the station, real careful, Regal said, different route, if he's there, we pop him, if not, we clear out his gun locker, hook ourselves up with some of his fancy shit equipment and then go hunting, bag us a ranger, yeah, yeah, I'm all over that, fucker killed Billy, he looked like he was about to start crying again, and Regal turned away, Wishing he'd sent Martin to check the window instead of Gibson. Well. At least Martin was good with a rifle. Not great, but at this point, he'd take whatever was available. Gonna get you, Ranger. If it's the last goddamn thing I do. Sloan tracked the men's prints to the site of another slaughter. Two more poachers, presumably, beheaded and dumped. Boss Winchester and Moonface had kept moving, and so did Sloan, much as he wanted to stop. The torn hammock in the tree was his. The belt tied through the mesh Marys, and he didn't see her tracks heading out, she fell. Or jumped, maybe. Sloan paused long enough to aim his scope at the ground below. Near the two headless corpses, he saw her track leading away from the steep cliff wall, disappearing into a willow thicket. She'd been limping, badly, the prince space long stride, short, a drag to the right boot. He also saw where she'd gone down, and why the fall hadn't killed her. She'd hit the slope near the top probably knocked off the tree by the firefight, such that it was. She'd crashed through any number of saplings and scrub trees sprouting out of the side of the hill, he could see the broken branches, a scrap of khaki on a snapped root near the bottom, it complicated matters that she was still alive, but he was glad to see it. There was an easier way down a half mile or so further along, once he made sure the poachers weren't circling back on him, he'd go down and find her. There were three sets of prints leading away from the blood-soaked ground, the two just made by the visiting poachers and one of the alien hunters, from whenever it had gone down. In the dark, or shortly thereafter, Sloan figured. Only one of the men had fired, shells from a pistol spread out on the ground. If the predator alien had taken a hit, no way to tell, Sloan doubted it. The poachers had been tracked to Mary and Byrne before they knew what hit them. Mary had fallen but walked away, Sloan moved on. The entire stop had taken all of 30 seconds, but it was too long, considering, he wouldn't feel safe until he saw the last half-worlder down, the last poacher locked up or dead. 
For now, he wanted to see where the bossman and his pale friend had headed, then get down to the river. Sloan shook his head to clear it as he crept back into the woods, hoping he'd be able to catch a few hours sleep before the next meeting with whoever, whatever it turned out to be. He was feeling the lack, and if he wanted to be at the top of his game, he'd need to rest. You were at the top of your game about three, four decades ago, old man, couldn't argue with that, but all he could do was keep moving, keep doing the best he could with what he had. That was one of the big lessons he'd learned in his war, long ago and far away. That you did the best you could with what you had, and that nothing else mattered worth a damn. You might be tired, hungry, and lost. You might be sure you were going to get killed, or captured. You might be surrounded by the enemy and any step you took was going to put you at risk. Didn't matter. You sucked it up and you kept going, one foot in front of the other. Either you'd come out of it or you wouldn't. Sloan had spent a lot of time in those places, not knowing if the next breath he drew would be his last. But he'd kept going, and he'd outwalked the war. Better men than him had gotten tagged, their bones sunk into some swamp, dog tags buried in two feet of mud, but here he still was almost forty years later. He didn't much believe in a hands-on god who was concerned with the fall of every little sparrow, but it made a man wonder. Maybe there was some purpose. Maybe he had been meant to survive all that old shit just so he could be here in this moment, to deal with this new shit. He shrugged the thought away. It didn't really matter why. What mattered now was how. Chapter 16 Mary was beyond scared, she was teetering on the edge of pure terror. What had happened with the poachers and the alien hunters, the fall from the tree that had been terrible, but it had all happened so fast, she hadn't really had time to think. Now, though, lost in the woods again, she had nothing but time. After nearly two hours of painful walking, seeing nothing that looked familiar, she admitted the truth to herself. I'm lost, she said, and realized she was going to cry. There was a fallen tree a few yards away, layered in crumbling lichen, and she sat on it. She took a shaky breath, her eyes filling. Shit, shit, shit. She was tired and hungry and her ankle hurt, but worst of all, she was scared. Twice, she'd heard things moving through the trees, crashing sounds, and had ducked into patches of dry, scratchy undergrowth, her heart pounding, waiting for the sounds to die away. Bears, maybe, she didn't know, didn't want to know. I want to go home, she thought, and let the tears come. In a minute, she knew, she'd get herself back up, start moving again. For now, she wanted, she needed to wish for her regular, normal, boring life. Her nice pink stucco apartment, her two cats, her morning skim latte. Working on new lesson plans for fall. She'd left it all behind to come see where Paul had died, to try and make sense of it, somehow, and now she was here, and nothing made sense. Nothing. It was all just crazy. She hadn't been able to find her way back to the place she'd fallen, and now she wasn't even sure where the river was. She remembered reading somewhere that if you were lost in the mountains, to follow a river, they always led to civilization, and now she'd lost the chance to try that, too. Not that there was any civilization up here for a hundred miles. She sniffled, wiped at her cheeks with grimy hands. What would Sloane think of her, if he could see her now? He struck her as a man who would abhor weakness. Or maybe it was just that he couldn't accept it within himself. After meeting the poachers and witnessing the actions of at least one of the hunter aliens, she couldn't really condemn his kill-or-be-killed attitude. And if he was here now, instead of her, he'd be making fire and finding food. Not sitting on a log, crying. He was a lonely man, maybe, but not a victim. He was a survivor. At least I tried. When the poachers had come, again when the alien or aliens had attacked, she'd reached for that knife in Sloane's pack. It had been instinct, one she didn't know she had. I tried, she said aloud, and took a deep breath. It was something to be proud of, she thought. Maybe she hadn't done all that great, but she hadn't frozen, either. At least I tried. Tried what? Mary jumped up, her ankle hurt like hell, but she didn't care. 
There was Sloane, stepping out of the trees, his big rifle in hand, and she had never been so happy to see anyone, ever. Mary had gotten lost after her fall, had wandered through the woods without marking her trail, without following any path that Sloane could see. A couple of times she'd crossed her own tracks. He found some fresh black bear scat while he was tracking, explaining the two times Mary had hidden, crawling into thatches of dead juniper and broom. Sloane followed along, thinking about what they would do once he found her. Going back to the station was an option, but from the state of her tracks, Mary was going to need to put her foot up somewhere soon. Just as well, since he couldn't take her with him on a stalk. There were a couple places they could go where he'd left caches the firewatch tower and the cave system off to the west but those were too easy to find. The cave system was over the big ridge, too, but a tough hike. The den, he decided. Not ideal it was stocked for one, and was a little tight to the area he'd be walking but it was close and well hidden. He heard her before he caught the first flashes of her form through gaps in the trees crunching through the woods ahead of him, making enough noise to scare away a near constant flow of small wildlife. He slipped up on her, reflexively masking his own sounds of movement with hers. She sat on a fallen trunk, her back to him, her shoulders down. He moved in closer, heard her breathing raggedly. He circled into her line of sight before moving out of the trees, surprising her was inevitable, but he didn't want her to scream and heard her speak, her voice low and firm. Tried what? he asked, stepping out. She stood, her expression shifting in a way that was a little amazing. Her smile was wide and relieved. To be you, she said. She took a few steps toward him, limping badly. You're not going to believe all that's happened to me. Let's see, the poachers attacked, you ran, two of them followed you. Then you fell off a cliff when the alien killed them. Hurt your right leg, too. You. I don't dash, she exhaled heavily, suddenly looking as tired as he felt, but she was smiling, too. No one likes a smart-ass hero, Sloane. He smiled back at her. Point taken. How bad's the ankle, he asked, his expression back to its normal, unreadable state. Not too bad. I mean, it hurts, but I've got my boot on pretty tight, that helps. What happened? I tried to use the radio but it still wasn't working. Are you okay? She smiled again. Listen to me you're not lost, are you? Not yet today he said easily. You good to walk. I've got a place in mind, about an hour from here. Are there more poachers at the station? Doubt it, Sloane said. He dropped his pack as he spoke, rummaged out a canteen, passed it to her. If they're smart, they're running by now, south and out. Can't be sure, though. And there are still three more of those hunters out there, at least. They might cycle past the station to check and see if we go back there. We don't want to make things too easy. His calm competence was such a relief, she couldn't help feeling a kind of natural attraction to him, literally, as she handed the water back. She wanted to be closer to him. There were bad things in the woods, and while he was stubbornly, annoyingly male in his approach to dealing with the problem, she couldn't deny his consistent logic or the security she felt in his presence. Or the fact that he came for you, when you were lost. Yeah, there was that, too. Nothing like a good rescue to break the ice. I'm good to walk, she said. Okay. We're going to a den upriver, north. Keep close and quiet. If I stop, you stop. I crouch, you crouch. I'm going to walk us through some rough spots, try to make it harder for anyone coming after us. Let me know if you need to take a break, but try to keep on. Sooner we get there, sooner we can rest. If your ankle goes out, I'll carry you piggyback. Okay? Yes. He nodded once, 
turned, and started walking. A little stunned by the sudden change from alone and scared and having no plan to even knowing which way north was Mary followed, trying not to make too much noise. She had been glad to see him, thrilled, and now she could relax. Sloane knew what he was doing. This was his forest, he knew it, and he was armed and had a plan. She felt as if she were Atlas and had just shrugged the weight of the world off her shoulders. Chapter 17 Shit, he locked the gun case. Regal stared at Martin as if he'd just turned into a big lizard. So break it open, asshole. He's not exactly wired into an alarm company, now is he? Martin nodded. Yeah, yeah, right, sorry. They already knew where the tools were kept. A hammer and a big screwdriver were enough to do the job. Regal took the stoner. Yeah, it wasn't in the same class with the Chaytac, but it was a good sniper rifle, and it was one he knew how to use, he'd cut his teeth on an AR-15. Twenty rounds of .308, enough punch to stop a bear, enough ammo to lay down a hail of fire. Had a Leupold 3-9x40mm scope mounted, and Regal was pretty sure Sloan would have dialed it into 200 meters. He'd check first chance, but if Ain came to shoot right now, he was comfortable with it. He didn't see anything he didn't recognize. No sci-fi giant bore incendiary cannons, anyway. Martin took a shotgun, a Benelli M4, with a ghost ring sight with a pistol grip, in forest camo. Tritium inset into the ring sight, for plus one, twelve gauge three inches. A shotgun? He gets past you, I want to be sure I don't miss up close. It'll stop a bear, too. Regal shrugged. Whatever. He liked his own sidearm, but he picked up a little star 9mm as backup. Martin grabbed a SNWK frame. Look at this, he said. A smith? No, it's not. It's Medusa. Or, actually, it's Reader's remake, The Scorp. 357. Multiple caliber. Shoots everything from .380 to .357 Magnum, got a tricked-out cylinder, see? He started to show it to Regal. I don't give a rat's ass right at the moment, Martin. Take it, leave it, we gotta move, okay? Yeah, yeah. Regal gave the cabin a final look for now. Once business was taken care of, they'd be back, waiting for the next ride out or better, calling for their own once the radio cleared. Maybe with a little female company. If they could catch the woman, he'd make her sorry, setting up Danny in Mel like that. The two men headed for the door. We ought to burn the place down, Martin said. He'd covered Gibson with a blanket from one of the beds. Regal had watched him passively, still wishing that Gibson had survived instead of his partner. Billy had had a sense of humor, at least. Not yet. We might still need some stuff here, and it's the only store in town. Maybe later, depending on how transportation works out. He grinned, the expression humorless. After the ranger is dead, and I've got his fucking head on a stick. As they headed out, he let Martin take the lead. If Sloan was out there, better he got Martin first. Crazy fucker. What could have turned a man into that kind of loon? Yeah, he'd had it rough as a kid, too, but he'd turned out okay. When he was ten, he'd been in his first real fight, at the crappy after-school program his mother had signed him up for so she'd have more time to drink and fuck. He could still remember the nasty, musty smell of the community center basement where he spent so much of his brief childhood, the faded linoleum, the splintery furniture. A bumpy pool table, a TV, boxes of broken, dirty toys, not much, but better than home. There was usually an adult around, some overworked and ancient volunteer who spent more time dozing upstairs than watching the kids. 
It was better supervision than most of the kids got from their parents. He didn't really have friends, but he hung around a lot with a boy named Tyrone, a couple years younger than him. Tyrone didn't talk much and he looked up to Regal for some reason, so when one of the older kids kicked the shit out of Tyrone one day Regal hadn't been there, had found out later from Tyrone's little brother Regal had felt compelled to act. At 14, the older kid name had been Oren Lyles, of all things had been one of several minor tyrants who bullied the younger and smaller at the community center, forcing them to give away prized possessions or get pounded. Seemed Tyrone had dared to try and keep his new jacket when Oren had demanded it. He'd taken a serious beating and lost the coat, anyway. Everyone knew that Oren would get away with it the bullies always did, scaring their victims into insisting that they'd wanted to give away their shit, or that they'd tripped and fallen on the concrete patch that made up the playground but Regal had decided that it wasn't going to happen, this time. He had walked right up to him Oren had been standing around with a couple of his toadies outside in the smoking area, bragging on himself, talking shit and taking the bigger boy down with one punch. The city sky had been muggy and grey, and Regal could still recall clearly how it had felt to approach the older boys, a roll of pennies clutched in one sweaty hand, his heart pounding in his ears. The way the smirk on Oren's face had disappeared into a mouthful of blood and broken teeth. Oren, who'd ended up dying in a botched home invasion deal only three years later, sat down, hard, clutching his broken mouth, and his buddies had backed off. The rush of rare pride at dealing out justice. God, that had been something. Even the useless volunteer adult couldn't look the other way on that one, though, not with a half dozen witnesses and Oren missing four of his teeth. An ambulance had been called, Oren's mama had shown up and screamed threats at everybody. When he'd gotten home that night, delivered by a mute faced cop, his uncle Eric had wailed on him for fighting. When he tried to explain that he'd done it for Tyrone, Eric had really gone off. You get busted for protecting some candy ass. Eric had screamed, his rancid whiskey breath washing over Regal's face. You a hero now. You a. Fucking, chump now, risking your ass for a fucking, nobody. Almost all his mother's boyfriends beat on Regal, but that beating had been memorable. Broken rib, broken arm. And a real understanding of how stupid he'd been, getting himself in trouble for no good reason. Strangely, though, Uncle Eric had also been the only one Regal really missed, once he was gone. It had been Eric who'd started teaching him about guns. He'd been around longer than most, two, almost two years fucking Regal's mother, until he'd been picked up on a parole violation. Regal shook off the thoughts, returning to the matter at hand. Yeah, he'd had it tough, but he hadn't gotten to the place where he cut people's heads off. Sloan gave Mary a gorp bar to eat while they walked. If he remembered right, he had some freeze-dried stuff in the pack at the den, but it had been a while since he'd checked. First couple of years after he took the ranger job, he'd planted caches of supplies here and there, in case he got caught out in bad weather, religiously checking every fall to see that nothing had gotten to them. He hadn't bothered, last few years, no real chance of him getting lost out here, anymore. A few times, he hesitated, slipping his wolf ears on, holding up a hand. Each time, he was able to place the sound. Squirrels, a couple of deer, once. The trek to the den was otherwise uneventful. Sloan was glad. He was feeling his age. Didn't matter how tight a shape you were in, how mentally disciplined, more than 24 hours without sleep, muscles started getting twitchy. Not good. Mary stayed close and kept quiet. She was holding up pretty well, he thought. He wasn't sure when, but at some point, she'd become more than a hassle. He didn't spend a lot of time around people, tended to forget that they lived by a whole different set of ethics and rules that were important to them. Tended to disregard their experience, because it wasn't part of his extremely narrow reality, as an ex had once helpfully pointed out. 
He hadn't cut Mary much slack, and he'd been working hard to think of her as nothing more than a variable to be considered. Maybe it was the way she'd looked when he'd stepped out of the trees. Something. Anyway, he was glad she was alive. He hoped he could keep her that way for a while. He had the Chaytac and the scope, plenty of rounds for that. He had the BMF. If he thought he could risk the station, he'd go pick up a .38. Special revolver for Mary. Simple design, easy to understand, point and pull. Best gun for a schoolteacher with no training. But the two poachers had finally circled back in that direction. Maybe they were counting on the station's airstrip for their ride, or could be they'd finally wised up, something was killing their comrades, time to put up some distance, and the station was just on their way out. He hadn't tailed them long, not wanting to leave Mary too far behind. Either way, he suspected that the offworlders would be after them. Which is where I come in. He needed to catch at least a couple hours sleep, get some food, gear up. Have a talk with Mary about what she needed to do, if he didn't come back. Tired as he was, thinking about what all these assholes were doing, running around in his park and killing his bears and each other, upsetting his routine. He hoped they were gunning for him. It would make it that much more satisfying to zap them when the time came. They started to walk again, then he stopped. He heard the plane in the distance, and after a moment, Mary heard it too. Hey, is that Dash? Shoo. He held his forefinger to his lips to quiet her. He listened carefully to the drone of the engine. Most of the people who came and went this far away from civilization did so in aircraft. You usually could hear them a long way off, and after a while, you got so you could recognize the different engine sounds. This wasn't Dietz's Cessna, he could tell. Single engine, but it was a deeper drone, maybe a little bigger, more horsepower. Come on, he said. Let's get to the top of the ridge, maybe we can spot it. Her ankle was trouble, but she was game. They made their way up the ridge, using small trees to pull themselves along faster. The plane seemed to be getting closer. The station was maybe four or five miles to the northwest, you couldn't see it from here, but you could see if a plane was heading toward the landing strip there. And if it was planning to land anywhere around here, it would be at the station it was the only strip for miles, though there were places on the road south long enough where it left the trees in spots to maybe land safely. They got to the top of the ridge, and sure enough, there in the distance a couple miles away, a small aircraft was circling. Sloan could make out that it was mostly white, with what looked like blue trim. A Piper Archer, maybe a 6X. Big enough to seat four to six people. Going to land at the station's strip, Sloan told her. That's good, right? If the poachers aren't parked down there waiting for them. I'm guessing they are looking for a ride. Change in plans, we need to head that way. Fine by me. Your ankle dash. I'll hop if I have to. He grinned. Looked at the circling plane. Saw the rocket trail rising from the trees, oh, shit dash, he said. What? The plane exploded into a fireball. Pieces fell in a flaming, smoking rain toward the evergreens below. Debris was still falling, leaving smoky trails behind it. Mary stared at it, stunned. Our visitors apparently don't want company, he said. There wouldn't be any survivors, would there? she asked. No. If they lived through the blast and they didn't the fall would finish them. I hope it doesn't set the woods on fire. That would be another problem we don't need. He sighed. I'll have to go check it out, I suppose. See if I can figure out who it was. I didn't recognize the plane. Could have been a tourist, but it might have been somebody coming to see why I haven't been checking in. A plane, plane. 
Regal felt the same sense of relief that was in Martin's voice. They weren't far from the landing strip and the station, headed out. They could get back there in 10, 15 minutes. By the time the plane landed and the pilot got out to go look for the ranger, they could be there, and a couple minutes past that, way the hell and gone. There it is. Martin said, pointing. He grinned. Regal smiled back at him. Thank whatever gods there might be for this, and hallelujah, brother. Come on, let's make tracks dash. But the flash in the sky, followed a few seconds later by the loud boom. As the plane blew apart stopped Regal cold. What the dash? Martin said, what the fuck? The ranger. He's got a rocket launcher. He shot it down. Oh, no. Which was exactly how Regal felt. Oh, no. The sense of loss over the plane weighed on Mary like a cape of lead. In an instant, her hopes had risen to the heights, to be blasted down like the aircraft had been. At least Sloan hadn't said anything nasty about what wonderful people these alien visitors were. And at the moment, if he had, she would have agreed with him. There had been no cause to do that, to kill whoever was flying that plane. That was not the mark of a civilized species. It made things somehow so much worse than they had been before. After a while, they reached the place Sloan wanted. The den had been an actual bear's lair. Set into the rising foothills, the burrow sloped underground, a dark crack in the rocks that opened into a low, natural cave. Sloane crawled in first, checked it out, then helped her sit and scoot into the cool darkness. There was actually more light than she'd expected, the way the entry was partially exposed to the open woods. She remembered Paul talking about such places once, how bears found or made their dens in sloping terrain to use the snow as an insulator come winter. The tunnel that led to the main chamber allowed stale air to escape. It was still dark, though, until Sloane dug through a pocket in his bag, came up with a light. He wound a crank for a minute, then turned it on, set it upright, and the corners of the small, neat cave appeared. Spring-powered, he said, pointing at the little lamp. You have to wind it up every half hour or so, but it doesn't use batteries, so it won't burn out. You aren't worried that a bear might come back? Not really. Something must have spooked them I haven't seen any sign of anything bigger than a beetle or maybe a mouse in here in more than a year. The cave was tall enough for Sloane to crouch walk to the far end, pick up a steel foot locker sitting against the wall. He dragged it back to where she waited and opened it. Inside, a bright yellow backpack practically loud enough to see in the dark. What's that? Sloane moved back. Supplies. Water, some food, a couple of sleeping bags. Nothing fancy. The box keeps out hungry critters that might smell the contents. Mary shook her head. Nothing fancy. Just the essentials. When did you put that stuff here? While back. He opened the bag, pulled out a handful of thin, flat containers, vacuum-packed in foil. He squinted at a label. Scrambled eggs. Got a couple other Marie's, hamburger, like that. But why? Mary studied his face, his very sharp eyes. Were you expecting something like this? Who on the planet would expect something like this, he said. I put other boxes at caches along the main trails, the watch, tower, in a couple other caves, like that. Some of them aren't much, old steel ammo boxes with matches and food bars, and chained to a tree so the wildlife can't drag them off. I figure some hiker gets lost, they'll appreciate it. He shrugged. I was a boy scout. That was our motto be prepared. Mary considered that, considered what she knew about him. The facts, veteran, heavily armed, living alone in the woods didn't exactly scream sanity, 
but her impressions of him did, pensive, careful, thorough. A complicated man who'd managed to simplify his life out here. At heart, she believed, a good man, true to his own stark moral compass. At least it seemed that way. So what do we do now? Eat. Get your ankle wrapped up, get some sleep. Then you're going to stay here, while I go see what there is to see. The plane. What's left of it, yeah. The woods aren't too dry yet, we've had some rain, there's still snow in spots, so maybe there wasn't any fire. Or maybe the aliens put it out if one did get started. But I need to have a look. Mary felt an instant pang of anxiety. Why not stay with me, just wait until they leave? I mean, wouldn't that be safer? Sloane smiled, and she saw a flash of that coldness she'd glimpsed before. It reminded her that he'd killed people. For them, sure, he said. Chapter 18 Sloane found a cold pack in the first aid kit, snap and shake, and applied it to Mary's ankle. She'd given it a good twist, but nothing was broken. The treatment was rice rest, ice, compression, elevation. He found an ace bandage, and wrapped her ankle, then put the cold pack back on it. He spread out the blankets, had her sit with her leg propped up on the supply bag. They ate rehydrated eggs, apple slices, some trail mix from his own pack. Not especially tasty, but it did the job. She talked while they ate, a little about her place in L.A., the school where she taught. They exchanged a few statistics. Neither married, no kids. She'd been engaged for a while. Small talk, because she was still nervous, still scared. Easier to talk than to think about it. She had a nice voice, low and musical and was it him, or was she making more eye contact than was strictly necessary? It had been a long time since he'd spent any real time talking to a woman, but the signals seemed pretty clear. He did his best to ignore them well aware that she'd been through a rough patch. That made her vulnerable. Still, he liked listening to her voice, and didn't mind smiling back at her. She wasn't bad company. He wished there was some way to avoid sleeping, he would have liked to keep watch, but he was wiped. Mary, too. She was fading, her eyes going glassy. I need some sleep, he said. We should be safe here, for a while. He hoped. He didn't get the impression that the hunters wanted to bag sleeping trophies, but then, he had taken one of them out. No way to know if they were a vengeance-oriented culture, but it seemed likely. On the other hand, his gut told him they'd try to take him in the field, and he knew better than to second-guess. If the poachers meant to circle back, they'd probably wait and anyway, He'd walk them to the den through varied terrain, some of it rocky, hard to track. Unless one of them was better than he was, they weren't going to be showing up any time soon. It was warm outside, but the low cave was cool. There were only two sleeping bags. Mary was quick to agree to a warmth, sharing overture, so he zipped the two bags together. It still got chilly after the sun started to settle, and the cave was cool. He firmly reminded himself that she was off-limits for the time being. They barely knew one another, and he doubted that he was her type. In different circumstances circumstances where he wasn't her best shot for survival he didn't think she'd be so quick to press up against him, her body warm and lean and soft in the right places. Before he could think about it any more, he was asleep. Mary listened to Sloane's breathing turn deep, and felt herself relax, her heart still beating a little too hard from the possibility they'd just passed by. She found him attractive, and thought he liked her, too. But they weren't horny teenagers, unable to control themselves just because they had working equipment. So why do I feel like one? Maybe it was some sublimated rescue fantasy she hadn't known about. Maybe it was the brush with death that was giving her such a sudden, literal lust for life for the pleasures it had to offer. 
made sense, that she'd be grateful to the man who'd saved her. Maybe it's just been a while since I got laid, she thought, smiling drowsily, pressing herself deeper into his sleeping embrace. Sloane was being a perfect gentleman, he probably had some self-imposed regulation about not getting involved with rescue victims. If she had any sense at all, she'd follow his lead on that. It wasn't like they were on a singles camping vacation. There were a number of dangerous people and things roaming around in the woods, apparently eager to put an end to both of them. Scratching an itch was an indulgence that neither should be bothering with. Still, thinking about touching him, having his hands on her, was a nice distraction from the crazy world outside. She felt perfectly safe nestled against him, sleepy and unafraid. She fell asleep listening to the whirring drone of summer insects outside, smelling the rough wool of the blanket, Sloane's breath warm and soft against the back of her head. Time passed, the day's shadows lengthened, and Sloane half woke to find that Mary had turned in her sleep, was facing him and had slipped one hand to his groin, was rubbing slowly through the fabric of his pants. He could barely see her in the darkness, just the pale oval of her face. He responded immediately to her touch, firming against her hand. Mary, he whispered, cleared his throat. Maybe you don't want to be doing that. Saying it was an effort. She paused, shifted closer to him. Her hand circled, warm and firm. Do you want me to stop? Ah, Christ. What a question. I'm a grown-up, she said. Both of us are. I don't need you to save me from myself. But if you don't want this, say so. You're sure. In answer, she slid her other hand up to his mouth, effectively shushing him, and the last of his resolve disappeared. Chapter 19 They hiked back to the cliff where Danny and Mel had been dumped, and Regal easily picked up a new track over theirs. The ranger, back in his real feet. He'd come after them. Motherfucker. If Martin hadn't come crashing back on his setup, they woulda had him. Regal used the scope to check out the ground around the bodies. He hadn't taken a good look before, since the amount of blood on the ground up top made it obvious that his boys had been killed there, then heaved down the hill. Now he saw tracks. The woman, looked like. He had no doubt that if they followed her prints, they'd find the ranger somewhere along the way. The son of a bitch had used her like a stalking goat and his boys had taken the bait, hook, line, and shot dead. Gotta get down there, Regal said. He raised the stoner, tracked along the top of the ridge. The slope wasn't as steep, further along. Come on. They started following the ridge. It climbed before descending again, and they were both sweating and breathing hard after a few minutes. Christ, but it was getting hot. At least the bears mostly stayed put, this time of day. They wouldn't be active again until dusk. You think he's still tracking us? Martin asked. How the fuck do I know? Regal shrugged. He thought not, though. If he had been, he could have taken them out at the station pretty easily. Which meant the ranger had something else planned. He still couldn't believe the bastard had shot down that airplane. Blam. Like it was nothing. And how was he hauling a fucking rocket launcher around? He must have more hardware hidden the woods. What else was out there? Mines? Bombs? Flamethrowers? Even as he thought this, they reached the apex of the narrow ridge. Regal raised the rifle again, checking out the trail farther along. Trees and scrub and fucking mosquitoes rising up in clouds. He looked for anything out of the ordinary, a flash of light, the distinctive shape of a man or a rifle against the trees. All he saw was woods, a glimmer of heat haze near a huge, lightning-blasted tree trunk maybe a hundred and fifty meters away. Regal paused on the faint shimmer, frowning. 
He'd spent a lot of hours watching the world through a scope, seen some strange tricks of light, but this was a weird one. It was like, like he was scoped in on a movie of a lightning-blasted tree, the look of it right but the texture wrong, flat and a little, flash. He saw the explosion of light appear out of nowhere, and was already dropping flat, had hit the dirt before he heard it, before part of the tree he'd been standing next to exploded in a fiery blast of splinters and sap, two meters above his head. Martin shouted, dropped to the ground behind him. Ah, uh, fuck, man, what the fuck was that? The ranger. He's got a bazooka. Back up. How did he get here so fast? Retreat, dipshit, we'll fucking discuss it later. Martin started backing down the hill. Regal backed after him, making no real effort to keep his boots out of Martin's face. He wanted away from the point of impact for whatever Sloane was throwing. The old fuck had gotten the drop on them. How had he gotten from the station so fast? But they had his position now, they could circle around him. If they booked ass. As soon as he thought they were safely clear, Regal rose into a crouch, motioned Martin after him, and started to run. Afterward, Sloane held her for a while, and she watched streaks of afternoon sunlight hit the top of the cave's entrance. The sex had been exciting and entirely satisfying, as she might have expected, Sloane was as patient and thorough with his hands and mouth as he was with everything else. She smiled, her head leaned against his chest, remembering her firm decision not to pursue sex, just before she'd fallen asleep. It was like a subplot out of a bad movie, the two fugitives hitting the sack in the middle of their run for survival. But she'd woken up to the feel of his hard body pressed against hers and realized that there wasn't any logic or sensibility that would make her want him any less. She should be so lucky as to live to regret it. Something funny. This, she said. Me. She could hear his own smile. Me, too, come to think of it. You're very persuasive, you know. Twisted your arm, she said. That, too. The banter was comfortable. She was comfortable, in spite of her swollen ankle and the rocky floor and her unprecedented grubbiness, she felt surprisingly good, her body and spirit soothed by food and sleep and some unexpectedly fine sex. She felt like things were going to work out. I should get going. Mary tensed. What? You mean now? In different circumstances, I would be delighted to spend all day having my arm twisted by you. Not today, though. I'm sorry. She pulled away from him as he spoke. He sat up, sleeping bag top pooled in his naked lap, his body hard and lean, his expression cold, but not at her, not for her. You said the poachers probably left already. Maybe, maybe not. Can't be sure till I go look. She wanted to fight him on it. Even ten years ago, she might have, accusing him of fucking and running, trying to guilt him into staying at least a little while longer. She didn't want to be alone here. More than anything, she was afraid he wouldn't come back. But he is who he is, she thought, and nodded instead, recalling her own whispered words to him, not so long before. They were both grown-ups. Begging wouldn't cut any ice with him, and she wasn't one to beg. Soon as I see that we're safe, I'll come back for you, he said, and reached out for her hand. She let him take it. You know how to read a compass. She nodded. Good. There's one in my pack. Radio and GPS, too, but I wouldn't count on those. I want you to stay here, and stay down. Catch up on some sleep, rest your ankle. If I'm not back in a day or two, you'll want to head to where you can see the airstrip and wait for Dietz. He'll be here eventually. The strip runs right next to the station, but keep to the far end of it, away from the main cabin. There's a pretty big storage shed down there where you can shelter. 
Mary nodded. She didn't say what Sloane must be thinking, if the alien hunters had shot down one plane, they could shoot down another. If he was going to stop that, he had to get it done in the next few days. The station is almost directly southeast from here, but it's also up that cliff you fell from. The river swings around just north of our current position, and curves back to the station. Get to the river, follow it about three miles, then cut east. You'll hit the airstrip first. When Dietz shows up, don't even let him turn off the engines. Tell him there are poachers around, carrying heavy gear. Get out, tell the story at the station in Anchorage. What if Dash, she started to ask, and realized there was nothing he could tell her that she didn't already know. What if she got lost, what if she ran into trouble? There was no lesson planned to follow, she'd have to make do, and hope it was good enough. I'll come back for you, he said again. Mary met his clear gaze, sharp and intent, and nodded once more, believing that he meant what he said. But that he'd left the obvious unspoken. If I survive. Sloan left Mary at the den and headed towards the site where he'd wasted the alien hunter. They might both be at the station where they'd shot the plane down, and he had no doubt that they'd have moved camp by now, but he thought he might be able to draw them out again. Had an idea. But first, he needed to go see about the dead airplane. He'd been in these woods for a long time. How many years now? He'd lost track, he'd never been much of a timebinder. He'd gotten out of the service, gone back home to help his mother pack up the farm. After his daddy died, Mama had sold the farm to a developer. Gotten good money for it, and then moved to Georgia, where her younger sister, Aunt Janet, still lived. Janet's husband had been killed in a car wreck in 1980, and her kids were grown. After that, Sloan had bummed around the country for a while. Worked as a bouncer, delivery truck driver, odd jobs that kept him busy and didn't require too much on his part. The war wound down, Nixon rolled over, the troops came home. The hippies took baths, got jobs, turned into yuppies, and somewhere in there, Sloan had wandered up to the Great Northwest and wound up here. Twenty-five, twenty-eight years, had it been. Knocked around for a couple years, hunting, trapping, and then gotten this job, so he'd been a ranger for at least twenty-five years. Didn't seem like that long. The trip to the station wasn't that far, but he worked a meandering path, sometimes heading that way, sometimes not. It took maybe four hours to travel about that many miles. The biggest part of the downed plane was the engine and a section of the front. He found that because it happened to land in a clear spot not far from the river and was easy to see. The smaller chunks and bits, fire blackened and spread out, were all over the place for seven or eight hundred yards in all directions. Dials, wires, pieces of seats, bits of glass, an unopened can of coke. He never found the pilot's body, or those of any passengers. They could be up in a tree, or a bear could have hauled them off by now. After a couple more hours of searching, he came upon a badly scorched belly pouch, caught in a tangle of blackberry briars off a narrow bear trail near a little pond. The pouch, black leather, had a broken strap, but the zippers had held. He pulled it down, managed to snag his hands on half a dozen thorns, and got it open. There was a short-barreled .357 Magnum revolver, a Smith Model 66, stainless steel, with a speedloader of extra ammo. A small flashlight, book of matches. A billfold. The wallet had a couple hundred bucks in it, and a driver's license, pilot's license, and assorted credit cards and such, all made out to somebody named J. J. Heiner, apparently a resident of Juneau, and a business card in the billfold saying that J. J. Heiner was the owner slash operator of Outback Charter Flights. There was a phone number, post office box number, and a URL. There was a snapshot of an attractive woman of about 30, 
smiling at the camera. The picture on the license didn't look like anybody Sloan knew. Why had he been here? No way to tell. Could have been taking somebody out to see the country. Or maybe looking for landing strips to bring somebody back later. Could have been somebody from the park service sent him. Maybe he was a dope smuggler or bringing in a hunter. Dozens of reasons. It didn't really matter, except that maybe he had told somebody where he was going, and maybe they might come looking for him eventually. Sloan didn't have, eventually, to work with. He hadn't said anything to Mary, but if these spacemen were still here when Dietz came back, they could knock him down as easily as they had this poor guy. Mary was bright enough to have thought about that on her own, and that meant Sloan was on the clock. He couldn't deal with the predators by then, Dietz's painting of hell could well turn into the real thing. Long as the radio was jammed, those things could knock down small aircraft one after another for a long damn time before anybody figured it out. Eventually, maybe, somebody would figure it out and get the National Guard involved, and maybe they'd come with more than one plane or chopper. Enough force to outgun the aliens. But by then, how many people would the things get? A dozen? Fifty? Sloan put the belly pouch in his backpack, as he removed his ghillie suit. If he lived through this, Heiner's woman would need to know what happened. He stood, dusted the ash off his hands, looked around. Okay. Time to ramp things up. The poachers, he was less worried about or less immediately, anyway. He wasn't counting them out of the equation, but if the hunters hadn't gotten them, they should be running. Besides, he thought there were only the two left, Boss Winchester and his pale minion. Winchester looked like he might have some skill, but he wasn't in Sloane's league. On the other hand, there were at least three offworlders. He didn't think they'd packed up and gone home, and with the gear they had, playing too cautious a defense wasn't going to work. Sloane had learned the lesson from an old Marine combat instructor in basic training, you can block a hundred punches, boot, but sooner or later, one will get past and bust your nose, if that's all you do is block. Best you throw some punches of your own. He stripped, stepped into the ghillie suit, zipped it up. It was still clammy with sweat from the last time he'd worn it, but he shrugged that off. Might be a while before he had a chance to take a nice hot bath. No point in getting fastidious now. He broke off some small branches from the small trees, started working them into the mesh. Thinking about Mary. About what had happened with her. It had been a while, and it had been unexpected and it had been good, for both of them, he thought. In spite of his general aversion to complications of any kind, he was glad it had happened. What did it mean in the long run? Assuming there was going to be a long run for him. Put it aside, Marine. Do the job. Right. He could reflect later, if there was a later for him. Rig the suit, Sloan. Get into the mode. Do what it is you know how to do best. Find something and kill it. Chapter 20 Regal didn't look too hard at what was left of Mel and Danny. Already, the stench was hellacious and bugs were flocking to the corpses, getting fat, laying eggs. In the brief time they'd been running through the woods, trying to get behind Sloane, a bear had come nosing around. It had eaten most of Mel's guts, then wandered away toward the river. Fuck, look at that, Martin said, pointing to the bear's trail. Regal nodded. Move, he said, and they started after the woman. The bear's prints crossed the woman's before veering toward the river. Big tracks, back feet about fourteen inches long. A thousand plus pounds of bear, and it would be back soon, once a bear claimed a carcass, it might stay around for days. Others, too, the smell would call them. If his crew was still around, they'd be able to rack up money. Fuck the money, he thought, and actually meant it. 
it had become an issue of pride. They'd run asses and elbows through the woods, both of them sweating and gasping by the time they'd gotten to the site and he'd been gone, leaving nothing behind but a scattering of those fake tracks. They had just ended a hundred meters out from the shattered tree trunk, where he'd fired on them. As though he'd walked for a couple minutes, then suddenly learned how to fly. There were trees nearby, but too far for a man to reach by jumping. Maybe a kangaroo could do it, but there weren't any kangaroos with rifles out here. They hurried away from the bodies, Regal filing away the details of the woman's step. She had a limp, but he didn't see any blood, not beyond what she'd stepped in running away from the scene making him wonder if one or both of his guys had found time to interrogate her a little before they'd been capped. He hoped so. Hoped Sloan was choking on it. One way or another, that old fucker was going to pay for fucking up Regal's trip. After Sloan left, Mary crawled to one corner of the cave and peed in the dirt, using a little water to wash herself off. She brushed more dirt over the wet spot, then crawled back to the blankets. It wasn't ideal, but she didn't want to risk going outside, not in the daylight. She drank a little water, laid down again, sure she wouldn't sleep anymore, she felt like she wouldn't sleep again until Sloane was back. She was tired, though the nap didn't make up for a night without, and she'd been through a lot in the last couple of days. The cold had gone out of the cold pack, and her ankle felt a little better, but it still throbbed. There was some ibuprofen in the emergency bag, but she'd taken some before they'd fallen asleep, and she wanted to save what was left for when they or just she hiked back to the station. She closed her eyes, listened to the rustling of wind in the trees, wondering what she would do for two days in the small cave to keep herself from going crazy and wondering, fell deeply, dreamlessly asleep. Sloane lay prone, peering through the rifle's scope. It wasn't that long a shot a hair under 400 meters. No real wind stirring the trees, nothing to deflect the round, no brush between him and the target. That the target was invisible was a little more of a problem. Well. Not entirely invisible if you knew how to look. In the ghillie suit, Sloane was effectively as hidden as the creature. Yeah, he was cooking in the late day sun, even in the shade, but lying prone behind the rifle scope under a matching bush, as long as he didn't move, something with the eyes of an eagle would have trouble spotting him. Sloan had no idea of how the camo the thing wore worked. Electronics, maybe some kind of high speed cam and projection system. He'd read about some of the research on such things on a couple of sniper blogs. Cam picks up the background, projects it onto some kind of fiber optic mesh run by a computer so that you match whatever the camera is looking at. You set the cam to point at whatever is closest to you. Fast enough computer, you can shift the suit pretty quick why they called them that, shift suits. There'd be some time lag with human computers, but if you stood still, you'd be a good match for your background at the right angle. Obviously the alien technology was beyond what humans had, you had to look very carefully to notice the creature wearing the suit, and then it was more a flicker when it moved, almost like a heat haze distortion. When it stood still, it turned to glass, for all practical purposes. Stalking a mirage, Sloan thought. Looking to shoot a ghost. At the moment, the thing wasn't moving. He kept the scope on low magnification, to take in the widest field he could risk, and he tried not to focus on any particular thing in the circle too hard. Right now, it would probably be squatting next to the bait, Sloan's little Motorola handheld, with the broadcast button pushed down by a piece of first aid tape. Sloan figured that even if the things were somehow jamming local radio signals, they must have a way of communicating with each other and probably some way of detecting transmissions other than their own. Had to be radio or some variation there were too many trees and hills here for line-of-sight corns lasers, infrared, like that, they'd only work if you didn't have anything blocking the SIG. He'd been watching the handheld for an hour when he'd spotted the distortion moving across his field of vision. 
good thing, because the battery probably wouldn't last much longer. He couldn't risk a shot while it was moving leading a target you could see clearly at this range was tricky enough, trying to lead one you couldn't see. He couldn't take the chance. But now, it had taken the bait. He had his crosshair centered a meter and a half above the handheld radio. He saw the radio rise as if by magic, into the air. If the creature was paying attention and probably sooner rather than later, it would see the tape holding the transmit button down and realize it wasn't an accident. It would realize the radio was a trap. Was it right-handed or left-handed? What was the angle? If he held his aim point over the radio, would it hit the thing dead center? Or was it standing sideways to his position, and would the bullet sail harmlessly past, because it wasn't in the line of fire? No help for any of that. He had to take the shot. It wasn't going to get any better. Sloan squeezed the trigger, shooting at something he wasn't certain he saw. The roar of the big gun lapped against his hearing protectors, the backsplash of the shockwave rolled over him. The recoil splashed sweat from his brow into his eyes. He blinked. A hit? A miss? Would the suit keep working if he did hit it? Five seconds passed. Ten. If it was alive, if he'd missed, it would be looking for him. He should move one of those rockets would get here in a hurry, he was too close to have much of a jump on it. But he held his position, watching. No blurs, no distortions, no weight. There was something. Liquid. It looked almost green in this light, and it appeared maybe 30 centimeters off the ground in midair, running down to pool on the ground. As Sloan watched, the pool grew, spreading in a semicircle, stopped on the side by something. That would be the body of the hunter, keeping the blood from spreading in that direction. A hit. It was down, and the suit was still working. Sloan found he had been holding his breath. He allowed it to escape, blowing it out with a lot of the tension he'd been holding with the air. Another one cooked. At least two more still out there, but the odds had just gotten better. He considered going down to have a look at the corpse. It wouldn't take long, and maybe he could figure out how to disable the suit and examine the dead hunter in some detail. Might learn something useful. Maybe he could collect the thing's weapons, use those. He thought about it for a minute, and while he was really curious, he didn't move to go see. A couple of things made him hold off. First, if he were off on some planet halfway around the galaxy hunting with a few buddies and they didn't want the locals to know they had dropped by for a visit, they have some kind of dead man switch so the guns wouldn't work. They weren't common yet, but there were smart guns on Earth, geared to a fingerprint or a little transmitter, in a watch or ring or in a pocket. Unless your prints were in the gun's computer chip, or you had the signal generator, the hardware would lock up. There was one that was even simpler a steel ball machined into a handgun, so if you weren't wearing a magnetic ring to hold the ball in place, the ball jammed the action so it wouldn't cycle. Gun was nothing but a big paper. Second thing was, there might be some kind of check-in procedure, maybe even an automatic signal that turned on if your biological functions stopped suddenly. They had astronauts rigged for that kind of telemetry, they could read heartbeat, respiration, brain waves, like that, from ground control, on a guy 10,000 miles away. Have to believe these things could do that and a lot more, they had a working spaceship. Maybe if one of these things fell over dead, it sent a distress signal to its buddies, who even now could be sneaking through the woods on their way here to see what was what. Maybe the dead thing had a built-in booby trap. You didn't know how to disconnect it, you fiddled with the body, tried one of the guns, it went boom. Left a big smoking crater where you used to be. Too many unknowns to be risking for a better look. Humans had that kind of attitude, some of them, I'm killed and on my way to hell. I want somebody to come along and hold the door open for me. 
these things were predators, they might well have the same mindset. Plus if they were hiding, they'd make allowances for the possibility one or more of them would run into trouble. They wouldn't want some troop of Girl Scouts coming across a dead spaceman, so it would make sense there'd be some kind of failsafe. Either a buddy or a way to destroy the body and not leave enough behind to figure out what it had been. Maybe it was best to ease out of here, right now. Yeah, he could wait and hope to get lucky again, but they'd be expecting trouble and he doubted they'd just waltz into the clearing, even in their cloaks of invisibility, and give him another free shot. It was an old sniper's trick, to shoot somebody and only wound them, so they'd lie there calling for help, and when somebody came, you'd have him, too. This one was dead or dying, but chances of its pal just rushing up there to answer an automatic distress call were slim. They were used to hunting deadly prey, and the kind that could shoot back was iffier than the kind that just had been teeth and a ferocious attitude. A man with a gun was a dangerous thing on this planet, and a trained man with a top-of-the-line gun was more dangerous still. Those things had to know that by now, if they hadn't known it before. Somebody had knocked off a couple of their number, and somehow, Sloan didn't think that was common to these creatures. Maybe they could just start firing rockets all to hell and gone and level the woods for half a mile in any direction. Maybe they could call in a pocket nuke from orbit and knock down every tree for ten miles around. No. Better to set the scene the way he wanted it. For all he knew, one of the remaining hunters could be behind him right now, and heading this way, might stumble over him. He didn't want that. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Sloan came up, stiff and slow, and moved off. It was still his forest, he knew it better than most people knew the streets of the neighborhood they lived in, he was comfortable here. Tired, slower, and maybe past his best days, but still better off than the poachers or the monsters when it came to knowing his way around. They'd picked the wrong place to come and play. Chapter 21 It took Regal and Martin a while, but they found the ranger's tracks. Sure enough, he'd hooked back up with the woman. Although it looked like she'd gotten lost for a while first, her own tracks circling around and back between the river and the cliff where Sloane had hacked up his boys. The ranger had a past, he had some skills, but his girlfriend was a civilian. No question. He was just using her, way Regal figured it. Probably cut off her head, too, once he was done. Crazy bastard. Tracking the pair once they'd hooked up again was harder. The ranger was better than Regal had first thought, leading the woman through water and over bare rock. More than once he lost their trail, had to stop, start casting around for some sign, a spill of pebbles, a scuff of dirt, a pine needle stuck where it shouldn't be. Always from the civilian, looked like. Hardly ever any sign of the ranger. Martin kept them covered while Regal tracked, and slowly but inevitably, they followed the couple through the woods, as fast as they could without making too much noise. It was a hot day, the bugs out in droves as close as they were to the water, but Regal barely noticed. He was focused on the ground, on the smallest of details. He knew how to do it, but it wasn't easy. The ranger had done a little misdirection at the end, they almost missed the cave. But Regal picked the right moment to stand up and look around, and he saw the opening. A few steps further along and he would have passed it by. The scattering of leaves and needles at its lip had been disturbed, he was sure, and yet there were no tracks leading to it. Guy was pretty good, but not good enough. He nodded sharply at Martin, pointed. He leaned in close, whispered. Don't kill him unless you have to. I want to take him alive so we can make him suffer for what he did. Martin nodded. Yeah, Martin wanted to make the ranger pay for killing Gibson. He'd make it last as long as he could. The ranger would wish he was dead long before that happened. They moved toward the tunnel, crept up on it carefully, Regal scarcely breathing. 
no way Sloan would be expecting them. As long as they didn't alert him, he was as good as God. The girlfriend, too. Not dead, though. Not yet. Playtime, first. Make them both pay. Tie the ranger up make him watch them do the woman, listen to her scream. Both men slung their rifles and got down on the ground, on their bellies. Martin pulled his fancy new scorp, and Regal decided to try out the Firestar, in the spirit of things offing the ranger with his own hardware was a fitting conclusion to this clusterfuck of a job. Besides, shooting off the bigger pistol in a cave would likely make you deaf. The entrance was just big enough for the two of them to go down together. Regal let Martin pull ahead a couple feet as they silently wormed their way into the dark, just to be safe. A dislodged rock rolled down the short, sloping tunnel, clattering against another as it went. A rustle of clothing at the cave's far side, maybe ten feet away. A sleepy female voice, Sloan. That told him pretty much everything. Well. Minor setback, but they were halfway home. Don't move. Regal kept his voice low and threatening. Twitch a fucking muscle and you're dead. You understand? Ah yes. She sounded fucking petrified. Good. The shadows were fading into lines of gray, and he saw her, half sitting on a blanket, close enough that he could be on top of her in a single lunge. Regal grinned. Maybe later. If she was expecting Sloane back, they wanted to get gone. No way they wanted to be trapped in here by a killer who could put bullets into the cave to rattle around until a ricochet eventually found them. Martin covering, Regal crouched stepped to her side, looked down into her pretty oval face, a little older than he liked, but still prime. I'm Regal, this here is Martin. I'm going to frisk you for weapons, sweetheart, and then we're gonna walk and talk. You do anything but hold perfectly still, I'll just kill you now. Any questions? She didn't answer, which he took for a yes. He patted her down, pausing long enough to cup one of her sloping breasts, rub his thumb over the nipple, to make sure she understood what was coming checked the sleeping bags, grabbed up the pack. Let's move, he said, pushing the woman in front of him, smiling as she gasped, grabbed her ankle. Looks like walking's going to be a bitch, he said. How appropriate. Sloan worked through the river's shallows and up into the dense edge cover, sticking to the rocks, moving south. He had a couple ideas about his next move, but wanted to get the whole game moved away from Mary before he started looking for a setup. And if the poachers had decided to hike out, south was the only way that didn't involve mountain climbing. He needed to wrap this up. He edged along, trying not to think too hard in any one direction. There were still too many variables to go pursuing a hardline plan, and he liked to keep his options open for as long as possible. It allowed more freedom to do what his gut told him. The icy water around his feet barely put a dent in the ghillie suit's heat. He wanted to take the goddamn thing off, but walking the river made him easier to spot. Better safe than dead. The river spread out a little up ahead, laid out some mud, so he stepped up into the woods, there was a small clear spot. And froze. Froze fucking solid. A brown bear rose up on massive haunches, not twenty feet in front of him. Rose up to take a look, a better smell. Juvenile male, maybe eight hundred pounds. Except for a sow with cubs, the most likely to attack anything it saw as a threat. And he'd just startled it. Sloan inched his hand toward his revolver. The bear sniffed, sitting there, towering. Blinked. Turned its face slightly looking for the source of the smell. The suit would mask a lot of his scent, but not all of it, and the canvas and webbing had its own odor, not something a bear would be familiar with. It dropped to all fours, ears laid back against its massive skull, searching, wondering. It made a deep, 
almost gentle hoof sound on its next heavy exhalation. Bad. Bad signals. Sloan rested his hand on the BMF and held perfectly still, not making eye contact. The suit had the animal confused, but it had decided that its personal space had been infringed upon, and was giving clear warning. He'd have to draw and shoot in a big hurry. No room for error. He didn't want to kill it. He had to stand his ground. If the bear had been farther away, he would have backed out. As it was, he thought it was still deciding whether or not it wanted to attack a bush. It didn't need to die unless it charged, and he didn't want to be making that much noise. Too many unfriendly years. He breathed slowly, evenly and very quietly, watching the bear's giant clawed feet. Time stretched like hot taffy in the sunshine. Go away, son. Take a stroll into the wood. Probably some real tasty berries in there. Go find them, fill your belly. Live another day. Get big, strong, sire a dynasty. If it took another couple steps his way, he'd have to kill it. He hoped it didn't. Brown bears like to fake charges, veer away at the last second, but he wasn't going to bet his ass on the hope that this one was only kidding. And he'd only have a second to get the gun out and lined up, if that. Another hoof, but the bear started to swing its head from side to side, presenting its giant, shaggy side to Sloan. It was looking for a way out. Bears weren't AA curious as cats. They'd just as soon avoid the unknown most of the time. Good, Sloan thought. Just like that. The bear saw something he liked, a hole in the trees, and wheeled away, branches cracking into the ground beneath his weight. Eight hundred pounds, and up here, that wasn't that big. He remembered talking to a girl down in Anchorage once, in town off a cruise on a big ferry taking the inside passage from Seattle. She had been from England, and when the subject of bears came up, she had been astonished to hear that they would sometimes wander into town and knock over garbage cans to eat supper. Yes, of course, she had heard that there were bears in the wild, but that meant way out in the forest, miles and miles away, not right there in the city. Well, he'd said, those were the runts. The really big ones did tend to stay out. The little black ones weren't much bigger than dogs. Well, okay, really big dogs, mastiffs, but still, only a couple hundred pounds, most of them. Only a couple hundred pounds? Sweet Lord Jesus. Not a tot of bears in the UK, he gathered, of any size. Sloan watched the young male crash away. Smiled. How strange it must be, to suddenly be demoted from one of the most dangerous creatures running through the woods to second or third place. All of a sudden, the tourists here had bigger and nastier teeth than the locals. He wondered if the bear somehow knew that. Had understood that to charge Sloan would be to die. Probably not. He didn't want to do what Mary's brother had done, give the wild animal thinking abilities it didn't have. What was that term? Anthropomorphize? Something like that. It was a bear. It did bear things. It could have just as easily attacked as left, and for reason a human couldn't understand. The only way to win in that situation was to be ready for either choice the bear made. Sloan had been ready, but he was just as happy the bear decided to take off. He took a deep breath, blew it out, and pushed on. Chapter 22 Mary felt sick, she felt as if she were going to throw up. They waited while she put on her boots couldn't get the one around her bad ankle completely laced up, but managed to get it on, and then they pushed her ahead of them, the one who'd felt her up staying close behind. What's your name? The one named Regal asked, and she didn't look back at him, too busy watching the ground, trying not to trip. Her ankle hurt, every step a minor misery. He shoved her, hard. She fell, 
scraping her hands and knees on rocks and scrub, her ankle burning white hot. It was all she could do not to scream. If I have to ask you anything else twice, I'll feed your dead body to the bears, he said, his tone almost conversational. He walked around in front of her, nudged her arm with his boot. His rifle was pointed at her face. So, what did you say? She crawled to her feet, hating him. Mary. Mary. He smiled, a grin that was almost handsome, or might have been if it belonged to another. Where is your psycho boyfriend? I don't know. Out for a walk, huh? How about this one why are you with a sick fuck like him? He looked her up and down, his lip curling. You some kind of kink. You lead M out, he zaps M, you two fuck in the bloodbath, something like that? What? He cuts up bears, too, you in on that? Mary suddenly understood, and felt her gut not even tighter. No, no, she said. That's not him there are these. Oh. That would go over well with this guy, wouldn't it? These what? Pea poachers. Crazy poachers, she said slowly. They're hunting us, too. They are the ones killed your friends. Oh, aha, uh -huh, Regal said. I had a word with him, bitch, right after he potted Gibson. Your boyfriend did that. Blew Gibson's head clean apart with that fancy rifle of his. I said I'd kill you, even though that was kind of a lie, since I didn't have you at the time. He said, go ahead. And then I'll kill you. Cold bastard, saying that. The other man muttered something unintelligible, glaring daggers at her. How does a fucking park ranger way out in the middle of Dicklick, Alaska come to have a $10,000 rifle? 14,000, she said, her schoolteacher's automatic reflex to supply the correct answer to a missed question. Oh, excuse me. $14,000 rifle. He said he needed it. Yeah, well, he's Looney Tunes, so I guess he needs all kinds of stuff. Like for shooting down airplanes and burning holes in people. He didn't shoot down the plane. That one of yours. He teach you how to fire a rocket? No. It wasn't us. So it's other poachers, hey. You want to think about that story? Because that's bullshit, lady. She realized that she didn't care if he believed her, he wanted to hurt her anyway, and kill Sloan. You wouldn't believe me. Probably won't. Amuse me anyhow. Who was it killed my guys and shot down a fucking plane? She waited for what seemed like a long time. Saw his jaw muscles flex. He was going to hit her. She said, there are beings from another world in the woods, hunting people. And bears. Regal stared at her as if she had slapped him, then started laughing. He looked at the other man, saw that he wasn't even smiling and laughed harder. I'm telling the truth, she said. They killed the two men who came after me, I saw it. Regal stopped laughing, his face turning hard. I get it. You're both bugfuck. Tell you what, sweetie, why don't you get moving again? I got no. Time for fairy tales. He motioned at her with his rifle and Mary started limping forward, no idea where they were headed. She was scared, but not as much as she had been before. After a while, it just, leveled off, somehow. She'd had some food and water, had gotten a little sleep she thought it was maybe late afternoon now and Sloane was out there, somewhere. Eventually, he'd go back to check on her. If she could keep her wits about her, if she could keep herself alive, if Sloane hadn't been killed by the creatures. If. Aliens. Regal watched Mary's old, but still tight and usable ass swing along in front of him, and shook his head. The way she'd said it, though. 
When she'd told him there were crazy poachers running around, the lie had been all over her face. When she'd said there were alien space hunters out there, butter wouldn't have melted in her mouth. Like she believed it. Convincing except for the part about it all being utter bulls hit. Aliens, Martin. Little green men from Mars. Who'd a thunk it? His. Mood had improved enough for him to be vaguely amused by her assertion. He was going to get laid, and she was going to help him get Sloan. Things could be worse. At least they were looking up. Martin was watching the trees as they moved, sweeping back and forth with the shotgun. No fucking alien killed Billy. No fucking alien killed anybody, Regal said. No why? Cause there ain't no fucking aliens. Just one crazy old ranger with some fancy toys and his bam bam nutso girlfriend. It was too interesting to let lie, though. So, you actually saw these things. What did they look like? Mary didn't answer. He was about to kick her again when she said, no. You said you saw them kill Mel and Danny. It was dark, she said. I heard it, though. And I saw the beams hit them. You saw the beams. Like a death ray, right? Regal grinned. It got better and better. So how do you know it was aliens, and not your boyfriend? Did he tell you about the scary monsters? Could have been him. I was with him when the plane was destroyed. We saw it. The rocket came from near the station. We were three or four miles away. But you didn't see old Gort cook the round off. Who's Gort? Martin asked. Gort, the robot. Klaatu's enforcer. Klaatu Barada Nikto. Martin shook his head. Don't mean nothing to me. Fucking illiterate. The day the earth stood still. Classic movie about men from outer space. Big robot, seven feet tall, had a death ray under his visor, disintegrated guns, tanks, coulda turned the whole planet into charcoal. Cool spaceship, a big flying saucer. You should check it out. He looked back at the woman. So, Mary, Mary, that what we have here? Some kinda star marshal come to punish the big bad poachers. Protectors of the bears and whales and shit? Again, she didn't answer, but he let it go. Hell, for all he knew, she'd been duped by Sloane. Maybe she was kicking herself right now, buying into his bizarre fantasies. Why didn't the monsters kill you? Martin asked. Mary shook her head. I'm not a threat, maybe. The charm was wearing thin, and too bad for her. There were three or four storage sheds near the ranger station. He thought one of them might make a good place to stick the girl literally and figuratively until Sloane decided to come looking. He and Martin could set up something. He had to whiz. He slung the stoner, nodded at Martin. Cover, he said. Hold up, Miss Mary. Time to bleed the lizard. She stopped turned back to look at him and her face went white when saw him unbuckling his pants. He grinned, pulled out his dick. Still looking at her, he started to piss. She looked away. Hey, Martin said. Regal turned his head, saw that his boy was holding still, watching the trees that bunched toward the river. Hey, I think I saw Dash. It was all he got out before something big and bright and too fast to see thundered from the green, hitting Martin in the guts. Regal stopped pissing. Martin screamed, the hoarse, shocked sound cut off in an instant as the fire spread across his torso. There was a loud hiss, the sound of burning hair and clothes and skin, all sizzling, and Mary let out a scream and started to run. You could smell Martin cooking. Like something left on the grill too long. Shit. 
Regal grabbed his pants and took off after the woman, his mind blank but for the urgent, overpowering need to haul ass, the panic to survive. He caught up with her, grabbed her arm, jerked her into a faster, lurching run, keeping her close, praying that Sloan wouldn't shoot and risk hitting her. They careened through the woods, tripping over roots and sticks, Regal aiming for the slope to the southwest, to put a goddamn mountain between me and whatever the fuck that was. There were no more shots, nothing but the sound of the woman's and his own ragged breathing, the constant drone of heat-drunk insects, the crunch of their branch-snapping escape. No sounds of pursuit. A half mile, and he couldn't drag her any further. He let her go. He unslung his rifle as she fell to the ground, both of them gasping. He crouched, caught his breath. Last thing on his agenda now was getting laid. Not without somebody to watch while he was busy. No sir, he wasn't that stupid. Dying in the middle of dipping his wick might be a great way to go when he was, like, 90, but not here, not now, not from a bullet in the back of the head while he was grinding away, no thank you very fucking much. He'd stashed the woman, he didn't need her slowing him down. Alone, in the woods, he'd be fine. Nobody to give him away, he'd find Sloan and kill him. Seeing Martin ripped apart by that fucking death ray had shocked him. Scared him, too, truth be told. Whatever it was that Sloan was packing was nasty shit, and he did not want to get in front of it. He was better in the woods than this old man, he'd already proved that by tracking him. If the old guy ever had any moves, he had lost a lot of steps. Regal was younger, fitter, better. He'd show the son of a bitch, and then he'd piss on the corpse when it was done. Sloan moved along the bear trail with care, his motions methodical, practiced, comfortable. Mosquitoes buzzed him, kept at bay by the bug dope, but he ignored them. It was amazing how fast it had all come back, as if the almost forty years had never happened. It wasn't a tropical jungle, and he wasn't hunting little men in black pajamas, but the feel wasn't all that different. A few times, he had been sent out to track down and dispatch enemy snipers, and a couple of them had been passing good. Russian or Chinese trained, weapons the equal of his own. But he had been better, or luckier, or both, and Charlie and Ivan and Wong had gone to the other side of life to meet whatever gods they worshipped in that tropical hellhole. Boss Winchester was adept. Knew something about hiding his trail, so that probably meant he knew something about finding sign and tracking. Sloan could move pretty well, put his feet places where he didn't leave obvious marks. He knew how to use water and trees, rocks, and he could make it really hard to trail him. Or he could make it really easy. That would be too obvious, but he could manage it so it'd look less so. Enough that somebody trying to find him could do it, but not think he had left marks on purpose. Too easy, it was a giveaway. Too hard, it wouldn't position a tracker the way he wanted. What he needed. That was Goldilocks looking for edible porridge, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. The poacher wasn't his only worry. He had no doubt that the monsters from outer space could follow a trail, too. So far, the off-world hunters had demonstrated some expertise at their game, so he had to assume that if they came across human sign, they would know it. Fine. Monster or poachers, it didn't matter. If he laid a trail properly, either one who happened across it looking for him, well and good. If he knew where he had been, then he knew where they would be if they were trailing him. If they were smart enough to figure out what he was doing, they might think to get ahead of him, but since they couldn't possibly know which way he was heading, that wouldn't be likely. He could make that part random every time he came to a place to turn. Flip a coin heads, go left, tails, right, if it lands on its edge, go straight ahead. He stopped to pee against the side of a tree. He'd installed a zipper in the ghillie suit at the crotch long ago, 
so he didn't have to use it like a diaper any more than he had to. The water would evaporate pretty quick, but somebody with a good sense of smell would notice the ammonia odor. A few meters down the trail, he left half a boot print on a patch of bare ground. He kept to the fur needles for another hundred meters, shifting his weight carefully so as not to disturb the humus, then brushed against a salmonberry shrub hard enough to dislodge some of the not-quite-ripe, just-turning orange fruit. Not much, but a good tracker would see those and know something had knocked them off the plant. He moved along that way for a mile or so, now and then leaving a partial boot print, or scuffing the fur needles, breaking a small branch. Enough to keep a tracker interested. He left the trail, going to his left, and worked his way down a gentle slope. Five meters away, he snapped a small branch in a hardwood sapling that jutted across his path, breaking it, and letting it hang down. Not readily noticeable on first pass along the bear trail, but easy to spot if you were looking carefully. Fifty meters away, he dug his right heel into some soft dirt. Ten meters past that, he squashed a fur cone into the ground. A follower wouldn't see right away where he had left the bear trail, but they would lose his sign, and eventually backtrack looking for it. If you were searching for sign off the trail, you'd see the broken branch, you were any good. You'd assume that your quarry was going downhill, looking for another bear trail or a place to camp, and you'd keep going. The heel print and half-buried cone would verify your suspicion. Probably you'd feel pretty pleased with yourself to have detected the sign. You might be thinking that you had it all over this old man, and that it would only be a matter of time until you caught him and squashed him. Just what Sloan wanted, if Boss Winchester thought that. After a quarter mile, Sloan came across a narrower animal trail. He turned right, made sure to leave marks a few meters away, and kept going. Eventually, he would find a place he liked, a spot where he could set up and see anybody coming along behind him. He didn't know exactly where it would be, but he would know it when he saw it. Picking your spot to shoot was one of the most important things a sniper learned how to do. Do it right, and your target wouldn't think to look that way. And with supersonic ammo, they'd never hear the sound of the round that zipped in and killed them. The hardest part was always in the decision to shoot or not, and once that was made, well in advance, the rest of it was almost paint by numbers. Yeah, it took some experience to know where and how to set up, how to put yourself in the place away from the spot most people would go. A SOSO guy who was looking for an ambush would look for a place he'd choose, and that's where he'd figure you were. A better guy would figure you wouldn't pick the best spot because that would be too obvious, a giveaway, and he'd look for a secondary position almost as good, and figure you were there. A real expert wouldn't look at any of that. He'd check out an area, and then he'd feel you, he'd know where you were. Sniper's ESP, they called it. The magic sense. Yeah, a bushwhacker could be there, or there, or over there, but that's not where he is. He's there, and all I have to do is hunker down and wait, and sooner or later, he'll move. And when I see him, I will take him out. It all came back and it settled back into him, old memories growing fresher with every step he took. Chapter 23 Mary and Regal walked, forever it seemed, skirting the river, cutting this way and that, the terrain rising in front of them. Mary trudged ahead of Regal, tired and aching. She felt shell-shocked by all the death she'd seen since coming here. Seeing another man killed by one of those creatures would come back to haunt her later, she was sure, but for now, she just wished she could sit down. Rest, sleep for a week, wake up to find it had all been a dream. Except to call out directions, Regal hadn't said a word to her since Martin had been killed and they had fled for their own lives. What would he say, anyway? He thinks I'm crazy. He hadn't seen what had killed any of his people. Which reminded her that neither had she. His suggestion that it was Sloane, fooling everyone, even her. 
she tried to consider that seriously, in between her painful, hopping steps. Her rational self wanted to embrace it, Sloane being insane made a lot more sense than killer aliens. Problem was, she absolutely didn't believe that he was crazy. There were things in the woods that didn't belong here. She believed that. And Sloane surely had not fired the weapon that knocked that plane from the air. So unless he had a confederate out there in the woods with weapons not of this earth, somebody else had. Something else had. She still didn't know Sloane's first name. She had slept with a couple guys in her party days, guys whose last names she'd never gotten, but never one who never even gave her a first name. She hoped she'd get a chance to ask him. They cut through a stand of trees and there was a real trail, staked and mostly clear. A moment later, they were at a weathered shed half buried in a stand of poplars, about the size of her apartment's bathroom. It wasn't locked. Regal looked inside, nodded. Honey, we're home. Get in. Mary hesitated, afraid. Was this it? Was he going to rape her now? Or just lock her up in a tiny, stifling shed in the middle of the woods? Both were horrible, but at least she'd be alive in the shed. He motioned with his rifle, his expression flat. Do it, Mary. You'll slow me down if I rake you with me, and I don't want to kill you. Yet. His gaze crawled over her body and Mary quickly stepped inside. The shed was cramped and hot and stank of grease. There were shelves lining three of its walls, packed with what looked like random pieces of snowmobile and truck engine. She saw a collection of jugs on the bottom left shelf, antifreeze, coolant, and one marked, water. She doubted it would taste good, but she was nearly overwhelmed by relief at the sight of it. She turned, looked at Regal. He smiled, a dark and chilly thing. You be good, Mary. I'll be back to play with you later. After I turn your psycho killer boyfriend into worm food. With that, he closed the door in her face, blocking out the light. She heard him fiddling with the clasp on the door, presumably sliding something through the lock, and a beat later, he was gone. She was alone in the warm darkness. She tried the door, just in case, but it wouldn't open. Maybe she could use a piece of machinery and batter her way out. The wood seemed pretty thick and solid, but it wasn't as if she had anything else she had to do. Something heavy, with a point or edge, maybe she could dig through the wood next to the door hinges, they were on the outside but she might be able to loosen them enough to get the door down. Yeah. She'd try that. First, though, she needed to rest. She was out on her feet, one of which hurt like it was on fire. She sat there was enough room for her to lie down, if she curled up a little and scooched over to the shelf with the water. Found the jug and drank deeply, wishing she could upend the container and deluge herself with the lukewarm water. She wanted a bath, a dry bed, she wanted to go home. She leaned against one of the rough shelves, and closed her eyes. She'd try and think of something, some plan, once she'd rested a few minutes. Waiting in the dark, maybe, to be rescued or raped and murdered, depending on who came back. Definitely, she needed to get out of here. There were tools here. Her cave-dwelling ancestors had killed mastodons and saber-toothed cats with sticks and rocks surely she could escape from a shed. What a man could build, a woman could tear down, right? Okay. She had a plan. She'd rest a bit, then get to it. Regal needed to be far enough away so he wouldn't hear her hammering, anyhow. A little rest, that would do it. Unless, of course, Sloane just appeared from out of nowhere like he had before. It bothered her, to feel so entirely dependent on a man. She knew that was ridiculous, considering the circumstances, she should be grateful that Sloane had the skills he did, and that he'd trouble himself to use them on her behalf, a woman he barely knew. Still, she couldn't help it. 
And thank you for screwing up my head, Great Aunt Daisy. The summer Mary had turned thirteen, her family had received a week-long visit from her mother's aunt, the strange and dynamic Daisy Huffman Jordan. Mary had never met her, although she knew the family stories, mostly overheard at holiday dinners. Daisy had been into free love before there was such a thing, she'd lived in a commune that made pottery, she'd worked at a café in France. Apparently, during a peace demonstration in the 60s, Daisy had punched out a Chicago policeman, and deemed it wise to leave the country for a while. She'd been in France for the last few years, married to some French vineyard owner who died and left her well off. Crazy Daisy, their own family's version of Auntie Mame. Daisy's trip home had been prompted by the news that her niece was pregnant again, after an interval of fourteen years. The woman had been nearly seventy, and recently widowed. Pretty happy about it, too. She had been funny and irreverent and prone to getting drunk on wine and imparting jewels of semi-questionable wisdom to Mary, much to the dismay of both her parents. Mary Bad loved her immediately. She'd never met Daisy again, she had returned to France and died there a few years later, thrown from a horse but she could still hear the old woman's bright and sardonic voice in her mind, giving her advice she'd always remember. Don't settle for almost, honey. Never be afraid to make an entrance, or an exit. Better to be remembered as a bitch than to be stepped on and forgotten. And the ongoing, constant message, ending every mini-sermon, never, ever turn responsibility for yourself over to some man, not even for a moment. You see, if there's one thing life has taught me, Great Aunt Daisy said, dragging in smoke from one of her near-constant unfiltered cigarettes, a glass of Merlot in the same bejeweled hand, it's that if you want to have any chance at all for a healthy self-respect, you'll never forget that it's your life you're living. You'll fall in love, of course, and you'll think, oh. Someone to take care of me, and that's just laziness, my dear. All it means is that you'll have someone else to blame when you realize you're not happy. And you'll never learn how to take care of yourself. The old woman had leaned in. Mary remembered being fascinated with Daisy's wrinkles, the way her face crinkled when she laughed. No nights on white horses, honey. Don't forget it. Young Mary had nodded soberly and had managed to remember it during every heartbreak she'd suffered through the years, until the original meaning had warped, become a kind of feminist dogma that kept her from letting anyone get too close. That was why her engagement with Brian had fizzled, in the end. She'd loved him, but he'd wanted her to need him, and she just hadn't been able to do it. Her pride had gotten in the way. Being lost in the woods, being hunted, well, that had simplified matters. She needed Sloane. If he decided not to take responsibility for her, she was dead, and yet even with the stakes so high, she still resented it, a little. Not him so much as herself, for having such hang-ups about it. I'm not too old to learn a thing or two, though, she told herself. If Sloane could get her out of this, she would be nothing but grateful. Maybe there were a few nights on white horses. So that was settled. She'd rest a little, and then she would try to break out of here, but if Sloane showed up and saved her the trouble, that would be okay with her. She could live with it. Regal didn't have a ghillie suit, but he had forest camo and he had been a hunter for a long while, way before he had done time in the joint. He had shot a lot of animals, some of them dangerous, some not, in a lot of places, at ranges from point blank which, technically, wasn't really in your face close, like most people believed, just close enough so you didn't have to adjust your sights for dropout to a few hundred yards, even. Maybe he wasn't as good a shot as this fucking ranger, but he was good enough. All he needed was one, and as long as he stuck to the woods and didn't wander out into the open, then Sloane wouldn't be able to outreach him. Of course, you had to risk the bears if you stayed in the forest, but shooting through the trees was harder than out on a plane. He had smeared camel paint all over his face and hands, 
and the stoner was matte black. He'd blend in well enough. Not that he was happy being the last poacher standing out here, all his guys dead and some sick fuck of a ranger hunting him, but it was definitely way past payback time. He didn't understand why Sloan had cut off their heads, but it was obvious the guy wasn't normal. Had to have fifty, sixty thousand bucks worth of shooting gear in that station. No forest ranger should even be able to afford shit like that, much less need it. Just Regal's luck to run into a psychotic forest ranger. Somebody left over from some war who never got past it. Somebody who was three bottles short of a six-pack. Maybe he really believed there were aliens running around, even as he slipped on his Bigfoot boots and made tracks. Kind of guy who was able to hide his own Easter eggs, maybe. Wonderful. Well, he was going to put Mr. Psychopath out of his misery first chance he got. And then he'd see to the woman, and get the hell out of Dodge. Once he took the ranger down, he'd have to eliminate the woman, might be that the Alaskan cops didn't know Sloan was nuttier than a truckload of pecans, or if they did, they didn't care. Cops were like that, their own came first, and Sloan might be up here dancing around in a tutu for all they gave a crap. Kill a cop, die yourself that seemed to be how they thought about things, and he didn't need little Miss Mary pointing a finger at him, nope, no way. After Sloan was gone, he'd have time to get it. On with her before he finished her off. Send her to join her psychotic boyfriend in crazy persons hereafter, and all's well that ends well, happy to get out alive. He knew he had to get rolling and get it done. Sooner or later, somebody was gonna come up here to check on the crazy ranger, and when that happened, the game was gonna get too interesting. If the ranger was dead, then Regal could hike out and not worry about being plinked. Or he could hitch a ride on the plane, smoke the pilot when they landed, and be long gone before anybody sorted it all out. Either way, Psycho Sloan and Mary Contrary needed to be out of the picture permanently. Which is why he was on the move. The woman would keep, she was not going to get out of that shed on her own, and while she might get a little hungry, she had enough water to last for a while. Regal knew he could find the guy, he had the skill. He'd learned it well in prison, had practiced it in three countries, woods, mountains, steppes, he was good at it. No matter how careful a man was, he couldn't move at any kind of speed and not leave sign. Regal would find it. He would track the ranger down, smoke him, and get gone. He had a good sense of direction, plus he had a compass, and he had been in this area long enough to get a feel for it. If he was the ranger, looking for a poacher, he knew where he'd start. Not the ATVs, cause Sloan had trashed those. And not the old campsites, no point in going back to those. Yeah, a greedy man might try to haul as many of the body parts away as he could carry, but it wasn't worth getting killed for. Sloan might think Regal was that stupid, but he didn't buy that. Nah, in Sloan's boots, he would figure just what Regal was thinking, run, fast and hard. There were only two choices long fucking hike, or stealing a ride with somebody come to call. Probably was, last person who had come to call had gotten himself turned into an instant fireball, and that could just as easily happen to the next crop duster passing by, long as Sloan was out there with his SAM or whatever kind of missile launcher it was. It was a toss-up, but since Sloan had given Regal and his crew a bad experience at the station, he might be leaning toward the idea that a smart poacher would be making tracks south. And if he was, he would want to get ahead of him, pick the most likely path, and set up for a shot. Least, that's how Regal would do it, if he were the ranger. So, all he had to do was crisscross the best animal trails heading south and look for sign. Once he found some, then he could stalk Sloan, circle around him, and beat him to the setup. Some risk, yeah, but that was the way of it, there wasn't any choice, not really. Even if he ran and made it out, bet your ass that Sloan and his girlfriend would blame him for the killings, 
and he wouldn't be here to say it wasn't so. All those dead bodies in the woods well, whatever parts the animals left and there'd be a major manhunt, with Regal the target, and it'd be shoot on sight. No, he had to clean things up or he'd spend the rest of his life looking over his shoulder. He wasn't going to do that. He had known guys who were on the run, and they were like roaches light shined on them anywhere, and they would haul ass for the nearest cover. Always afraid that knock at the door or a phone call, somebody looking crooked at them on the street would be it, the law coming to collect them. Guys had ulcers, nervous tics, they were twitchy. He wasn't gonna live like that. Clean it up, move on. There wouldn't be anything to connect him to it once he was gone. First the ranger, then the girl, and then, AMF. 24. Sloan found the place around four in the afternoon. It wasn't a clearing, that would be too obvious. If you were tracking somebody you knew would shoot you, you wouldn't just waltz across a big stretch of open ground with no cover, not if you had any brains at all. No, you'd take to the woods and skirt the dangerous spot, and you'd be real careful doing it. The trail began to wind its way upslope. After 500 meters of a gentle rise, it made a wide hairpin to the left, with a smaller branch continuing up the hill, while the larger path headed south, angling down again. Another 500 meters down, the trail began to angle away, with the bottom leg going down four or 500 meters to a stream that he'd seen off and on for the last couple of clicks. Along with the winding turns, the trees, which were mostly old growth, grew larger. They were bigger, but there were fewer of them, the trunks farther apart, and the big shade and piled, deep needles had kept the undergrowth down. What this meant was, you could leave the trail and move into the trees, set up, and see the entire loop of the trail pretty well, ascending and descending. A man climbing the path most likely wouldn't notice the descending section until he had made the loop at the uphill branching and started down again. If you were following sign, you might not be looking far enough ahead to realize the danger the trail in front of you would be clear and going in the opposite direction, you might not realize it until you made the loop. Cutting sign, you had to pay close attention. And a man following Sloan wouldn't live to get to the loop. Sloan moved carefully into the old growth, until he was 300 meters away from the closest path, 500 away from the ascending leg. He turned around and looked for his marker tree. It was an old habit, marking trees, went way back to the days when your rangefinder needed a scale, if you knew the height of an object, you calibrated on that. Now, there were some really good ones that used lasers or ultrasound or infrared he had a Vectronix PLRF, a set of their vector for binoculars, and the Chaytax built in, so he was triple redundant. He had passed a tree on his way up the hill, and mentally marked a knot on the side that was his height. Some guys would have shaved a little bark off, so you could see it, but Sloan knew better. An alert enemy sniper would see that, know what it was. And if you weren't already lined up, duck and cover. Back in the day, knowing the height of the mark, all you had to do was dial it in on your finder, sharpen the offset images until they matched, and you had the distance. Close enough for government work. Now. The laser models nailed it to centimeters, plus or minus, point and look, no effort at all. You could bounce the beam off somebody's shirt button and know exactly how far away that was. And there were scopes that automatically adjusted themselves to match the finder's distance. Point, touch a button, and soon as the target sharped up, pull the trigger. More important than any rangefinder, of course, was the ability to properly estimate the distance yourself. If your $3,000 laser finder malfunctioned, or you lost your backpack with the binoculars and handheld, you'd have to eyeball it. He liked to use the rifles built in, just because that's what he'd be shooting with, but before he lit it to look, he did a slow take. Aloud, he said, 490. Through the scope, the range came back. 492 meters. He grinned. 
a booth length shy at a hundred meters. Not bad for an old guy's eyes. The spot he'd picked to set up was near the base of a huge dug fir. Somewhere along the way, Sloane had learned that the trees were named after a Scottish botanist, who was credited with cultivating the tree in Europe in the early 1800s. Douglas somebody, obviously. This tree was maybe 85 or 90 meters tall, and 3 meters around, big enough to stop anything either the poacher or the spaceman could throw at him, he figured. There was a little mound of dirt and fir needles bunched up over a root 2 meters from the base, and that was where he would set up. He took a break. Peed, had some dried fruit and nuts from his pack, drank half a bottle of water. Once he got into position, he wouldn't move again until it was dark. He didn't know if the alien things could see that well at night, but he knew the human poachers didn't, and wouldn't be working the trail then. He could roll behind the tree and sleep for a few hours, get set up again before dawn. Nobody would follow him here he had been sure not to leave any sign once he left the trail. As he chewed on a piece of fruit leather, he nodded to himself. This was that as good a place as he was going to find. He had the best weapon and technology money could buy. He knew somebody was coming, and he had scraped at least some of the rust off his old skills. Could be a lot worse. As he lay there, he considered the situation with Mary. That had been unexpected from the get-go. He hadn't had a connection with a woman in a long time, you didn't count the visits to the massage parlor in Fairbanks every few months. Happy ending, they called it, but it wasn't so happy, just a release of pressure, no real joy in it. He paid for a service, they delivered it, end of transaction. He had thought he was getting past that, man his age, but had been surprised to feel how strong the desire had been, and how good it felt to satisfy it for himself and for being able to do it for her. Fear fucking. Maybe. But it seemed more than that. If they survived all this, maybe they could see how it felt without the specter of death lurking outside. Or not. But in the moment, it had been a great experience, for him, at least. He didn't like complications in his life, he had been on his own for too many years to think about what being with somebody else would really entail, but it might be worth giving some serious thought. He liked her. And the sex had been as good as any he'd ever had. Something to think about while he was lying here in the woods, waiting to kill a man. Regal lost the sign and went maybe a quarter mile before he was sure he had lost it. He backtracked, carefully, and spotted the broken branch down the hill. The old man must be tired, he had gotten less careful. If Regal hadn't seen that branch, he might have spent hours looking for sign, maybe longer. Eventually, he'd have found something, but this made it easier. If the ranger was tired, then chances are he'd follow the downhill slope, so Regal worked his way down slowly, looking. A heel print, there. A little farther, there a fur cone squashed into the ground. Regal grinned. The old man sixty or so, according to the ID back at the station hadn't figured on somebody with Regal's ability to track him. Of course, maybe Sloan wasn't worried about him so much. There was the woman's story about the little green men from Mars running around. Regal laughed aloud, softly. Right. What she thought that story would fly. That he would believe her. Trying to scare him away with boogeymen. Christ, he wasn't born yesterday. No, the only monster running around out here was Sloan. Guy had a fucking arsenal at the station, and for what? That many guns, he had some kind of screw loose, and Regal figured he must have cooked his brain back in the Vietnamese jungles all those years ago, never made it back to civilization. He'd heard about guys like that, living in the woods in the Pacific Northwest, in Canada, and for sure up here in the Yukon. Antisocial, still fighting the Viet Song in their heads. Like that Jap they found on some. 
Island in the Pacific 50 years after World War II was over, still hiding out and thinking the Americans were looking for him. Well, Sloan's mental state didn't matter, because pretty soon, he was going to be dead, game over, end of story. The signs were fresh, no more than a few hours old, Regal reckoned. Sooner or later, the old guy would have to stop and take a break, and he'd catch him. He'd cook the ranger and that would be the name of that tune. He'd go back and finish the woman. Either way, this party was getting close to being finished, and it was Moe's death time to leave. Sloan, like a lot of snipers, was able to split his attention. Part of him was vigilant, the electronic hearing amplifiers feeding him the sounds of the wind in the trees, of small creatures who had been lulled by his lack of motion, of his own heartbeat. He watched the ascending trail, not needing the scope to see it, marking anything that moved, his gaze drawn to any motion. Trees blowing, a ground squirrel, birds. Another part of his mind wandered, strolling down memory lane, or working out things he needed to deal with. A hot summer at the old swimming hole in Texas where he had seen his first naked girl, both of them fourteen, shaded right into a memory of Mary as they hiked out to see where her brother had died. Or how she had touched him. At sixty, he was on the downhill run, past middle age and going faster all the time. Yeah, he kept in shape, but it was only a matter of time, a few years, when he wouldn't be able to do this job anymore, when the risk of falling and breaking something would worry his bosses so they would cut him loose. Then what? He didn't see himself sitting on a front porch in Fairbanks or Anchorage, watching passers-by as his vision dimmed and his hearing faded. Parked, and dwindling away. Problem was, he had never expected to live this long. He should have died too many times back in the jungle, and since he hadn't, it was all borrowed time. As it ran down, the idea of how to finish it was a question. Maybe the AA people had it right, one day at a time. Don't worry about ten years down the road, because you might fall and break your neck tomorrow. Or get pie inked by a poacher. Or get death rayed by a spaceman and your skull taken home and put on a trophy wall, this one. Ah, uh, yeah, the omen. Killed Bog and Mang and Shand, this one did before I bagged him. Died well. Here, let me show you the giant bear. Any of those things could happen. Mary might be safe or she might end up dead, no use in going down the what if road with her in mind. If he survived, if she was alive, if she felt something for him. If, if, if. Too many to calculate. Better to leave it alone, and concentrate on right now. Otherwise, there wasn't going to be any tomorrow. Still. It was hard not to think about it. A few days ago, his life was one thing, now, it was something else. You had to try and sort it out. Regal was beginning to feel pretty cocky. Given that this was somebody who must have been a sniper in his day, and who had been a forest ranger, this old man was not very good at hiding his trail. It wasn't exactly easy, but it didn't take as much work as Regal would have thought coming into it. Sloan had come across a smaller animal trail and turned onto it, and the sign led north. Sometimes Regal had to go a couple hundred meters before he found sign, but he always did. You'd think a guy like this would be better at it. Yeah, you would. What if he is? That stopped him, that thought. What if you aren't the hot shit tracker you think you are? What if old Sloan is leaving you breadcrumbs, just enough of them so you can stay with him, on fucking purpose? He hadn't really considered it. Was that how it was? Okay, so probably that wasn't how it was. A lot of guys wouldn't be able to find the ranger's trail, he knew that. But what if the ranger wasn't clumsy? What if he figured his tracker was good enough to stay with him and he was counting on it? In that light, if the ranger wasn't just an old fart who wasn't paying enough attention, then that meant he was expecting a tail. 
And if he was, then he would be somewhere up there with that fucking tack driver of a rifle, waiting. Might have the scope on you right now, Regal boy. Regal felt a sudden urge to take a dump and to drop to the ground and hug the dirt, both right this fucking second. He didn't do either. If the ranger had him in the crosshairs, that wouldn't do him any good, he was a dead man. After what seemed like hours, he began to breathe regularly again. He could be wrong about this, he knew. But even if he was wrong, getting off the trail and keeping to concealment as much as he could wasn't a bad idea. If he was wrong, it wouldn't hurt anything. If he was right, it might keep him from getting his ass shot off. On balance, there was no contest. He moved into the brush. He'd have to be more careful, a moving bush would alert a watcher. But if Sloan was set up to shoot, he'd have to find the right place to make sure he had a clear shot, and this wasn't it. The trick was, Regal would have to find the place in Sloan and set up his shot without being seen. Yeah. He could do that. Now that he realized how it might be. It was late, but not close to dark. Another two hours, maybe, Sloan figured. He wanted to get up and stretch, go pee again, get something to eat, but he would wait. Motion drew attention, and while he didn't think there was anybody close enough to see him, save some small critters who had tuned him out, there was no point in taking the risk. He watched the trail. Listened. Waited. Boss Winchester out there would have to tidy the place up before he left, and Sloane was too big a loose end. Maybe Winchester didn't know about the alien predators, but he knew Sloane would put out the word about him. Be the easiest way to explain the dead folks and bears, that a team of poachers had some kind of falling out and turned on each other. Got greedy, maybe had some old grudges, whatever, and, here's what the leader looks like. Mary had seen them, too, there'd be two eyewitnesses who could ID him. Cases might get cold, but there was no statute of limitations on murder. In Winchester's shoes, Sloane knew what he would do, and that would be to make sure nobody was left here who could point a finger at a lineup and say, yeah, that's him, right there. So he'd be coming, unless he wasn't thinking right, and you never depended on that. You assumed if you were playing chess with somebody. He wasn't going to make any mistakes, and ran your game accordingly. You could hope the other guy would screw up, but you couldn't bet on it. Especially when the game involved life or death. Chapter 25 Regal had been looking for places where he would have set up to plink somebody following him. He had seen a couple, and worked his way around them carefully. He found a clearing near a stream, where somebody might go down the narrow trail to get a drink. Plenty of animal prints in the mud next to the water deer, bear, rabbit, even a wolf or coyote or maybe a big fox. If Regal spotted a perfect site, then chances are Sloane wouldn't be there, a smart guy, even one who was old and who had gotten rusty, wouldn't make that mistake. He'd be somewhere else, watching, hoping a tracker would see the perfect spot and zero in on it. No sign that Sloane had veered off toward the clearing. There were a few long and relatively straight stretches on the trail, hundred meters or more, and he'd kept to the trees, staying low and moving slow, stopping and freezing every few meters. Nobody there. He came across black bear scat less than an hour old. Heard what sounded like a bigger bear in the woods, not too close, but not too far away. Scratching its back on a tree, maybe, and grunting. Or maybe getting it on with a female. Sloane could have left the trail, that was a possibility. And the only way to know would be to check for sign there, but Regal didn't want to risk it. As long as there weren't any branches, he was going to assume that the ranger would use the animal path. Might be wrong, but there it was. Something caught Regal's attention. A sound? An odor? Something out of the corner of his eye? He didn't know for sure, but he dropped flat and didn't move. Now he was sure that he heard something, 
could feel the ground vibrating under him. A bear. Something moving on the trail ten meters away. There were some scrub bushes and salmonberries between him and the path. He risked a quick glance. Didn't see anything. Whoever it was, moved off. Too heavy for Sloan, and if it was a bear, it didn't see him or catch his scent. Whatever it was, it probably saved his ass. As he was about to stand, he caught a glint to his left and upslope a little. Sloan. He couldn't see him, but that had probably been a reflection off an optic, a scope lens. All right. Sloan would be dug in, and all he had to do was circle around behind him, spot him, and pot him. It was getting late, gonna be dark soon, but it wouldn't take long, fifteen or twenty minutes. Plenty of light to make the shot. Sloan was tired, feeling sleepy. Another hour, maybe a little less, it would be dark. He'd take a break then. Unzip the ghillie suit, cool down, take a nap. He thought he heard something, but whatever it was, he didn't hear it again. Didn't see anything. Another hour, then he'd move. Regal circled, slowly enough to be careful, but quickly enough to leave himself light for the shot. He knew about where Sloan had to be, he had marked the particular tree, so it was just a matter of getting to a position where he could see. He was in camo, Regal knew that, and he'd be still, so he'd be hard to spot, but he had to move sooner or later. Might take all night, but that was okay. He knew about where he was, and he'd make certain, sooner or later. There was the sound again, and to Sloan, it sounded like somebody taking a cautious step, putting his foot down carefully, but not completely quiet normal hearing would have missed it, but with the headphones turned up, he could hear a mouse fart, and somebody was skulking around out there. He couldn't tell exactly where, the earphones weren't directional in the same way his own ears were, but it wasn't too far away, whoever it was. Or whatever it was. Sloan didn't move. He was invisible, as invisible as he could be. His suit had leaves and branches stuck into it, his back and legs were covered with fur needles. From above, he'd look like he was part of the ground. The footfalls definitely not a four-legged animal's walk were closer, still hesitant. A man. Or a monster. He stayed frozen. He didn't think whoever it was had seen him for sure, or that it knew exactly where he was. The sounds weren't coming directly toward him, they were angling back and forth. Looking for him. Not sure where he was. He considered pulling his revolver out. Something up close, the rifle would be awkward and the handgun better suited. But he didn't want to risk even that much movement, nothing to catch a hunter's attention. He was a bush, a rock, harmless, invisible. Regal reached a spot 200 meters away from the target's tree. Still didn't see the ranger, but he knew he was there, he was sure of it. He dialed in the scope, looking. Light was starting to go gray. He didn't see Sloan. He knew what he was looking for, but there was nothing there but brush and fur needles. Fuck. The footfalls stopped. Sloan heard a sound then he couldn't identify. A chittering, kind of tongue-chattering thing, soft and close. Something like cicada, but bigger, louder, deeper. Sloan felt a cold rush envelope him. The off-world hunter. It knew he was here, somehow. Slowly, very slowly, Sloan turned his head to he left. Just in time to see the air shimmer five meters away and the spaceman materialize from nothing. There was a snick and Sloan saw the twin blades on the back of its right forearm extend and lock into place. The thing was looking right at him. It made a noise, said something guttural and jagged, and spread its arms wide. It meant to slice him up with those knives. Sloan knew the thing could cover the ground between them before he could swing the chaytak around in time. And his revolver was safety strapped, 
but he had to go for it. Regal saw Sloan appear out of nowhere, a couple meters to the left in the scope's field, totally unexpected, like he'd just shot up from the ground. Fuck. He didn't hesitate. He swung the scope over, crosshaired center of mass, and fired three times one two three, and saw the man go down. Yes, motherfucker, I gotcha. But even as Sloan fell, Regal realized it wasn't right. Too big, too fucking big that wasn't Sloan, it was. What the fuck was it Dash? He looked. Couldn't make sense of it, and then, in a heartbeat, realized who it was. What it was. Holy shit. She wasn't lying. It wasn't a man he just shot, it was, holy shit Dash. Sloan saw the hunter collapse, heard the sound of the three rounds, saw the muzzle flash in the dimming light, up and back, 200 meters away. He rolled over and turned around, reset his prone position, rifle ready, facing the shooter. He put the scope in front of his eye, focused it. There. A man behind a rifle. Looking through his scope. Regal was still thinking about killing a fucking space alien when he caught the motion to the right of the dead thing. He moved the scope a hair. Saw Sloan, in a ghillie suit, looking up at him through the Chaytak scope. Oh, fuck Dash. He put his finger on the trigger. Hurry, hurry Dash. Too late. Regal's world flashed red and went black. The sound of his shot was damped to a snap by the hearing protectors. He knew it was good without needing to check but he looked anyway. Sloan came to his feet to see the downed hunter twitching. Still alive. He left the Chaytak on its bipod and pulled his revolver, took a step closer but not too close. The twitching was pretty much all the thing had left. At least two rounds had hit in the chest and the blood pumping out looked almost a phosphorescent green in color. As he watched, the thing managed to turn its head to face him. It said something, a harsh, buzzing, clicking sound. It reached for something on its wrist with a clawed hand, but before it could do anything else, it shuddered, and Sloan heard its death rattle. It went limp. Well. Another hunter gone, and the last of the poachers to thank for it. How weird was that? Not done yet. Take care of business, Marine. Sloan headed up slope. It took a minute to make the climb, and he was tired when he got there. He looked at the dead poacher. His shot had hit the man just over his right eye, and most of the back of his head was gone, a goodly portion of his brain blown out the exit wound. He bent down, went through the man's pockets. Found a wallet. Couple thousand dollars in it, in hundreds, but more importantly, ID. Regal, the man's name had been if the ID was valid. Sloan stuck the wallet into a pocket. He'd give it to Dietz with the story when he saw him. Assuming he survived. That he was still here was pure luck. If the spaceman hadn't popped into view, Likely it would be Sloan who would have died the poacher had sneaked up on him, and Sloan hadn't known. Either the hunter or the poacher would have gotten him. The dead guy was better than Sloan had thought. Yeah. He was getting old. But he still had some luck, and every sniper knew it was better to be lucky than good. There were no more poachers, but there was still at least one of the predator things, and maybe it was out there, close by. Invisible and planning to stay that way. Getting dark soon, and not the best time to travel, but it was the lesser of two possible evils here. Time to go, Sloan. Chapter 26 Mary was at the beach on a sunny day, Santa Monica, lots of people littering the sand like brightly colored toys. There were kids running around, a few of her own students were there there were pretty California girls in thong bikinis, college boys and weightlifters and old people, all enjoying the summer heat, courting skin cancer. 
She hoped they were wearing sunblock, but some of them were too tan. There was a good-looking black man she recognized, muscular, in a bathing suit, a towel around his neck. What was his name? The guy who used to be on L.A. Law, and that comedy show with What's Your Name, the girl who had been on Seinfeld. Bruce? Blair, that was it, Blair something. He was walking along with a striking black woman about 35, and another black man who was a little older who was laughing and gesturing, talking about something called Casanegra. And wait. Wait there was the governator himself all buff and grinning, but wearing a purple zoot suit, which didn't even seem that strange at the beach, after all it was SoCal. And, wasn't that Ringo Starr? She was lying in the sand, relaxed and calm, watching the parade of famous people walk by and then suddenly she was under the sand, and she was suffocating, suffocating, the heat and pressure smothering her, raking her air. No one would get to her in time. She was going to die in the dark, buried and gone, why didn't somebody help her dash? She woke up gasping, panicking it was dark and hot, she still felt like she couldn't breathe and remembered where she was. She clutched around for the water jug, found it, took a few swallows. It didn't help much, she was sweating it out faster than she could drink it and already the bottle was lighter, maybe a third of it gone in the three, four five. Maybe, she had no way to tell hours she'd been locked up but she didn't know what else to do to keep herself from passing out. She lay back down the dirt floor wasn't cool, but it wasn't too bad and wondered how long it would be before she ran out of water. Wondered how bad the death would be. She remembered reading somewhere that the tongue swelled up. No. Hell with that. She had her tool, some kind of metal rod, as big around as a broom handle, maybe a foot long. One end was smooth, the other end had a gear on it, and a kind of point past the toothed sprocket thing. She wrapped a piece of what looked like old t-shirt around the smooth end to cushion it, gripped it tightly, and started hammering with the point against the wood of the door about where she figured the top of the lock had to be. She had worked at it for an hour before she was exhausted and had to quit, and there was a crater in the wood, deep enough she could press her thumb into it and have the thumbnail be level with the wood. It might take her another hour, two, three, whatever, but she would punch through it eventually and she'd be able to reach the hasp and knock out whatever Regal had used to lock her in. Whatever it took however long it took. Someone rattled at the door. Fuck. He was back. She moved next to the door, held the piece of metal over her head. It wasn't much of a plan, but she didn't have anything else. Hit him in the head, run. Hit him, run. He'd kill her if she couldn't knock him out, shoot her in the back, maybe, as she stumbled away. Terrible, but not so terrible as being raped and then shot in the face, I can do this, hit him, run. The door creaked open, barely a half inch, and the air that streamed into the shed was wonderful, amazing, the light horrifically bright. She raised the chunk of metal. Sweat ran down her back. Mary. Sloan. She was so committed to knocking Regal's skull in that she couldn't move for a half second. Then she dropped the engine part, her knees suddenly weak. Yes, she said, and the door opened further, cool air rushing in like a godsend, and there he was. You okay? Better than a minute ago, she said, and she didn't care that he was holding his big rifle, that his weird suit made him look like a bush with a head sticking out. She buried herself against him for a moment, taking comfort from the contact in spite of the branches and needles crushed between them. Sloane put an arm around her, returned the awkward hug. Regal, she asked. I got him. And I found what was left of the other one tracking you here. He looked at her, his expression serious. I was worried about you. She nodded, felt tears coming, the first since she'd realized she was. Lost was it only this morning? 
She felt absurdly touched by his simple declaration, by his honesty. Thank God, thank God it's over. We need to get moving. You think you can walk, I rig up some kind of crutch. Why? There's at least one more hunter out there, he said. It's going to be really pissed off and looking for me, I figure, but I'm guessing it won't stray too far from this area. Its ship has to be around here somewhere, or maybe the drop point, whatever. There's a radio relay station about 20 miles south of us, has a small airstrip. We get there, maybe we can call out, tell somebody to get there, to pick you up. Pick me up. What about you? You're not coming back. Not until I'm sure you're on your way out, he said. He hesitated, added, maybe I'll even go with you. Really? Regal almost potted me. If he hadn't, the hunter would've. I was lucky, and that kind of luck doesn't hold up indefinitely. Maybe I might need some help. I can walk, she said. She would crawl out if she couldn't walk. She thought leaving was about the best idea she'd ever heard. I'm really glad to see you, she added, and hugged him again. Maybe the nightmare wasn't quite over but she wasn't alone anymore, and that made all the difference. And if she was going to have to struggle through twenty miles of Alaskan wilderness, dodging an alien attack, she couldn't think of a better person to be with. He didn't like risking the station, but depending on how well Mary's ankle held up, they'd be camping two, three nights, and they'd need more than he had in his pack. It would be getting dark soon. He'd hoped to be farther gone by now, but Mary getting moved hadn't been in the original plan. They approached the station from the back, Sloane quieting Mary as they got closer. The place felt empty, but they waited for a while to be sure. Eventually, he hurried them inside, sent Mary to get into the boxes of Freeze-dried rations while he checked his cabinet. He returned the weapons he'd collected from the exposures, those they'd stolen from him, ignoring the near-reflexive need to break them down and clean them. The lock was busted, but the hunter wasn't going to be breaking into his shit. And the chances of anyone else stumbling through here before he got back were slim to none. If you get back. Taking too long already. He quickly put together another pack for Mary, keeping it light, and met her at the supply closet. They loaded up, Sloane taking most of the gear. On the way out, he stopped long enough to dig out his winter walking staff from the closet in the entry. He gave it to Mary. Bears will be out and about, he said. I don't know how these things track, but I'm counting on other big mammals running around to make things confusing. Follow my lead if we run into one, and stay behind me. You talked me into it. I want you to carry this, he said. He handed her a .38 snub nose, a SNW chief. She shook her head. No. You don't have to shoot anybody. It makes a big noise, though. Might scare a bear off. Revolvers are pretty simple. There's no safety on this one, they don't usually jam. He held it out to her, but first. It's loaded. All you have to do is pull the trigger. Still, she didn't take it. No. I can't. I don't understand. It's a tool, Mary, he said. Considering the circumstances, one you may actually need. If you're careful, Use common sense, there's nothing to be afraid of. I don't want it, she said. He looked at her, puzzled. She took a deep breath. She had kept it out of her mind for so long, it didn't want to come out, but he waited, and she finally reached for it, reluctance all over her face. I told you my parents died in a car wreck when Paul was young. Ah uh ha. -huh. That's not true. They were shot to death. He frowned. I'm sorry. There's more. They were fighting, bashing each other, throwing things. The marriage was going down, 
and they had gotten more and more violent. I wasn't there, but Paul was. He didn't say anything, waiting. My father had a gun in his bedside table. Paul found it. He tried to get them to stop fighting. Ah, God, he said. He knew where this was going. Yeah, but apparently, God was busy somewhere else. Paul shot them. They both died right there in front of him. He was eight years old. Sloan shook his head, but didn't say anything. He blocked it out, somehow. Completely. But I couldn't quite do that. I put it away as best I could, I don't think about it, but I can't use a gun, Sloan. Do you understand that? I'll put it in my pack, but I can't use it. Sloan nodded. Okay. You don't have to shoot anybody. But you can make a noise with it, if we get separated. The sound might help me find you. And it might help something else find me. He sighed. He only wanted her to have it in case something happened to him. I don't want this creature to kill you, she said. Maybe if you were unarmed, it wouldn't. They could have killed me several times, but I wasn't armed. I think that's why they spared me. Sloan nodded again. The thing had likely watched him zap at least one of its hunting buddies, if not two, he doubted very much if it gave a shit whether or not he was armed, at this point. He could understand how she felt, but he wasn't her. I don't want it to kill me, neither, but I'm also not looking to be bare chow, or to have a new home in a trophy case on some planet under a blue sun. Trust me on this. If we get clear, fine, otherwise, it's going to be him or us, and I want the firepower to make sure it's him. She was worried, and she was right to be. But this was his thing, and she knew it. Sloan could feel it waiting out there, somewhere. He hoped they could be out of its range before it spotted them, but he just didn't know. What he did know was that walking outside without a weapon wasn't going to happen. If it wanted him, it would come for him. When it did, he'd try to be ready. Chapter 27 Mary could feel the weight of the revolver in her pack as they started south, heavy as a bowling ball, it seemed. She'd never use it. The idea it was in her pack made her feel physically ill. It had helped a little to tell Sloane about it, but that hadn't changed how she felt at her core. Her parents, however awful they had become, were dead, killed by her brother, using a gun. That had been part of her life for more than twenty years. A gun was never the answer, it was always the problem. The sun finally dipped below the horizon enough to make the going rougher. The small rustlings of unseen animals was slightly nerve-wracking, but Sloane didn't seem worried. Sloane kept quiet, often stopping her with an upraised hand to listen, sometimes looking through his scope in one direction or another. Once, he deliberately rattled some bushes and stomped, jumping up and down. A half-second later, they'd heard a crashing, something big moving off into the dark perhaps a hundred feet away. It was impressive, seeing someone so tuned into his surroundings and deeply gratifying, considering she possessed no such skill. Her ankle was doing okay. Not great, but the walking staff proved to be a big help, she'd eaten enough ibuprofen to knock a horse out. She held the stick at her left side, leaning on it and doing a little hop when she had to put her right foot down. It was awkward but a lot less painful, and she developed a rhythm, of sorts. She kept thinking that she'd start to feel relieved, the farther they traveled from the hunter's grounds, but Sloane was watchful and careful, not at all relaxed, and the strange and horrible burning deaths she'd witnessed over the last couple of days were finally settling into her memory. So much horror. Her mind kept replaying them, apparently determined to get them as detailed as possible before filing them away. The screams of pain, the hiss of flesh burning, of moisture being boiled away in an instant. The smell of something like cooked pork and smoldering hair. 
Not a death she would wish on any person but she wasn't sorry that any of them had died either, and she couldn't even work up any guilt at feeling that way. They'd been bad men, poachers, kidnappers, would-be rapists. She didn't know if they'd deserve to die, but she wholeheartedly believed that she didn't deserve to die at their hands. She hobbled along, still bothered that she was carrying a weapon, that she'd come to depend on a man who lived by them and more bothered still that her lifelong belief in gun control, her rock-bottom convictions about violence and the kinds of people who indulged it, had been so completely shaken. If I'd had a gun, when those men found me, or when Regal touched me, no, not even then would she have used it. She felt like she understood Sloane a little better, though. She remembered thinking that he was being paranoid, when they'd gotten to Paul's campsite and he'd suggested they circle back a different way. And again, when he'd taken out his big rifle and given her the whole not in my backyard speech, she'd half written it off as macho bullshit. It's real, though, she thought, carefully stepping over a raised route that he pointed out. Real and considering the environment, completely valid. He was careful and committed to his work and highly skilled, and he'd saved her life at least twice so far, and she was damned grateful for it. Did that mean she approved of guns, or killing? Of course not she could never do that. But the black and white had fuzzed some, and she couldn't find a way to condemn Sloane's attitude and be thankful for it at the same time. There was a shade of grey she had never seen before. That bothered her, but there it was. And how did she feel about Sloane, as a man? A lover? More jumbled emotions. If he was a knight, his horse was certainly not white, his armor rusty, and his violence. Hard to reconcile that with how tender he had been with her in that cave, how sweet he had felt pressed against her. They hiked on through the murky light, her thoughts no less murky about all this, gaining distance, and after a while, Mary started to let herself hope that it really was over. She could sort all the rest of this out later, if there was a later. They were actually covering more ground than Sloane had expected. His theory, that the hunter wouldn't stray too far from its territory, was as much hope as logic. No way to know how big that territory was, either. 4. All he knew, the last alien was about to blow up half of Alaska to bury its tracks. Or maybe it was gone already, had collected the bodies of its hapless buddies and headed home. No, that was too much to hope for. It was still around, it would be looking for him. Running wasn't his first choice, but there was Mary to consider and he didn't know what kind of technologies the creature had access to, but doubted very much that it would have too much trouble finding them, if it wanted to. Run or stand ground, either way, he thought he'd be seeing it again. At least he understood more about why she hated guns and violence so much. And he could actually feel sorry for her brother. No wonder the man had been so screwed up. Killing your own parents. That would warp anybody. If the thing got him, he hoped Mary would be able to find her way to the station. If he didn't end up on top, he hoped she would get away. She had the compass, their packs, and knew they were headed south. He thought she'd be okay. They'd walked through most of the brief night before he stopped them, checking a small clearing in a stand of white spruce. A bear had nested there during the heat of the day, bedding down in a crush of boughs and undergrowth. Sloan pointed out a few of its tracks, some tufts of hair. They sat on their packs, Sloan fishing out a light snack, trail mix, water, jerky. The bear won't come back, will it? Mary asked. Might, Sloan said. We're not too far from the river here, and there are a lot of berries in this area. It's a good spot. Not tonight, though. It's more of a day bed. You're not afraid of them, are you? Bears? No, not really. Respect them, sure. 
They're big and they have teeth and claws. But they're actually fairly predictable, in their own way. Reclusive, mostly. They want to protect their food, their babies, and their personal space. Long as you don't mess with them, they'll generally go out of their way to avoid a fight. Mary stared off into space a moment, thinking about her brother. Funny story, about the biggest bear ever shot in this area, he said. Guy named Parker, about 80 miles west of here. He's on Dietz's mail. Run. He woke up one night, heard someone in his kitchen. Turns out a brown bear was going through his freezer. It had come in through the back door. Had its snout buried in a bucket of ice cream when he walked into the kitchen, and he shot it, right on the spot. Turned out to be a record. They had to take out his back door and a couple of kitchen cabinets just to haul the thing out, had to hook a line to a truck. Not many people can say they shot a record bear in their kitchen. She understood he was trying to lighten the mood. Not that killing something was the best tale to do that. She managed a tired smile. A, for effort, maybe a, D, for content. Call it a, C plus, and let it go. You ready to move? Not for a week, she said, but hauled herself to her feet, taking a final swig of water before handing him the bottle. She looked tired, but game. He thought they should try to get another couple hours in, at least, before looking for a place to bed down, and that's when he heard it, when they both heard it that chittering sound, deep and guttural, echoing down from one of the ridges just east of them. It was close. And it was letting them know it. Been moving alongside us, probably. His near certainty, that he'd have to face the last hunter, was confirmed. The only question now was whether he or it would make the first move. He had to decide, now. He looked at Mary. You stay here. She stood up. No way. I'm coming. It doesn't want you. Stay here, and if I'm not back in a couple hours. Dash. Fuck that, she said. Her cheeks were high with color, he could see it even in the shadowy dark. I won't get in your way, but I'm not staying here. You could get hurt. She laughed. You're kidding, right? What else is new? No time to mince words, not if you wanted to have any chance. You'll slow me up. Distract me. I'm not staying here, she said again. You don't have time for this. Stay back, as far back as you can, he said. Keep your pack but don't take out the revolver. You hear weapons of any kind, get down and stay down. He didn't wait for her response, only turned and started jogging east. He thought it very unlikely that he'd be alive much longer, but he wasn't going to go out without at least trying to make that last SOB sorry he'd picked Sloane's territory to fuck around in. Mary hurried, but lost Sloane within a few minutes, when they hit the rise that rapidly sloped up to the low ridge. It was a climb, and he didn't have to struggle with a bum ankle and a walking stick she plodded on, searching the shadows ahead of her for some sign of him. She could hear him for a moment, and then the faint rustlings faded out, too. Leaving her alone in the dark. For a moment, she doubted her decision but no, she was being proactive, God damn it, she wasn't going to sit around and wait to see what happened next. Maybe she could help, somehow, watch his back or something while he went after the creature. Maybe make noise at the right moment, act as a decoy. Or perhaps she'd see the thing going after Sloane, and would be able to warn him. A second pair of eyes couldn't hurt, anyway, and he should have stopped long enough to consider how she might be useful. I'm not going to stay fucking here, she thought, scowling as she climbed. The irritation she felt, playing the helpless female throughout this production, was a lot better than the mind, numbing fear she'd been suffering through. She embraced the anger, let it spur her to action. She might be killed, but she wasn't going to sit still for it like some, 
some field mouse and just, the alien creature's frightening call buzzed through the dark woods, somewhere to her right, the sound rising and falling again. It sounded the way she thought a crab might, if it had a voice and was as big as a man. She froze, her commitment to being helpful wavering badly. Go. Go help, if you can. If you can't, at least you tried. Her hands were damp and her stomach hurt, but she started toward the sound, moving carefully through the brush. Chapter 28 Sloan didn't think he'd survive the climb. From the top of the ridge, the hunter would be able to see him all the way up. He stuck to the densest undergrowth, winding his way up through the trees, scratching the hell out of himself as he ran and struggled up the rise. Small animals moved away from him in the dark, and though he did the best he could, the hunter had the high ground, if it was even a fair shot, it could take him out before he got to the top. Nothing. The windswept trees where the ridge topped out were aspen, mostly, a thick crop of spruce below that, scattered dug fur. Sloan found a smallish tangle of blackberries next to a fallen, rotting log and wedged his way between them, ignoring the thorns and spiders. He thought the hunter probably had him dialed in already. Why it hadn't taken a shot, he didn't know. He would have. Motivations, strategies, were impossible to guess at. Assuming that the giant hunters thought or felt anything like humans did was presumptuous at best, and could cost him if he thought wrong. Way back when in training, they'd had to do these observational games, looking at a table full of random items for a while, then being tested on what they'd seen. As the training progressed, the trainers added more items, gave them less time to look, waited longer before testing, sometimes running drills all day and waking them up in the middle of the night to answer. Besides keeping the mind sharp, practiced, the games were always run by pretty specific rules. You did not guess what you were looking at, that was for Intel to figure out. You reported on what you saw a pencil might become a thin tube of wood, yellow, pointed, leaving the extrapolations to the smart guys. No smart guys around here, though. The thing had called down to them from on top of the ridge. Obviously, it had an idea of where they were. It had to know that they'd heard it. Why hadn't it fired, what rules was it playing by? The answers probably mattered, very much, but he didn't know them. What he knew was how to stalk. For whatever reason, the monster had called him out, and if he could zap it before it zapped him, Mary would have an escort on her hike down. He knew he'd lost her, coming up the hill. Better for her, for both of them. Anyone making any real sudden moves in the next little bit were likely to get shot. Sloan edged to the opening at the end of the rotting trunk and brought up the rifle, sweeping the gentle rise and fall of the narrow ridge in front of him. He realized the light was coming up a little, the sky purpling, the brief night drawing to its end. He saw a morning bird flutter through some bushes. A red squirrel darted up an aspen in silhouette. There was a partial clearing 200 meters ahead of him, a rocky spot dotted with a few stunted black spruce. He felt a tingle of possibilities when he realized where he was. There was a crease in that rock, big enough to lie down in. He couldn't see it from his position, it was concealed by the trees and the way the rock lay, but he thought if he could get to it, he might have something. The creature suddenly croaked again, the cicada sound coming from behind him, maybe five o'clock, but not close. Sloan Lizard walked out of his hiding spot, fast and low. He heard a rustle in the trees, closer than he expected, and moved faster, the world a tunnel of small branches and cold morning air, of his heartbeat. Second stretched, rifle warm in his hand, ready. He reached the edge of the clearing and took a breath, if the thing had him, it would fire the instant he left the cover of the brush, but it was worth the risk if he could. He'd taken a half step into the open when he saw it, saw the slight shimmer of the suit reflecting a stand of grass maybe twenty feet to his right. Motherfucker. It had gotten ahead of him, 
and he brought the long arm up, too slow, and the ground in front of him blurred, distorted, and he realized that was the suit, and the rifle was knocked out of his hands, hard enough that the sling nearly broke his arm. He hit the ground next to it, saw the weapon whipped away a second later, tossed ten meters away by the walking blur of trees and ground. This close he could hear it, the creakings of its armor, the strange rasp of its breath, and there was a smell like cold, rotten fish. Sloan rolled, was already pulling his BMF, the blur shifting in front of him, too close. And it kicked him in the ribs, hard, then somehow pinned his arm against his body, knocking his second weapon well out of reach. The blur of movement brightened for just an instant, and then faded out, becoming the alien hunter. It stood over him, looking down, studying him through its strange mask. Then it backed away from him. He knew why. To give him room to stand up. Mary heard the creature crashing through the bushes and froze, ducking down, if it wasn't the alien it was a big bear and she had no desire to meet with either. It blew past her, moving fast. She didn't see it but she saw branches moving maybe fifty feet in front of her, shaking and jerking. Oh, shit, she thought, and stayed low, and started crawling after it. She had no idea what she'd do if she caught up with it, but if it was running after Sloane, she could at least warn him. She urged herself into a crouch, made herself go faster when she realized she couldn't hear it moving anymore, but she heard something else, like someone throwing a rock into the trees from a small opening up ahead. Her heart in her throat, she crept closer and saw flashes of movement in between the staggered trees, out in the clearing. Whatever was happening it was here, right in front of her, she'd gotten her wish. Do something, she told herself. But she didn't know what to do. Chapter 29 Sloane drew a ragged breath, felt the ribs on his right side creak and hurt. Probably cracked a couple of them, though that wouldn't matter much in a few seconds if he didn't do something. He suspected that being dead alleviated a lot of pain, and he wasn't eager to find out if that was true. The little bit of blood running down his cheek from the gouge next to his eye. Nothing. All he had left were his hands and his sheath knife. Apparently, that was just what it wanted. As blades went, it was a good one Shiva Key's spirit, a ten-inch Damascus steel blade that would slice through a bundle of a dozen quarter-inch ropes with one whack, over and over, and would stay sharp until your arm got tired. Sloan had once chopped a three-inch tree branch in half with one swing. How would it work against this predator? Only one way to find out, and he was about to it was either that or let the sucker beat him to death. The thing was five meters away, and looked relaxed enough standing there. He'd probably be confident, in its place. It was a foot taller, easily a hundred pounds heavier, and had gone hand to, hand with a good-sized brown bear. A puny little old human like Sloane, without a gun. That wasn't likely to frighten it much. And given that Sloane had capped a couple of its buddies, it probably planned to enjoy making him suffer. Maybe it wanted to beat him to a slow death. Well. No point in making it easy for the thing. Sloane pulled the knife. The cold steel glittered in the afternoon sun, and with a smooth and well-practiced twirl, he shifted his grip, going from a fencer's hold with the point forward to an ice pick hold, the point down and edge forward. Yeah, the knife was long, and holding it like a sword would extend his reach, but no way he could match the monster's arm space, especially if it. The snick. Of the alien's arm-mounted blades finished Sloane's thought for him. Even a sword would put him well within range of the creature's weapon. Crap. It was too much to hope for that the thing wouldn't use its own steel. Nasty-looking things, those twin blades, long, serrated, needle, pointed, and sharp on both edges. Sloane's only advantage was that the thing had but one set, on the right forearm. If he could stay to its left, it would have to turn to effectively use its knives. 
Of course, fast as it was, that was going to be the trick, staying to the side. Long ago, in a jungle on the other side of the world, Sloane had spent some idle hours on his downtime working with a little old brown man from Java. He'd never figured out how the Indonesian, whose name had been Satarko, had wound up in Vietnam, or even who for sure he'd been working for at the time. Probably connected to Air America, but nobody had ever said, and Satarko seemed to come and go as he pleased. Satarko had a martial art, something called Penjak Silat, that he had learned in West Java and had practiced all his life. He was pretty amazing with it in play, he could go against four or five marines who were half. Again as big as he was and knock their dicks into the dirt without working up a sweat. Smooth as hot oil on glass. Then there were the knives. The old man had a rucksack full of them, short, long, daggers, funny hook-shaped ones, and he was an expert with them all. There had been a marine hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor in the unit, Pablito. He was half Mexican, half Italian, a bodybuilder who could bench 400 pounds. Pablito had grown up on Chicago's mean streets, and was really wicked with a knife himself. He had just shaken his head when somebody asked him if he could take the old man, blade to blade. Sheet. Best I could hope for would be to keep dancing until he got worn out and hope I could throw my blade and hit him. Man would fillet me like a fish. I might nick him. You guys. Just as well stab yourselves and save yourself getting all sweaty and tired before you die. Sitarko admired Sloane's skill with a rifle, and they had traded a few techniques. Sloane showed him how to shoot between heartbeats to keep the weapon steady, Sitarko showed Sloane some basic knife passes. Ting is, the old man said, you fight with a knife, you gonna get cut. Matters is, where and how bad. Two guys with skill. Loser, he's ashes, winner, he's charcoal. That hadn't sounded encouraging to Sloane, and he'd said so. The old man laughed, a cigarette smoked rasp. Yeah. You gotta go in, especially against a bigger fighter. He got the reach, he stands there and carves pieces off you like a roast. You got to get inside his knife where he can't get at you. Jam him up, use your blade, quick, that be your best hope. Probably you get cut anyhow, but maybe you get stitched up before you bleed out. Here, let me show you. It had been a long time since those lessons. Sloan hadn't spent much time since practicing them. Oh, now and then he'd wave his blade around a little, dart in and out against an imaginary target, but he hadn't been serious about it. A knife was only if you ran out of ammo. Or some seven-foot-tall outer space monster took your guns away and wanted to skewer you. Wished he had paid more attention to those lessons and kept up with them, now. The thing took a step toward him. Sloan shifted to his right, to the creature facing his left. It turned toward him, but Sloan kept circling. It came closer, trying to line up for a right-hand cut, and Sloan moved to his right even faster. It made a sound that could have been a laugh. Held its arms wide in a gesture that seemed to say, What? I look stupid. Sloan nodded. Yeah, it would know what he was trying to do. No help for that. Sloan didn't have a lot of choice here. He couldn't run, it was a lot faster. He couldn't hide, there was no cover. And he couldn't stand back and duel with it. As the thing moved a step closer, Sloan stood his ground. That sound again. Definitely a laugh. It came in. It must have expected him to freeze or backpedal away, but Sloan didn't. He went in to meet it, trying to get inside as fast as he could. His move must have surprised it. It hesitated a hair, and that was enough. Sloan got within a couple of feet. He jerked his knife up, edge leading, and slashed across the thing's belly and chest, digging in, but it was a shallow slice, blunted by its armor mesh, 
no real damage. With the knife in his hand raised, handle back by his right ear, he stabbed straight down as hard as he could. The flesh or the web armor or something resisted for a hair, but then Shiva Ki's fighting knife pierced it and sank into the alien's flesh, a good six inches, through muscle and a rib, before it stopped. Gotcha, sucker. Would that be enough dash? The thing got its left arm between them and slapped at him. The backhand strike hit Sloan on the left shoulder and knocked him off his feet. He flew three feet to the side and fell, hit the ground hard. The thing roared, a primal, really pissed off scream, and turned to face the downed man. So, no. The knife buried in the thing's chest wasn't going to be enough to do the job. Sloan, his wind knocked out, managed to get himself up on one elbow as the monster came in, the twin knives held high. Probably would take his head off. Well. It was as good a day as any to die, and it was all borrowed time anyway, so fuck it. Mary stood there, watching the creature knock Sloan to the ground, moving in. It was going to kill him. Sloan, who had saved her life so many times, was going to die, and she was going to just stand here and let it happen. No. She had to do something, she had to dash. She opened the pack. He heard the shot's five quick and sharp reports, blam 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 blam. So fast it was hard to be sure of the number. The monster turned away from Sloane. Mary. She was behind it, ten meters away, still holding the little point three eight special. My God. She had shot it. Had she hit it? If she had, the bullets didn't seem to be up to the task of stopping it. It turned around and started toward her. Sloan saw the spots on its back, at least three of them, little rings of green blood welling in the holes. No time, Sloan, no time. It was going after Mary Dash. He scrambled up, ran, and launched himself into a flying tackle. He hit it behind the knees, and big and strong as it was, it still went down. Mary, run Dash. Unfortunately, a massive shoulder and arm came down on top of Sloan and drove him into the soft ground, hard. Sloan tried to roll out from under it, and the thing tried to roll up and away, but the fall had shocked them both. The thing got to one knee in one arm, and Sloan knew if it got to its feet, Mary was dead. He hadn't even shown her how to reload the revolver, and even another five shots from the little snubby weren't going to be enough, he was sure of that. Sloan kicked, thrust his right foot as hard as he could, aiming for the monster's wrist. He was high cut the inside of the elbow but it was enough to knock the support out from under the thing and cause it to fall on its face. Up, Sloan, up dash. Sloan scrabbled across the ground. His revolver was over there, only six or seven meters away. If he could get to it, that would sure as hell do the trick. The creature must have seen what he was doing. It roared, sounding like a bear, loud. And Sloan looked at it, realizing it had ripped its helmet off. Good lord. Look at that face. It had teeth like a wild hog, and it was really, really pissed off. It came up, and leaped for Sloan. He was almost at the handgun. He reached out, grabbed it, yes. Rolled. The thing came down next to him and kicked, hit Sloan's arm and the gun went flying away. In slow motion, he watched his last hope leave. Third time today. That really sucked. He looked up as the monster raised those twin wrist blades. It was going to lop his head off. He was all out of things to do. And all out of words to say. There was a boom. And a hole appeared in the thing's chest next to the knife sticking there. A gout of green blood erupted. The monster looked down, managed to lift its head to look at Sloane, and he could read its mind, what the hell. 
Then it fell to its knees and toppled forward. Sloane managed to roll out of the way before it hit him. He looked past the dead alien to see Mary standing there, his rifle held not too firmly in her hands. She was trembling. Son of a bitch. She'd done it. She had killed the thing. She had saved them both. Son of a bitch. He started laughing. Ow. Bad idea. Mary lowered the rifle, still astounded by what she'd done. When the monster for it was a monster, seven feet high and massive and, insectal, somehow, a terrible thing knocked Sloane down to the ground, she pointed at its broad back and took a deep breath and fired that little revolver until it clicked empty. And it had just stood there like the bullets were nothing. It turned around and glared at her, and she saw her own death. And then Sloane jumped on it and took it down. She couldn't believe that, either. Mary, run dash, he screamed. Run. And leave Sloane. They wrestled around, the thing fell, and Sloane scrambled away, going for his own fallen revolver. He'd never make it, she saw. She looked around, desperate. And there was Sloane's rifle, right there. It was about to stab him, she didn't have time to think. The noise was deafening. The butt of the big rifle slammed into her shoulder, knocked her back a step, but she was still staring out at the monster, at the hole that had erupted in the middle of its chest, giant and raw and green, and then it fell and Sloane sat up, staring at her. After a moment, he said, son of a bitch. And then he laughed. She could see it hurt him to do that, the way he winced and held his side, and but he couldn't seem to help it. He said something, grinning, as he crawled to his feet but she could barely hear him. Her ears were ringing. What? Thank you. She nodded. Felt as if she were on the edge of hysteria, but managed to smile, a little. And you said I'd get in your way. Hey. Nobody likes a smart-ass hero. Then they were both grinning and hugging each other. 30. They helped each other off the ridge, moving like two very old people, and walked about a half mile before Sloane felt like they might be safe to stop. He found a good spot to set up a temporary camp, under a rock overhang at the ridge's base. They were far enough from the river to be off the beaten path for anything big enough to bother them. Sloane had Mary help him tape his ribs, and he got her an ice pack for her ankle, and they leaned against the cool rock. They watched the forest getting light from beneath their thin strip of darkness, listened to the birds start chattering. So do we go back to the station now? Mary asked. I think it'd be better to keep heading for the relay station. We're closer to your place, though. So are the dead hunters, and I'd bet that the mothership isn't too comfy with just leaving them lying around. Maybe they'll send in a team, maybe they'll start a fire. Maybe they'll nuke the place from space. Whatever, I don't want us to be around for it. Mary turned to look at him, her tired eyes still bright and full of humor. Did I mention I was okay with walking? You did. They sat a while longer ate some nuts and cheese, a chocolate bar, Sloane ziplocking the wrappers and stashing them in the sack inside his bag. He closed his eyes, wishing he could take a deep breath without it hurting. He'd been injured worse, more than once but not at this age. Everything ached, and it was going to get worse before it got better. He was glad there was a decent-sized bottle of ibuprofen in his bag, they were both going to need it. What are we going to tell people? Mary asked, after a while. Sloane nodded. That was a good point. He shrugged. Poachers attacked us, turned on each other. By the time anyone gets up here to take a look, there won't be enough left to say otherwise. You think they'll come back? The hunters? Don't know. Maybe not to this park, anyway. She smiled at him. Does that mean I can come back? 
Sloane looked at her. Realized he was starting to feel something for her. It was a complication, but one he thought he was ready for. I'd like that. Her grin widened. Maybe you could come see me in L.A. sometime, too. You know, if you aren't too busy shooting at things. L.A. Never. Too dangerous. She laughed at that, and both of them fell comfortably silent. Mary leaned her head against his shoulder. You got a first name, Sloane. Not that I use. What is it, anyway? He told her. Ha. Huh. Would have figured you for something a little. I don't know. More aggressive. What, like Thor? Lance? Her laugh was sleepy. Butch, or Dirk, or something. She fell asleep a moment later. Sloane knew it was probably safe for him to do the same, now, but he stayed awake a while longer, keeping watch. Eventually, he drifted off. He didn't dream. Epilogue The couple hiked slowly and steadily south, talking, stopping often to eat and rest. They were in no hurry, now. In the brief night they made love again, and then watched the dim stars, watched for one dropping too low, moving too fast. Sloan doubted they'd see it, and they didn't but they heard something, briefly, as the morning light dawned, cool and soft. A deep and rumbling hum that sounded like nothing either could place. A few hours later, they heard it again, and though they both searched the skies, they didn't see anything. They were sitting on an old fallen tree, taking a break, maybe ten miles from the station when there was an explosion. The shock wave rolled over them, blew branches out of trees, kicked up dust. After a moment, it passed. They looked at each other. You okay? they said at the same time. I'd guess the cleanup crew came down and tidied up the place. Sloane said. And I think the bus just left. I hope it isn't going to make any stops around here, she said. Yeah, me, too. Sloane started to make the radio call. He paused for a second to think about it. Poachers. That's what they'd say. And it was the truth, as far as it went. As for the explosion? He had no clue. They had already hiked out, were far away. They couldn't say what had caused that. That was the truth, too. They couldn't say not unless they wanted to risk being locked up as crazy. Or maybe worse, somebody would believe them. They'd never get out of federal custody in that case. He looked up at the sky. Maybe they wouldn't come back. He shook his head. Yeah, he figured, they would. Somebody had killed four of them, and that would be the reason. Dangerous game was more exciting. Somebody would want to come back to try his luck. The challenge of it. Word got out there was a man-eating lion in the bush in Africa. There was always a stampede of hunters booking their flights, wanting to get a crack at it. These things had that in common with people, he was sure. Maybe it was time to retire. He didn't think he could manage another adventure like this one. Something. Mary said. Nothing important. Looks like I won't be going back to the station, my guess is, there's a smoking crater where it used to be. She nodded. What will you do? Tell me about your house in LA got an extra room. Got a queen-sized bed, she said. Good enough. She laughed. So did he.